Hey everyone, Ronan here, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we got something that's gonna be very special. It's the culmination of the 1K special what if that I had started back in 21 and I just barely finished over this past summer. It is what if Paul and Ash traveled to the Unova region. But before we get into that, we're gonna shout out the Patreon and YouTube channel member like we normally do. So today, we're gonna shout out Andrew McCartney. Thank you very much for the support. And with that out of the way, you guys know what to do. Take a look at this analog stat bar right here. Turn on the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and don't forget to drop a comment to help feed the algorithm. But with all that being said, let's get into what if Ash and Paul traveled to Unova, the complete full story. I hope you enjoy. We pick up with Ash, who is home in Pallet Town. It has been some time since his adventures in the Sinnoh region have come to an end. Ash and his lifelong partner, Pikachu, have been taking some time off as they really hadn't had a vacation in a long while. During this time, Ash has been spending a lot of time with his Pokemon at Professor Oak's lab. But Ash is starting to get the urge to travel again. Professor Oak can see this as well as Ash's mom. The place for Ash is on the road and they both know it. Then one day, Professor Oak gets an invite to do some scientific research in the far-off Unova region. He tells Ash and his mom about the invite. Ash's mom thinks it's a wonderful idea. Professor Oak tells Ash that the Unova region is full of Pokemon that has never been seen before. This, of course, catches Ash's attention. The chances of them meeting and catching new Pokemon is too alluring, and Ash is on board. Professor Oak tells Ash that they will be leaving in two days time. Over the next two days, Ash prepares for his next journey. One of the things Ash has been contemplating is if he should take another Pokemon along with him besides Pikachu. This thought stays in his mind all the way up to the day when he has to leave for the airplane heading to the Unova region. On the second day, Ash and his mom head to Professor Oak's lab. Once they arrive, the car is waiting outside, but Professor Oak is not there, and Ash and his mom head inside. Once Ash gets to Professor Oak's main room, he runs into the professor, and another familiar face, one he hasn't seen in a good while, Paul. Ash is excited to see his rival, and asks Paul what he is doing here. I thought you were heading to Snow Point City to train with Brandon. Paul tells Ash that he did. After he spent some time with Brandon, he went home to Veilstone City to spend some time with his brother, Reggie. After being home with Reggie for a while, Paul started to feel the urge to travel again, but didn't know what to do. Reggie made the suggestion that Paul should go see Professor Oak, as Paul never got the chance to meet him before. Ash is super excited. Without thinking, he challenges Paul to a battle. Ash's mom reminds him that they have a plane to catch. Ash begs Professor Oak for just a quick one, maybe just a two-on-two -two battle. Professor Oak tells Ash that they can spare a few minutes. Ash then turns to Paul. So how about it, Paul? Let's have a battle. Paul says, sure, why not? But in the interest of time, why not make it a double battle? This excites Ash and they head outside. Paul takes his place, and Ash takes his. Paul sends in both his Torterra and his Electivire. Ash sends in Pikachu and Infernape. The battle gets underway, and it is very intense. Paul has been training hard. He is not slacked in his training at all. But Ash, on the other hand, it is clear that he is out of sync with Pikachu, and even more so, Infernape. Paul can sense it and takes advantage of it. In the end, Pikachu and Torterra both fall during the battle, and it comes down to Infernape and Electrovire, a rematch of the Sinner League. Ash is a little overconfident and is thinking because he beat Paul and Electrovire once before, he can do it again. Paul can see all of these flaws and takes advantage. In the end, Infernape falls to Electrovire. After the battle is over, and Ash recalls Infernape. Ash is impressed. He tells Paul that he is stronger than ever. Paul turns to Ash and tells him that he wishes he could say the same. Ash, angry, says, what do you mean? 
Paul tells us that the edge and ferocity in battle that he had in their last battle, he lost it. But Paul isn't saying this in a condescending way. He's saying it in a helpful way. Kind of like the advice a big brother would give. Paul tells Ash that his bond with Infernape has weakened since their last battle. This makes Ash think. But then he is interrupted by Professor Oak. Ash, it's time. We have to go. Then Professor Oak apologized to Paul, stating he wishes he had time, but unfortunately he is due to head to the Nova region and won't be back for several weeks. But Paul is more than welcome to stay at Professor Oak's lab until he returns. Ash then says, wait, Professor, can Paul come with us? They all stare at Ash. Ash looks at Paul. Come on, Paul. The Unova region is a place neither of us have been. You should come. This could be exactly what we need. Professor Oak agrees with Ash, telling Paul that it could be great for his development. Paul is quiet in deep thought. After some time, Paul decides to take Ash up on the offer. He thinks Ash is following behind. And if Ash starts to get weak, then what does that say about Paul? As he lost to Ash in the Sinner League. Paul tells Ash that he will go, but on one condition. Ash needs to bring Infernape, as they both need more training. Ash was thinking the same thing, especially after his battle with Paul. And with that, the two head off on the plane, and the new adventures that await them in the universe. Engine. We pick up with Ash, Paul, Professor Oak, and Ash's mom arriving in the Unova region. Once off the plane, they try to stretch their legs. But then, Team Rocket tries to steal Pikachu. In the process, Ash sends in Infernape, and Paul sends out Electrovire, and they manage to send Team Rocket packing. But they are met with a strange thundercloud that is drawn to Electrovire, and more importantly, Pikachu. The cloud strikes with vicious lightning at both Pikachu and Electivire. Luckily, Electivire is able to absorb most of the electricity, diverting the current into the ground with its two tails. But all of this extra electricity does cause some damage to Pikachu and Electivire. Once the cloud dissipates, Professor Juniper makes her appearance and drives everyone to her lab. Once at the lab, Professor Juniper takes a look at both Electivire and Pikachu to make sure that they are okay. While doing this, Ash and Paul are introduced to Trip, a Pokemon trainer that is starting his journey today, as well as the three Unovan starters, Snivy, Oshawott, and Tepic. Ash especially impresses Oshawott. After some thought, Trip chooses Snivy. Paul compliments Trip on his choice as he would have done the same, seeing how he started with Torterra. Trip's choice devastates Oshwat, but Ash tells it, Don't worry, I would have chosen you. You will meet your trainer soon enough. Don't be down about it. Trip goes to leave. Then Ash catches up with him and talks about the Unova Gym Challenge. Just then, Paul comes out with Pikachu, and Trip is fascinated by it. This leads Trip and Ash into a battle. But it's no contest. Snivy is no match for Pikachu, as it takes a Volt Tackle, knocking it out. Trip is upset at his loss, telling Ash someone from the boonies couldn't be that strong. It was just luck. Then Paul chimes in, telling Trip that maybe it wasn't luck. Maybe his opponent was just better than him. Your Snivy is strong, but you lack the experience needed to properly wield it, which makes you weak. Ash tells Paul that's kind of harsh. But Paul reinforces it by saying, It's the truth. Something he needs to hear. Trip just glares at Paul, then takes off. Then, as Paul and Ash are debating over the comments Paul made, the strange cloud from before appears again, and lightning starts to surge around them. Professor Juniper states that it's Zekron. Paul sends out Electivire again to fend off the electricity. With a giant surge of electricity, a flash in the sky, the cloud dissipates. Paul thinks that it's odd two times in one day, but then is interrupted when he is told to come in and eat. During the meal, Ash decides that he is going to challenge the Univalique, 
And of course, Paul won't be left behind. So he will be traveling with Ash. The next morning, the two rivals, turned traveling companions, head out. Once they enter the forest, they run into a young girl named Iris, and her axe you. Ash actually tries to catch her by throwing a Pokeball at her, but it fails. But Iris is excited to see a Pikachu, and after a shock due to squeezing it too hard, she talks with Ash and Paul. Ash, of course, is super friendly, and Iris connects with him. But Paul, on the other hand, well, he's an acquired taste, and rubs Iris the wrong way. So they don't hit it off right away. After Ash getting overexcited and failing to catch Deerling and getting ran down by Patrat, sits down to have a meal of delicious apples, and Iris gets to know Paul and Ash a little more. After some conversation, Iris can at least talk to Paul. But as the trio settles in for the night, they seem to have a little stalker that has followed them. The next morning, Iris heads off before Paul and Ash awake. Later in the day, Ash encounters and catches a P-Dove as his first Unovan Pokemon. Iris then approaches as Ash is super excited that he caught a P-Dove. Then asks why Paul hasn't caught anything. He replies, because all of the Pokemon I've seen thus far are less than impressive. I'm not going to waste my time. This gets to Iris. She can't stand Paul's attitude. But Ash explains that's how Paul is. He is a very competitive person and seeks only the best as Team Rocket makes their attempt to steal Pikachu and axe you. Ash then sends in Peter to battle Jesse's new Wubat. When it fails, Oshawa interferes and pops Team Rocket's balloon with its scallop. Then, once Pikachu and Axie are free, Oshawa fends off the Wubat. But Paul won't stand for this waste of time and sends in Torterra. He sends Team Rocket blasting off again. But the trio waste no time. Pikachu and Axie need medical attention. So they leave Oshawa in the forest and head to the Pokemon Center. Later, after Pikachu and Axie are healed up, Iris approaches Paul. She doesn't like how abrasive he is, but she is grateful for him saving Axie, and she has decided to join him and Ash on their journey. Ash is excited at the thought of a new traveling companion. Paul doesn't mind, as long as she doesn't slow them down. Later, after a failed attempt to catch Oshawott, and realizing that it's the one that Ash met back at Professor Juniper's lab, he calls her, and she sends over Oshawott's Pokeball, bringing Ash's new team count of Unova to two. And Paul has not caught in any. After some pitfalls with a bunch of Sandile, the trail move on to the Battle Club in Accumula Town. This is a place that Paul can get some great use out of. A place where he can battle some Unovan Pokemon and strong trainers. The two get in some serious battling. Paul goes first and Electivire makes a giga impact. But intent. Anyway, then Ash battles with a trainer and it's due what? And an alarm goes off. After, after reviewing the security tapes, they learn that Team Rocket and a mysterious Pokemon were involved. They all decide to look for the mysterious Pokemon, everyone thinking it's an Umbreon. After some searching and no luck, they set out some food. After a while, the mysterious Pokemon reveals itself. It turns out to be a Tepig, and it is severely malnourished and has a rope tied around its snout. Paul can see it, and it reminds him of how he failed with Chimchar. Paul knows that this Tepig was abandoned, just by the way it looks. Paul undoes the rope from Tepig's snout, allowing it to eat. Paul then carries it back to the battle club, where Don George confirms that Tepig was abandoned. Then... This gets to Paul. Ash can tell that it is bothering him. After a battle with Team Rocket, Paul and Tepig seem to be synchronized. Ash suggests that Paul catch Tepig. After all, it seems to have taken a shine to him. Paul looks at Tepig, then to Ash. He smiles and throws a ball, the proud new owner of a brand new Tepig. With that, the trio head to the Striaton Gym. Once in the Striaton City, 
Ash and Paul immediately go challenge the gym. The trio run into Silent, the stride and gym leader who leads them to the gym. Once there, Paul and Ash start arguing over who will challenge the gym first. Ultimately, Ash ends up winning a game of rock, paper, scissors, allowing him to go first. Once Ash realizes there are three gym leaders, he has a choice of which one. He challenges all three leaders in a one after another consecutive battle. Ash has to win two out of three of the battles in order to earn the trio badge. Ash, Ash's first opponent is Chili and his Panseer. Ash chooses to go with Infernape. This match is no contest. Infernape mops the floor with Panseer with a combo of Mock Punch and Dig. Next, Ash faces Crest in his Panpour. For this battle, Ash chooses to go with Pikachu. This battle gives Ash the advantage, which makes Ash overconfident, and Crest can sense it and uses this to advantage with a combo of Water Gun and Scratch to cause damage to Pikachu. Then, a Mud Sport and a Water Gun takes out Pikachu, evening up the battle. Next up is Silent and his Pan Sage. Ash chooses to go with Oshawott. Irish is soft, but Paul's not. He knows this is exactly how Ash catches his opponents off guard. The battle gets underway, and it does seem a little one-sided in Pan Sage's favor. But Oshawott eventually lands a water gun, leveling things out. After some ba after some mishaps in the battle, Oshawott is able to put down Pan Sage with a razor shell, earning Ash the trio badge. Paul will have to wait until tomorrow to challenge the gym. He tells the leaders that he wants the same stipulations Ash has, as he wants all three leaders. The next day comes, and Paul's battle happens. This one is straightforward. Paul is a master strategist and has proved it many times before, starting the battle with his Torterra against Cress and his Panpour. Its defense is too much, and Panpour can't seem to cause any damage to Torterra and get through its thick shell, and it falls when it gets stuck with a Giga Drain. Next, Paul faces Silent, and Paul and Paul chooses Tepig. This battle gets down to business, but Paul won't be taken back by Pan Sage. He spent all night strategizing with Tepig and taught it a new move, Flame Charge. With the added speed that Flame Charge gives, this proves to be too much for Pan Sage, and Paul puts Silent down with little to no effort, collecting himself the trio badge. After some trouble at the Dream Yard and clearing out Team Rocket, Ash, Paul, and Iris head off to their next adventure in the site of their next gym in Nacarine City. Ash, Paul, and Iris are on the road to Nacarine City. During the time they travel, Paul and Ash have been battling to level up their Pokemon. One thing that's happened is Ash and Infernape have started to get back into sync after having Paul and Electivire around. But another thing is Oshawott and Tepig. With Paul being Tepig's trainer, Tepig has been put through some intense training. And with Infernape and Electivire as inspiration, Tepig wants to battle like those two. This has also affected Oshawott. It has always had the urge to battle and has had a bit of overconfidence, but with Paul training with Ash, it doesn't want to get left behind, and as a result, it has developed a rivalry with Tepig, and the two regularly want to battle each other. Oshawott eventually learns Aqua Jet during their training, but there's a problem. It keeps its eyes closed when using it, and as a result, it tends to miss the targets when using the move. While on the road, Ash and Paul encounter a Snivy, which level appears to be higher than usual, suggesting that it may be an abandoned Pokemon. And uh, this catches both Paul's and Ash's attention. The two rush to battle with Snivy and try to catch it. Ash uses Oshawott and Paul uses Tepig, but the Snivy knows a tract and hits both of them with it. As a result, both Oshawott and Tepig are out of the battle. So, Ash and Paul turn to Infernape and Electivire. The two powerhouses launch multiple attacks at Snivy 
that overpower it, and Ash and Paul both throw a Pokeball at Snivy at the same time. But the ball falls behind a bush, and when they approach, there's no way to know who actually caught Snivy. So Ash and Paul decide to have a battle. The winner gets Snivy. Ash chooses Oshawott, and Paul chooses Tepic. The battle gets underway, and it is clear that Oshawott has the advantage. But Tepig has better fundamentals due to its training with Paul. As a result, Tepig manages to take advantage of Oshawott, taking the lead in the battle. This pushes Ultrawatt to its limits. This forces Oshawott to use Aqua Jet, which again misses. Oshawott is beginning to get frustrated with its lack of progress. As Tepig begins to push back Oshawott, Paul comments that Ash needs to stop being so predictable. It almost cost him their battle in Sinnoh, and it's what costed him their battle at Professor Oak's lab. Ash tells Paul, don't worry, he won't disappoint, as he tells Oshawott to use Racer Shell, and it starts to attack. But Tepig has been using Flame Charge, and its speed has increased. Oshawott is being pushed into a corner, and Paul and Tepig push even harder, and it gets more confident. But Oshawott is not ready to give in. All the damage it has taken has caused its torn ability to activate and causes Oshawott's water attacks to increase in their power. As a result, it gives it the edge back that it needs to put down Tepig, allowing Ash to add Snivy to his team. Though Paul is upset that he didn't get Snivy, he is way more impressed with Tepig. He tells it even though it lost, Paul can see that it has limitless potential and together they will unlock it. Tepig is excited about what Paul said and it rubs against him in approval. The trio then continue on to Nacarain City. On the way, they stop to have a battle. Iris asks Paul if he can help her bring out Axew's power. So Paul and Tepig have a battle with Axew and Iris. Though Axew loses, Paul and Ash find out how Iris got Axew. Then Axew gets caught in some trouble with a Scolipede. The Scolipede proves to be too strong, and Iris tries to use Excadrill to save Axew. But when it won't listen, Paul chooses to use Tepig. The little pig Pokemon is determined to battle the Scolipede, but when the power gap is made evident, Tepig lets out a loud cry and begins to glow. This forces its evolution into Pig Knight, and upon it evolving, it learns the move Fire Pledge and grows the fighting type ability. Paul uses this to his advantage, and together, Pig Knight and Paul send Scolipede packing. The trio's next stop is in Lecture Town, in the Pokemon Battle Club. Paul is looking forward to some trainers and battling with his new Pig Knight. Ash can't wait either. Bo they both head in there with Iris complaining the whole time. Once at the Battle Club, Ash immediately scans through all the trainer logs to see who's there. Once Ash sees Trip is there, he gets excited and calls Trip. Trip comes to the battle club and Ash immediately challenges Trip. But Trip has no interest in Ash, but he has all the interest in Paul. He immediately challenges Paul to a six on six battle. Trip wants revenge because of what Paul said back in November Town. But Paul has no interest in battling Trip. He tells Trip he couldn't even beat Ash, so why would he want to battle him? This infuriates Trip. He says, fine, if I can beat Ash, then will you battle with me? Paul did come to battle. He says, okay, if you can beat Ash in a three on three, then I will have a three on three with you. Ash and Trip battle, and ultimately Trip wins after his, after he uses Tranquil, Frillish, and Timber. Trip wasted no time beating Ash, and Ash wasn't really taking the battle seriously as he was more interested in seeing Paul battle Trip and he only used his new Unova Pokemon in this battle. Trip tells Ash that he should evolve his Pokemon, and then he would win. The last battle they had was a fluke, and this battle proved it. Then comes Paul's and Trip's battle. Paul leads with Pignite, and Trip leads with his Servine. But Paul and Pignite's intense battle style proves to be too much for Trip and his Servine, and in the end, they get put down. But Trip sends in his Lampent and manages to put down Pig Knight. Paul then wastes no time and sends in Electivire. This makes the match very one-sided, and Paul puts down Trip's last two Pokemon with no effort. 
Paul then tells Trip, You know, you told Ash that the last battle you two had was a fluke, but you didn't even realize that Ash took it easy on you. Trip, shocked, says, What do you mean? Paul says, The three Pokemon that Ash used were Pokemon with the least amount of experience, and you beat them. Ash pulled his punches, but I don't. You are still a weak trainer. The only reason you even beat Pignite is because I let you. Then Paul walks away, leaving Trip in silence. Later, at the Pokemon Center, Ash asks Paul why he was so harsh with Trip today. Paul tells Ash, it's simple. Trip thinks he's better because he does the basic things by the book, evolving Pokemon, battling. There's more to Pokemon than that. That's something that I learned from you, Ash, and he needs to realize it as well. And besides, him having two rivals will be good for him. And it's motivation for us not to get lazy and to keep training, to get stronger. Ash does agree with the motivation, but still thinks Paul could be nicer about it. But it's Paul, and Ash knows he doesn't try to be nice. He tells people what they need to hear. Now, on the way to Nacarine City, the trio stop for lunch near a river and notice a Dwebble searching for a new rock to call its home when a bunch of other Dwebble gang up on it and steal the rock. The Dwebble wanted to make into its home. Paul doesn't really want to get involved as he sees no need. They are just wild Pokemon having a territorial dispute. But Ash insists that they help Dwebble. After hours of searching, night falls and the trio take a rest. The next morning, they head out to look for the other Dwebble, which leads to them finding the Dwebble, and after they try of running away, Dwebble battles for its home back. But it is outnumbered. Ash tries to send in Pikachu to help him, but Paul stops him. He tells Ash, if this is what Dwebble wants, then he needs to fight for it by himself. Ash says that it's outmatched, and Paul says, even so, if we weren't here, it would be the same scenario. So let it prove its strength. After the Dwebble battles the three other Dwebble, with its severe disadvantage, it loses. Paul then tells Ash that there's nothing we can do. If Dwebble really wants its home back, then it would take it. Dwebble hears this and gets back up. It won't lose its home, and it attacks the Dwebble again, viciously taking the Dwebble out one by one. In the end, Dwebble proves its strength in getting its home back. Paul is now intrigued. It got its home back without the help, battling three opponents at once. Paul then sends out Pignite. Paul tells Dwebble that he sees its strength and he wants to add it to his team. Pignite and Dwebble battle, ending with Pignite taking down Dwebble with a fire pledge and Paul catching the Dwebble. Ash, Paul, and Iris then come to a Pokemon daycare. And after helping them solve some problems with a Trubbish, Ash and Paul are both gifted a Pokemon egg. Paul is unsure about this, but Ash is excited. Then, the trio finally arrive in Nacarine City. Along the way into the city, the rivalry between Oshawa and Pignite has been heating up. By the time the two get to Nacarine City, Irish Oshawa has lost four battles with Pignite. They all head to the gym as Ash wants to break Oshawott's losing streak. But the gym is also the Nacarine Museum. And the museum is closed due to a secret artifacts gallery exhibit. But there's a problem. Strange things are happening at the museum and people are being attacked. Because they're having issues at the gym slash museum, it has been closed until they can resolve it. So Paul and Ash can't have a gym battle until it reopens. So Paul tells them that they will resolve the problem so they can get their battle. After touring the museum, they learn about the exhibit. Then, after not finding anything during the day, Ash then suggests that they stay in the museum overnight. After the display of power from an angry Yaw Mask and the assistance of Lenora, Paul wants to add the Yaw Mask to his team and chooses to battle it with Dwebble. Yaw Mask puts up a good fight, displaying a lot of different abilities, but Paul and Dwebble are in perfect sync. With the Nexus, Dwebble puts Yamas down and Paul catches it, bringing his team to five. The next day, Paul and Ash head back to the Nacarine gym to challenge Anora. This time, Paul challenges first, because Ash got to go first when they are at the Striaton gym. After Lenora's help with the museum, Paul is expecting Watchhog. 
Lenora tells Paul that it will be a two on two and she sends out her two Pokemon, Watchhog and Lillipup. Paul reveals his plans to use Electivire and Pignite. Lenora is curious as she has never battled an Electivire before. The battle gets underway and Paul goes with Pignite and Lenora sends in Lillipup. The battle gets started and Pignite proves that it is resilient as Lenora tries to use Shadow Ball and then is countered with Fire Pledge. But Lenora hits Pignite with a roar, sending it back and calling out Electivire. Lenora then recalls Lillipup and sends in Watchhog. Lenora tries to use speed to her advantage, but Paul is ready for her. When she tries to use Confuse Ray, Paul orders Electivire to use Thunder on the battlefield, causing it to break up, and pieces of it fly through the air and hit Watchhog. This stuns Watchhog, and Paul finishes it with a Brick Break. Lenora then sends back in Lillipup, and Paul chooses to recall Electivire and sends back in Pignite. Lillipup and Pignite battle it out, head to head, but Flame Charge gives Pignite the advantage, then an Arm Thrust puts down Lillipup. Paul has earned the basic badge, in a 2-0 fashion. The next day, they return to the gym for Ash's battle. In this battle, Ash chooses to battle with Oshawott and Snivy. Ash sends in Snivy, and Lenora chooses to go with Watchhog. The battle gets underway, and Lenora starts with a mean look, trapping Snivy in battle. But Ash calls for an attract. It does hit, but Watchhog is female, so Ash's only defense is now useless. Then Lenora recalls Watchhog and sends in Lillipup. It battles with Snivy, and things start to heat up. Things are going well for Ash until Lillipup starts to glow and it evolves into Herdier. This, unfortunately, doesn't go well for Ash, and Snivy ends up losing to a Giga Impact. Ash then sends in Oshawott. These two start to battle, but Oshawott is at a clear disadvantage. Oshawott continues to fire Aqua Jets at Ash's command, but it keeps missing, crashing into the floor of the gym. But Oshawott won't give in, and it and Ash's determination cause Oshawott to start to glow. Now, it has evolved into a Duwat. Ash hopes that this new development will be enough to win, but ultimately, Duwat and Herdier end up knocking each other out with a Giga Impact collides, and Duwat fails at an attempt of an Aqua Jet. Ash is upset that he lost, even though Paul won. Iris tells Ash that he can always rechallenge the Nora. Paul then tells Ash that if he plans to do that, then he needs to get past his miserable performance when Duwa. It's clear that he can't control the Aqua Jet, and your reliance on it, that move cost you the match. Nurse Joy then comes out with Snivy and Duwa, and overhearing the conversation, she says to Ash, why don't they head to the battle club and train with Don George? Paul tells Ash that it would be the perfect place to get the training needed. So the next day, they head to the battle club. After explaining his problem with Don George, Ash spends the next week in a specialized training with a, all of his Pokemon, focusing on Duwa and Snivy mostly. But Infernape has something odd happen while he's training. Infernape's Blaze ability activates, but Ash can feel it, like he's connected to Infernape. But just as quickly as it activates, it fades. During the week, Paul has been completing in the Battle Club battles training his Dwebble and Yawmask. Paul is intent on learning everything he can so that he doesn't have to always rely on Electivire and Torterra. Then, then the day comes for Ash's rematch. They head to the gym, but there is a problem when they arrive. Lenora isn't there, and Ash is informed that she is headed out to an archaeological dig in the Eastern Univer and won't be back for several months. Now, Ash can't have the rematch, and Paul doesn't want to win. So now, what will they be able to do? We pick up with Ash, Paul, and Iris outside of the gym when Lenora's husband comes out. Ash asks when he can challenge the gym, and he tells him that unfortunately, the gym will be closed permanently, so Ash will not be able to get his rematch. But luckily, Unova has 10 gyms, so Ash will have to challenge one of the other ones in order to get the necessary badges. So with this revelation, unfortunately, Ash and Duat won't be unable to get their rematch against Lenora. And with that being said, the trio decides to head to Castelia City and the site of the next gym. The trio are on the road heading to Pinwheel Forest, which is the path 
that leads to Castellia City. Along the way, Ash and Paul train more with each other. The rivalry between Duwat and Pignite has been getting intense, and with the two battling so hard, both Ash and Paul's eggs have been getting stimulated, and the two start to hatch. Once the light fades, both Pokemon look at Paul and Ash, and then the two Pokemon immediately attack each other. After a while, Paul and Ash are able to separate the two. Ash pulls out his Pokedex, and it is revealed that the Pokemon he holds is a Carablast, while Paul holds a Shelmet. But this doesn't last. Carablast and Shelmet break free and try to attack each other again. But Paul throws a Pokeball at Shelmet and captures it. This stops Carablast in its tracks. Ash and Paul are caught off by this whole thing. Ash then pulls out a ball and captures Carablast. Paul thinks to himself, training just got more difficult. But Ash is excited at the challenge. But Ash is excited at the challenge. And with that, they move on to Pinwheel Forest. After spending some time lost in Pinwheel Forest and battling a Sawaddle that keeps attacking everyone, the trio runs into Berg, the leader of the Castellia Gym. He has been living in the forest to get to know the Pokemon of the place. After spending some time with the Sawaddle, Paul sees this as a waste of time, so he uses it to work with his Shelmet. Berg asks about Paul, and after learning about Ash and Paul's new Pokemon, Berg urges Ash to join Paul and Shelmet with Carablast. Berg urges the two trainers to get to know their Pokemon, not to keep them in their Pokeballs. Ash is down for this, but Paul is apprehensive, only wanting to train. But after a while, Ash has made progress, and Paul is still struggling to get Shelmet to listen. So, eventually, Paul breaks down and tries it Ash's way. But by the next morning, both Pokemon, even though they still have the urge to fight, they listen to their trainers. And while all this is going on, Iris has been bonding with Swaddle and has caught it. With that, the trio moves on from Pinwheel Forest. After some more time traveling and some issues with the Ducklet Trio and clearing a problem with a Gothitelle on the Sky Arrow Bridge, the trio makes its way to Castellia City. After finding Berg in a park and helping him clear out an infestation of Venipede that came into the city, Ash catches one of them that he had befriended. Due to Ash's capture with the Venipede, he decides to send Snivy to Professor Juniper in preparation for his battle with Berg. The next day, Paul, Ash, and Iris head to the gym. This time, Ash has opted to go first as he didn't get a chance to rematch with Lenora. Ash and Berg meet at the gym, and they start the battle. Berg leads with Dwebble, and Ash leads with Carablast. The battle is short-lived, though, as Carablast is still underleveled, and it loses to Dwebble. Ash then sends in Venipede. This battle is a little bit more even, as Venipede has more battle experience. As a result, Venipede is able to take down Dwebble. Berg then sends in his Whirlipede. Because it is the evolved form of Venipede, Venipede does not possess the ability to overcome it, and eventually falls to the rollout of Whirlipede. With Ash's back to the wall, he sends in Infernape. With the Flare Blitz, Whirlipede's rollout is overpowered and is no match, and it falls to Infernape. Next is Levani, and unfortunately this battle is all too one-sided. Infernape puts down a Levani with a combination of Dig to avoid a Grass Whistle, and then a Flamethrower, earning Ash the Insect Badge. With this victory, Ash has gained a little bit more enthusiasm as, due to the rematch that he never got, he is starting to fall back in his training a little bit. But he now feels a little bit more motivated to continue with his training. The next day, Paul has his turn at the gym. Paul, of course, is ready for this. The battle starts, Berg sending him Whirlipede, and Paul chooses to use Yamask. Due to Yamask's ability to control things with confusion, it is able to put down Whirlipede with relative ease. Then, Berg sends in Dwebble. Paul recalls Yamask and sends in his Dwebble. The battle is pretty even until Berg's Dwebble evolves into Crustal. Then its power proves to be too much for Paul's Dwebble and it falls to a rock record. Paul then sends in Yamask, who is also unable to deal with the new Crustal and eventually falls to an X-Scissor. Paul then sends in his Pignite as his last Pokemon. It takes some time and Pignite does take some damage, but it is able to eventually put down Crustal with the Fire Pledge. Next, Berg sends in Levani. Levani does have the ability to outspeed Pignite, and it is able to inflict more damage. But this forces Pignite into Blaze, and with the Flame Charge, Paul is able to barely put down Levani to earn the Insect Badge. Paul is a little annoyed by this. It was too close, and all of his plans didn't really do much after Crustal's evolution. Paul was quiet as they head back to the Pokemon Center. Later, when Ash and Iris are trying to talk to him, they overhear some talking about a gym about a day's boat ride from Castellia City. After some asking around, Iris finds out that the gym is in Verbank City. So the next day, 
the two head off to Castile Harbor and board a ship. All the while, Paul hasn't really said a word to anyone since the gym battle. During the boat ride, Iris and Ash try to talk to Paul, but he doesn't really want to talk. He's just sitting there, thinking. But Paul's inner thoughts are something that seems to be troubling him. He's never really had a problem with gym battles before. His calculations and his battle strategies have always proved to pay off. He's never really come that close to being defeated, especially when he set up his team for type advantages. So what was the problem? The last two battles he had in Unova with their gyms, he was able to clear them easily, but Berg seemed to give him more trouble. Was it the evolution of Crustal that he just couldn't plan for, or is there something else? Paul's starting to question his battle style. He's starting to question the way he plans, but in the end, his thoughts are interrupted with an announcement that they've arrived in the Verbank Harbor. Once they leave the boat, they are in the harbor of Verbank City. But there's been some issues going on here as of recently. It seems that there's been a lot of mysterious activity in the harbor. It just so happens that it happens at sunset. And that's when they seem to have arrived. Paul, Ash, and Iris notice that things don't feel right. Especially Iris, as she is somewhat sensitive to the situations. But once the trio try to leave the harbor, they are encountered by some mysterious forces. And they are forced to send out their Pokemon. Ash using Oshawott, Paul using Pignite, and Iris using Sawaddle. After some battling through some illusions and other objects that are flying towards them, it's revealed that the culprit seems to be a Pokemon. Paul pulls out his Pokedex, and it's revealed that this Pokemon is called Sigilith. And this Sigilith has demonstrated an immense capability of control of its psychic powers. Paul sees this, and he's intrigued by it. He orders Pignite to attack, and Pignite does with the flame charge, but Sigilith is able to deflect it. This forces Paul to rethink his options. He knows that Pignite is at a disadvantage, considering that Sigilith is a psychic flame. But he chooses to keep Pignite in for now. He orders another flame charge, which does manage to connect. But Sigilith counters with an air slash, and this hits Pignite, knocking it back. You can tell that Pignite has taken an immense amount of damage from the Sigilith. Ash tries to interrupt with Duwat, but Paul tells him to stay back. This is his battle. He's going to be the one to catch this Sigilith. Paul then orders Pignite to use a Fire Pledge, and the Fire Pledge manages to make a connection, causing a burn on the Sigilith. But Sigilith isn't going down. It fires another confusion towards Pignite, which connects. This puts Pignite down. Paul, a little shocked by the situation, recalls Pignite. He's starting to question himself again. Pignite fell to Sigilith. He doesn't understand why. He knows that Pignite was at a type disadvantage, but he still overall should have been able to cause more damage than what he did. But then, Sigilith tries to attack, and Ash and Duat interfere. Duat meets it with a scallop chop, and just then, Paul snaps back to his senses. He decides that he needs to end this now, so he sends in Electivire. And Electivire, with its immense electricity, manages to put down the Sigilith, and Paul throws a Pokeball to capture it. Paul is impressed by the power of the Sigilith, so he opts to send Torterra back to Reggie for right now. Then, the next morning, after they've had some time to rest at the Verbank Pokemon Center, they all head to the gym. Paul wants to go first in this one. He's feeling uneasy, but they know nothing about this gym, so he opts to take the first challenge because he really wants to be able to test himself. He wants to shake off this feeling of confusion that he's had over the past couple of days. Once entering the gym, the trio are introduced to Roxy, the hardcore rocker and user of poison types. She makes a proposition to Paul. He can use six Pokemon to her three, and if he can beat just her three Pokemon, with his six Pokemon, then he will earn himself the Toxic Batch. Paul thinks to himself, this should be easy. After all, six Pokemon versus three, he already has the numbers advantage. So, they decide to head into the gym and get to the battle. Roxy starts off with her coughing, and Paul chooses to go with Dwebble. Though Paul is confident that he has the number advantage, it becomes readily apparent very quickly that Roxy is no pushover, as her coughing is able to put down Dwebble with a gyro ball. Paul isn't shaken. He still knows that he has the numbers advantage. So, 
he decides to go with Yamask. Yamask, although it is powerful, again falls to Roxy's coughing. It does cause some damage with its confusion, but not enough to put it down. Paul is starting to think to himself, what is the deal with this trainer? She is really strong, but he can't give in right now. He has the opportunity to earn a badge here, and he still has the numbers advantage as far as Pokemon. Paul then sends an Electivire, and though coughing is extremely fast, Electivire is able to keep up, and it manages to put coughing down with a Thunder Punch. Next, Roxy sends in her Scolipede, and Scolipede is an extremely powerful Pokemon. Paul opts to recall Electivire, and he sends in Pignite. This battle is a little bit more even for Paul. He's been working with Pignite a lot, and even though it did lose to the Sigilith, it does have the type advantage here. And Paul is able to take advantage of it using Flame Charge and Fire Pledge to keep the Scolipede at bay. This allows him to put down the Scolipede after Pignite takes some damage. But, unfortunately, Roxy still has her best Pokemon. She sends out her Garborder. And Garborder, it's not going to be easy to take down. And Pignite eventually falls to Garborder after it gets hit with a Toxic and then a Venice Shock. Paul is a little bit uneasy now. He decides to send in his Shelmet. Shelmet hopefully will have some sort of resistance to it, but unfortunately it's unable to push through Garborder's defenses and it loses. Paul's back is now to the wall. All he has left is just Sigilith and Electivire. Paul decides to send in Sigilith and although it does have the type advantage and is able to cause some damage to Garborder, it is still not enough to take down the Titan of Trash and it ends up falling. This uneases Paul. Five Pokemon, and he's only been able to take out two of hers, but he still has his ace. He decides to send in Electivire. Electivire does manage to put in some work against Garborder, but it is unfortunately hit with the poison. Paul is starting to be shaken in battle, and Electivire can feel this. Paul's uncertain about himself. He's becoming more and more uncertain as the battle goes on, and his sync with Electivire is starting to falter. As a result, Electivire ends up catching a Venice Shock, which is double the damage because it's poison, and its endurance isn't able to hold on, and it falls into battle. This causes Paul to lose the gym battle. He can't believe it. He lost six Pokemon against three. He had the numbers advantage and the type advantage in some of his battles, yet he couldn't pull through. We pick up a day after Paul's loss at the Verbank Gym. Paul hasn't really said a word, but Ash and Iris have tried talking with him, but he won't talk. Iris then tells Ash that he should prepare for his gym battle with Roxy. Ash tells Roxy that he's actually going to hold off on challenging the gym, and Iris asks why. Ash says, well, after Paul's battle with Roxy at the gym, I realize that she's on a whole nother level, and she's not somebody that you can just challenge recklessly. And because of her poison types, it could cause harm to your Pokemon that could cause permanent damage. I want to train to make sure that I'm ready. Ash then turns to Paul. Paul, I know you're going through some stuff right now, but you remember what you said to me when you battled with Trip? This gets Paul's attention. Ash says, you told me that we need to keep training and not to get lazy. We need to get back up and get back on track. Paul looks at Ash and asks, how would you suggest we do that? Ash says, simple, we start back at square one, the basics. Paul tells Ash, that sounds stupid. Ash tells Paul that's what he does whenever he loses his way. What better way to find the path than to rewalk it? Paul just stares at Ash. Then Iris chimes in, come on, Paul, what do you have to lose? Ash tells Paul, come on, you're the best person I know when it comes to developing strategies and training. What could it hurt to start over? and develop all new strategies. Paul looks even more intensely at Ash. All right, you want to train and develop all new battling skills? Then fine, but Ash, if we do this, then we do it my way, and we do it all the way. No whining, no complaining. Ash says he's on board, but with one condition. Paul, slightly annoyed, says, what is it? Ash tells Paul that any training we do has to be done with the Pokemon, what they do, 
We do. Paul just says, whatever. Just then, Roxy walks in, and Ash greets her. She is there to get her Pokemon checked up on in preparation for her battle with Ash. Ash then tells Roxy he's sorry, but he's not going to be able to battle with her. She's going to have to wait, as Paul and Iris and himself are about to start an intense training regimen in preparation for their next battle with her. Roxy tells Ash that it's a shame that she's going to have to wait, but she understands. She then suggests that they head to Asperdia's city. She heard that a new gym has just opened up there. This gets Ash's attention, but Paul doesn't really care until he overhears Roxy mention that the Unova region champion lives in Flockasai Town, which happens to be on the way to Asperdia City. Paul asks if that's true. Roxy says yes, as a matter of fact, sometimes he comes into Verbank City. It's about a two-weeks walk to Asperdia City from Verbank City. This gets Paul's motivation back, and the group makes the decision to head to the Asperdia Gym. The trio head out the next morning, but this journey actually takes longer, as Ash and Paul have been challenging each other in training with their Pokemon each day until they drop. It's even to the point that sometimes they have to rest an entire day before they are able to travel, some more due to the pure exhaustion. All of this extra training has had some positive and negative results. While Paul, for the most part, shaked off the funk he was having, he still has two major problems. One is Shelmet. It's not favoring Paul's defensive style of training, but it seems to react to Ash's offensive style of training. It seemed to have caught on to Ash's style of training like a second nature. And the other one, and more pressing issue, is Electivire. Paul can't seem to get into sync with it. It's kind of like it doesn't trust Paul, and it's getting to Paul, little by little, with each training session. But it's not all negative for Paul, as his Dwebble has evolved due to all the training. And Pignite has also learned the move Heat Crash. But Ash has had the most gains. Duot has learned Water Pulse and mastered its Aqua Jet. Venipede has also evolved into Whirlipede, and Pedov has evolved into Tranquil. Tranquil learned Air Cutter, while Whirlipede learned Rollout. And Ash has made even more progress with his bond with Infernape. But Ash does have one problem, Carablast. It doesn't seem to favor Ash's speed and offensive style. It seems to favor more of Paul's defensive style of training. Even Iris has gotten some benefits due to all this training, as her Sawaddle has fully evolved into a Levani. It takes about two weeks, but the trio finally arrives in Flockasai Town. They then head to the Pokemon Center to restore their Pokemon and get some rest after being on the road for so long. While at the center, Ash makes the call to Professor Juniper and sends Whirlipede to get Snivy in exchange. The next morning, after getting directions from Nurse Joy, the trio head to Alder's house, but no one is home. There is, however, a battlefield in front of the house, though. So Ash and Paul decide to get some extra training in while they wait. Paul and Ash decide to have a double battle. Paul uses Pignite and Shelmet, while Ash uses Duat and Carablast. The battle gets pretty intense, and the rivalry between Duat and Pignite shows, as the two can perfectly counter each other, and in the end, knocking each other out. So, it comes down to Shelmet and Carablast. While these two have gotten better and are past the awkward baby phase, the two still take battling to an extreme whenever they have the chance. As the two Pokemon battle it out, Alda the Champion arrives to this wondrous sight and interrupts the battle. Ash and Paul recall their Pokemon and apologize for their using the battlefield without his permission, but Alder tells them that's what it's there for. Then Paul speaks out immediately, shocking Ash and Iris. Alder, please battle with me, Paul proclaims. Alder laughs, wow, right to the point. You got guts, kid. I like that. Okay, we can have a battle. How's one-on-one -on -one sound? Paul agrees, and the two take their position at the opposite end of the battlefield. Ash and Iris watch the whole time, wondering what's going on with Paul and going through his head. Paul sends out Electivire, and Alder sends out his Bufalant. The battle between the two powerhouse Pokemon pretty much destroys the battlefield. Electivire is strong, and Alder sees this. He is forced to call the match before the conclusion, as he is worried that if they kept going, it would damage his house. Paul and Alder recall their Pokemon. Alder commends Paul on the discipline of his Electivire. Paul tells Alder that he has to disagree. Alder says why. 
Paul tells Zelder he feels like he's been unable to draw out Electivire's real potential. It seems like he can't get in sync with it. And that's why he wanted to battle, because he wanted to know if a champion could see it. But it seems Alder was not the person that Paul thought he was. Alder's demeanor then changes and intensifies. So, you want my wholehearted opinion? Well, your Electivire is well-trained. You are not. You are off-key, and during the battle, it was noticeable. But your Electivire compensated for it. So, any average trainer wouldn't have noticed it. But a seasoned trainer would. And in that battle, you would have lost the battle due to no fault but your own. Due to your own lack of fortitude. Iris asks Ash if what Alder said was true. Ash says yes. As long as he's known Paul, Paul has always been a very skilled trainer. And his Pokemon have always responded to him. But lately, it seems like Paul has been off. And Ash doesn't know why. Alder then continues. Your Electivire is ready for its next stage of growth, but it seems you haven't grown with it to meet that challenge. You're practically driving a wedge between you and it, and if it continues, then the two of you will no longer be able to battle together. Iris tells Ash that she didn't even notice. Recently, Paul has been quiet, but no more than usual. Ash then goes on to tell Iris about Infernape and its story and how Paul was its original trainer, but Paul had abandoned it because it wouldn't respond to him. This angers Iris. She didn't know that Paul was one of those trainers. Ash then tells her that it was a different time. Paul has changed a lot since then. Look at Pignic. After all, it was a ban. Ash stops in mid-conversation. Iris says, yeah, we know Pignic was abandoned. So what does that have to do with anything? Ash says, probably nothing, as he looks at Paul, talking with Alder, just thinking to himself. Paul then thanks Alder for his honesty. After all, that's what he truly needed more than anything. He then takes his leave back to the Pokemon Center with Ash and Iris trying to catch up. Later at the center, Ash tries to talk with Paul, but he doesn't want to. Ash keeps trying, but the more he tries, the more Paul blows him off, and Ash is starting to get frustrated. He says, fine, if you won't talk to me, then battle me, Paul. Paul tries to walk away, but he stops when Ash says, what's the matter, Paul? What's the matter, Paul? Have you finally realized your failure with Infernape, but you refuse to face it? This angers Paul, and he says, fine, Ash, you want a battle? Then you've got one. Paul says they will have a one-on-one, -on -one, as it is late, and they don't want to disturb the patrons of the center. But Ash tells him no. This will be a full six-on-six six battle. Paul tries to decline, but Ash won't drop it. So just to shut Ash up, Paul finally agrees, and they head to the battlefield behind the Pokemon Center. Once outside, Iris yells at Ash to stop, but he says no, they're going to have a battle, and no one will get in the way. Ash tells Paul to choose his first Pokemon. Paul reluctantly sends out Sigilyph, and Ash sends in Tranquil. The battle starts, and Ash uses Tranquil's speed to his advantage. Ash busts out a new move that they've been working on, Aerial Ace. But Paul seems to be unaffected, and is easily able to counter Tranquil with Sigilyph's psychic powers, and it is able to put it down with an air cutter. Not what Ash was expecting, but he sends in Pikachu, who revenge kills Sigilyph. Paul then sends in Crustle. Paul aims to use its defense to outlast Pikachu, and though it does work, Pikachu is still able to take it down with an Iron Tail. Paul's third Pokemon is Yaw Mask. Again, not the Pokemon that Ash wanted. But the battle continues and Yaw Mask is able to put Pikachu down with a Shadow Ball. Ash then sends in Snivy, and this battle is pretty much even. Though Snivy is at a higher level, Paul is still able to counter its Leaf Tornado with confusion but then is met with a leaf blade, knocking it out. The battle between these two has started to draw a crowd, and Iris comments to herself out loud, what is Ash looking for? Then she hears a voice say, Paul's choke point. Iris turns, it's Alder. She asks, what do you mean, Alder? Alder says, I get it. It's easy to see that Ash knows Paul better than anyone. So if anyone knows what's wrong with Paul, it's him. 
Paul recalls Jan Mask, and Ash recalls Snivy to save it for later. Then he asks Paul why he's avoiding the battle. Paul says, what do you mean? I'm battling you. Ash says, that's not what I mean. I gave you two solid choices to take advantage against my Pokemon, but you deliberately avoided it. Pikachu and Snivy. Normally, you would have sent out Pignite and Electivire, but you are actually avoiding using them. Why? Paul says, not true. I've used Electivire this morning against Alder. Then why hold it back now? Paul tells Ash to be quiet and send in his next Pokemon. So Ash does it. Carablast. So Paul sends in Shelman. Alder sees this and mumbles to himself. Interesting. Then the fourth round starts, and this battle is intense, but not because Ash and Paul, but because Shelmet and Carablast. The two just want to fight each other, and Ash and Paul eventually just recall the two Pokemon because they refuse to give up on the battle. Ash then sends in Snivy, and as Paul only has two Pokemon left, he uses Pig Knight. Ash thinks, finally, and the battle gets underway, and it goes pretty quick. Snivy loses to a Fire Pledge, evening up the battle between the two. This is where Ash wanted Paul. He wanted these two exact Pokemon in a battle. Ash tells Paul, let's make this more interesting. Paul asks, what does he mean? Ash says, let's make this last battle a double battle. Winner take all. Paul says, what exactly do you mean, winner take all? Ash tells Paul, if he wins, then he won't bring up the issues that he's having anymore. But if Ash wins, then Paul has to accept Ash's help. Paul then says, fine. But then, I want to add one more condition. Ash says, okay, what is it? Paul says, if he wins, then they part ways and travel separately. Like the rivals that they are. We pick back up with Ash and Paul on the battlefield. Ash is silent to Paul's request, thinking, wow, I didn't know it was this bad. Then, Ash is interrupted by Paul. Well, do you accept my conditions? Ash snaps back to reality. Okay, Paul, you got a deal. If I win, you accept my help. If you win, we part ways. Paul then sends out Electivire to join Pig Knight. Ash sends in both Duat and Infernape. Ash knows that this, this battle will be tough. If there's a trainer that knows Ash more than himself, it's Paul. But Paul is his friend, and he has to win in order to help him. The battle starts and Paul then orders a Thunder Punch and a Fire Pledge. While, while Pig Knight's time is near perfect, Elect Electivire is still off due to the hesitation of Paul whenever he gives it a command. As a result, Ash is able to counter the Fire Pledge with the Counter Shield technique that he taught Duwa and Infernape. And Infernape is able to land a powerful Flare Blitz, knocking Electivire down. Infernape does take recoil, but Ash did it to send a message. If Paul doesn't take this battle seriously, then he will lose. Electivire stands back up and looks at Paul, glaring at him. Then, without a command, Electivire fires a thunderbolt at Paul, catching everyone off guard. But Pig Knight is able to intercept it and he takes the hit. But this thunder causes huge damage to Pig Knight. This forces the battle to be stopped by Alder when he steps in. Paul rushes to Pig Knight, calling for Nurse Joy. Paul looks at Electivire. What were you thinking? He says. The look on Electivire's face changes from a look of anger to a look of puzzlement. It's like it didn't know what was going on. Paul recalls it as Nurse Joy arrives to tend to Pig Knight. Ash rushes over to help and they head inside. Off in the distance, a storm is circling, very similar to the one that happened on the day that Paul Paul and Ash arrived in Unova. In the morning, after all the Pokemon have been recovered, Alder then says, There is one other thing that I did want to talk to you about. Paul and Ash look at each other. He says, You're Carablast and Shelmet. These two Pokemon are all wrong for the two of you. Ash puzzled, looking at Alder, and asks, What do you mean? Alder tells them that the two Pokemon don't fit their styles of training. Paul then looks at Alder. Look, if you think I'm going to release Shelmet, then you're crazy, old man. Ash supports this by saying he will work with Carablast as much as needed in order to get in sync with it. Alder then says, No, no, there's, that's not what I'm I'm talking about. Paul then says, what is it? Alder says, trade them. Paul says, what? Alder says, you should trade them with each other. That way, the Pokemon is not trying to adjust just to fail to the type of battle style that is their trainer. From my perspective, it would benefit both parties involved. Ash and Paul look at Alder. Alder says, listen, it's just a suggestion. Take it or leave it. That, he leaves to head home. More time passes, and the storm has finally reached the Pokemon Center. Nurse Joy emerges from the medical room, and Paul rushes over to her. He asks if Pidnight is okay. Nurse Joy tells Paul it will be fine, but it needs a lot of rest. But she hopes that the storm 
doesn't get any worse, as any interruption to the power could be a problem, not only for Pignite, but for the other Pokemon of the center. Paul then asks if he can see Pignite. Nurse Joy says yes, but it needs to be brief. So the trio head inside, and Pignite is unconscious, but stable. Paul's back is to Ash and Iris, when they hear Paul say, I'm sorry, I failed you. This catches both Ash and Iris off guard. Ash knows what this is, so he urges Paul to elaborate on what he said. Paul turns to them, and he actually has tears in his eyes. He tells them that this is hard for him to say, but he's been doubting himself ever since he caught Pignite, and it's been growing more and more with each battle that passes. Ash says, what do you mean? You and Pignite are in perfect sync. Paul tells them, I knew from the moment that I caught Pignite, it was abandoned, and I didn't want to make the same mistakes that I did with Chimchar. So, I've held myself back from pushing it, because I didn't want to give it the same type of mental stress that Chimchar had when I released it. But because I held myself back, but because I've been holding myself back, it's starting to affect my other Pokemon, which normally would be fine, as they and I don't have a lot of history. But Electivire and I do, and now it's causing issues to the point to where my other Pokemon are getting hurt. Paul then turns to Ash, and he says, this is the first time that I've ever been lost, and I haven't had the guidance of my brother. Ash walks over to Paul and puts his hand on his shoulder. He tells Paul, Pig Knight is not Infernape. When I caught Infernape as a Chimchar, it was in a bad place, but it wanted to get stronger to prove to its previous trainer, you, that it could. So it did. Look at Pig Knight. You're in the same boat I was. Now, I don't know why Electivire attacked you, but it is clear by Pig Knight's reaction that it cares for you and it wants to grow with you because it finally has a trainer that recognizes its power. Infernape then pops out of the Pokeball without being released. It looks at Paul and it nods in approval with Ash. Ash says, see, Infernape forgives you. It realizes that you've changed. You're not the same cold person you were. Ash then asks Paul, are you finally ready to accept my help? You don't have to do this alone. Paul looks at Ash and Infernape, but then the power to the Pokemon Center cuts off. Nurse Joy then comes in and tells them that all the lightning outside surging around the Pokemon Center has overloaded the power circuits, and until the storm passes, the power won't be able to come back on. Paul and Ash look at each other. They nod, and Ash tells Pikachu to come on, and they head outside. Ash tells Pikachu to absorb the lightning and divert it into the ground with its tail. But the problem is, there's too much for Pikachu to absorb on its own, and it's getting overloaded. Ash tells Paul that Pikachu can't do it alone. They need Electivire. Paul is hesitant. Ash tells Paul to hurry. Pikachu won't last much longer. Paul pulls out Electivire's Pokeball and thinks to himself, I know we're having difficulties, but I really need you right now. Paul then sends in Electivire. Electivire comes out from the ball, and the storm surges violently, and all of the lightning is now diverted to Electivire with a flash. Once the light fades, there stands Electivire, but it's not normal. Paul calls to Electivire, and it turns. Electivire is surging with blue electricity, and it has the same look that it had when it attacked Paul the last time. Ash looks at Pikachu. It fainted from all the energy it absorbed. Ash knows that this situation is about to get heavy, as Electivire fires a thunder, but it's not aimed at Paul. It's just firing wildly. Ash calls to Infernape. We need to stop Electivire. Infernape looks at Ash and nods. Infernape needs to get Electivire's attention and fires a flamethrower, but it barely does anything, and Electivire just brushes it off. Ash thinks, this is bad. All of this energy has powered up Electivire, and not even Infernape has the power to match it. Well, not in its current form. Ash and Infernape look at each other as Paul watches on. They know what they have to do. Paul tells Ash he's crazy, but Ash says, do you have a better idea? Paul tells Ash and Infernape just to be careful, and he grabs Pikachu, and they move away from the battle. Ash orders a flare blitz. It connects, and finally, Electivire's attention turns to Ash and Infernape. Ash tells Infernape that they have to keep Electivire's attention focused on them. Ash then orders a close combat. This, too, causes some damage, but Electivire still stands, and in retaliation, it fires fires another thunder. This hits Infernape, knocking it down. Ash calls out to it, and it stands back up. Ash thinks, almost there. Ash then orders a flamethrower, but it's countered with a thunder punch from Electivire that hits Infernape, knocking it back. Electivire, thinking it had won, then turns his attention to Paul, but Ash calls to it. Hey, Electivire, where do you think you're going? This isn't over yet. Electivire turns, and there stands Infernape, and it's glowing. This is what Ash and Infernape wanted. Blaze. Ash knows that this is a huge risk, but it's the only thing that they have that can match this kind of power. Ash orders Infernape to attack, and the two Pokemon battle it out, holding nothing back. Paul can see that this is working. The energy that Electivire has accumulated is slowly dissipating. Paul tells Ash and Infernape to push harder. As Infernape blows with more intensity, something happens to Ash. He can feel it. Infernape, its thoughts, its feelings, and its pain. While the battle's going on, outside of Phloxet Town, a lone trainer who saw the storm surging and has come to investigate it is, a is approaching at the same time that all of this is happening, when his bag starts to glow. He just stares at it, thinking, what are you telling me, friend? Who are you reaching out to? Back with Ash and Infernape, Ash knows that they need to end this with 
one final push. Ash orders Inferno to use Flare Blitz and not to hold back. Inferno surges with Blaze and rushes in. Electivire charges a Thunder and the storm above surges. Inferno speeds toward Electivire with unprecedented velocity and connects with an explosion big enough to force the storm above in the sky and the clouds to dissipate. Once the smoke clears, Inferno is standing, but just barely, while Electivire is unconscious on the ground. Ash and Paul rush over to them. Infernape is hurt, but it will recover. Paul tries to wake up Electivire, and it briefly wakes up. It seems back to normal, but then it just faints again. Paul turns to Infernape to thank it for getting Electivire back to normal. Then, all the lights in the Pokemon Center come back on. Paul recalls Infernape, and the two trainers head back inside to get both their Pokemon looked at. Later that night, after the Pokemon have had some time to rest, Paul thanks Ash for the risk he took. Ash tells Paul not to worry about it. He knows that he would have done the same for him. Paul then asks Ash about the battle. He says, it seemed like Infernape's blaze was way stronger than normal. Ash says, you noticed it too? I noticed it. It was strange. I could feel Infernape and its thoughts and pain, but it was weird. Toward the end of the battle, it was like I could feel a third presence, another voice that wasn't ours. But as soon as the battle was over, it was gone. Ash asked Paul if he knew anything about it, if he had ever experienced anything like that with Chimchar. Paul says no. I never fathomed that Infernape's power and blaze ability would grow in the way that it has, but it seems that Ash is the perfect person to bring it out. The two trainers decide to call it a night, as this day has been a pretty tiring one. In the morning, after all the Pokemon have recovered, Ash, Paul, and Iris get ready to head out when they are approached by a traveler who greets them. After they introduce themselves, this traveler tells them that his name is N and he is on a very sp All right, now we switch over to Jesse, James, and Meowth. The trio have been quite busy. So, for a recap, before the three set out for the Unova region, they were debriefed by Giovanni. They were told that an ancient meteorite had crash landed on Earth thousands of years prior to the current day, and its energy surged through most of the planet, mainly in the Unova region. So their goal was to infiltrate the Unova region as natives, not even being allowed to take any Pokemon from their prior adventures with them, having to catch all new Pokemon. While there, they met up with several sleeper agents who, on occasion, would give them tools or their next orders. Though Jesse, James, and Meowth made a few brief encounters with Ash, Paul, and Iris to try and steal Pikachu, most of the time they spent observing them from afar, just keeping tabs on them, as their orders to find pieces of the meteorite and other ancient artifacts from Unova's past had them traveling from research institute to museum to private collections gathering these artifacts, all the while Giovanni keeping a close eye on their progress. As of late in the Unova region, nature seems to have come unbalanced. And the more that Jesse, James, and Meowth start to retrieve these ancient artifacts, the more unstable nature has become, as it is shown with the storms that keep popping up randomly through Unova, mainly around Paul, Ash, and Iris. Jesse, James, and Meowth have spent several weeks completing their tasks, and now upon their latest communication with Giovanni, they have been informed that he is now leaving the Kanto region en route for the Hoenn region. But that's not the only thing. In the shadows, another secret organization native to the Unova region have been making their move. They have their own plans that they intend to bring to fruition, and they have been secretly watching Jesse, James, and Meowth, keeping tabs on their every move. And now that Team Rocket is finally ready to make their move, this hidden organization plans to make themselves known. Now that Paul and Electivire are struggling with their bond, and Ash and Infernape are strengthening theirs, Giovanni has decided to enter the picture, and with this shadow organization getting ready to make their presence known, and this mysterious young man known as N introducing himself to the heroes, what new adventures and threats await in them as their journeys in Unova continue? We pick back up with Ash, Iris, and Paul as the mysterious N introduces himself. Ash and Iris are excited to meet him, but Paul thinks something is strange. Something about N feels off, but with everything that's happened lately, it could just be his imagination running wild. N begins to discuss the events of last night's storm with the group, and Ash tells him how the storm knocked out most of the power in the Pokemon Center, and asks if anything else strange happened. Iris blurts out how Paul's Electifier went crazy and almost killed him. This gets N's attention, and Paul just glares at Iris making her uncomfortable. N then asks, really? That sounds awful. Ash says, yeah, it was the strangest thing. Electivire seemed to be stronger than usual. N asks how they were able to stop Electivire if it wasn't listening to commands. Iris follows up, well, Ash and his Infernate managed to stop it. N says, really? Your Infernate must be very special. Ash says, I wouldn't say that. We were just really in sync. N then asks if he can see this Infernape of Ash's. Ash, kind of surprised by this request, says, okay, and sends out Infernape. N greets Infernape and introduces himself. 
N reaches for Infernape, and upon contact, he gets a rush of emotions that kind of overwhelm him. Then, N says, this Infernape has a rich history. This draws the trio's attention. N then follows up with, especially with being abandoned by you, Paul. Paul asks, how did you know that? N just says, Infernape told me. Paul says, what do you mean, Infernape told you? It doesn't talk. N says, well, that is true. Pokemon do have emotions, and I can feel those emotions. Every feeling an experience they've ever had, I can sense, and I can see this Infernape has a special destiny. Those words echo with Ash and Paul, immediately taking them back to Eterna City in Sinnoh when Cynthia said the same thing. Ash says, what did you say? And says, Infernape, it has a special destiny. Why? Ash says, you're not the first person who has said that. And says, really? Well, then only the future will tell if this is true. This whole introduction has Paul questioning N even more, but he says nothing. Ash then asks N, well since you have seen my Pokemon, how about you show us yours? N says, well, that's something I can't do. Ash says, why? The tone changes. N says, because I don't have any. I don't believe in confining Pokemon to those prisons. All they do is cause Pokemon pain. Ash says, what? Pokemon aren't in pain. What do you know? You don't even have one. N tells Ash, he has experienced the dark side of humanity and what they are capable of. It's only negative things. Ash tells N he doesn't know where he's developed his warped perception of reality, but it's not true. People in Pokemon can live together. Infernape then steps in to support Ash. When this happens, N reacts to a heartbeat, like something is reacting to Ash and Infernape. N's demeanor then changes again. He thinks to himself, these two? No, it can't be who you were reaching out to. Ash then interrupts N's thoughts by calling to him. N snaps back and says, oh, nothing. Say, Ash, where are you and your friends headed to next? Ash says, we're going to Asperdia City. They heard there was a gym there that just opened up. N, out of curiosity of Ash and Infernape, asks if they wouldn't mind. He would like to tag along, as he is heading that way as well. Ash goes to say something, but Paul pulls him back. Ash, wait. There's something off about this guy. I can't put my finger on it, but I'm not sure if he can be trusted. Ash says, yeah, something is definitely off, but I don't see any harm in him at least coming with us to Asperdia City. Look, N and Iris have really hit it off. Paul isn't comfortable with this, but he is outvoted by Ash and Iris. With that, the trio plus one head out, with Paul keeping a close eye on N. It takes about a week, and over that time, Ash and Paul spends more time training for this new gym. Paul is making progress as he is getting his confidence back. His timing with his Pokemon is back to normal with all except for Electivire. Paul is still hesitant, but he is trying to work with it. N notices the hesitation with Paul and Electivire, but says nothing. He just observes. But Ash and Paul continue to train. While this is happening, Iris fills in in on Ash and Paul's backstory and their adventures in Sinnoh. N says nothing and just watches as the two rivals turn friends, train together. The next day, they arrive in Asperdia City and head straight for the gym. Upon arriving, they are introduced to Sharon, the leader of the new gym. Ash introduces himself and says he is here to challenge for a badge. Sharon tells Ash he likes the enthusiasm, but he wants him to know that this will be his first official gym battle. Sharon then pulls out a badge. Ash, if you can beat me, then you will earn this basic badge. Ash then says, hold on. This isn't the gym that hosts the basic badge. That gym belongs to Lenore in Nacarine City. Sharon says, used to be. Lenore closed the gym, so I accepted the honor to reopen the gym here in Asperdia. Paul says, great. This has been a giant waste of time. I already have this badge. Ash excitedly says, yeah, but this is my chance to challenge for it. Sharon says, oh, so you already have this one, Paul. Well, maybe after my battle with Ash, we could battle. I would like to battle someone who's beaten Lenore. Paul says, there's no need. I already have the badge. Then he walks away. Chiron then turns to Ash. Are you ready for your battle? Ash says, you bet. So the two trainers take their position. Chiron says, this will be a two-on-two -two battle. Only the challenger is allowed substitutions. Chiron then sends in his first Pokemon, Sinchino. Ash uses his Pokedex to get info on it. Then he decides to go with Duwat. The battle starts and Ash tries to use its speed to his advantage and he orders an Aqua Jet. But Chiron is ready. He orders a Tail Slap that deflects the Aqua Jet, canceling it out. Chiron tells Ash that he will have to do better than that if he wants to win this gym battle. Ash says, no problem, as he orders Duwat to rush in with the Razor Shell. Chiron orders Sinchino to use another Tail Slap to deflect it, but Ash was ready for this. He orders Duwat to use one of its Razor Shells to defend and the other one to attack. This allows Duwat to dodge the tail slap to get in with an attack on Sinchino with its razor shell. With Sinchino wide open, the razor shell hits with extra power. It's not enough to knock out Sinchino, but it definitely felt it and is now moving slower because of it. Charon was caught off guard 
He never faced someone like Ash, and he has to be on his toes. Charon then orders Sinchino to use a quick attack to try and shift the momentum back in his favor, but it's met with an aqua jet. Ash then orders Duat to use a water gun while they are in the air, and it hits Sinchino, forcing it into the ground. Then, as Duat falls down towards Sinchino, Ash orders another aqua jet, and as it rushes in to Sinchino, Charon orders another tail slap, and it catches Duat in the air, knocking it down to the ground. This hit wasn't good for Duat. It took a lot of damage. Ash calls for Duat, telling it he knows it can still battle. He knows it has more endurance than that. Duat struggles to its feet, and as it does, it starts to glow. Ash knows what this is. It's Torrent. This is the first time that Duat has been able to access it. The battle is nearly over, and the two trainers know it. Ash orders Duat to ready a razor show. Charon orders Sinchino to take a defensive position, and Ash orders Duat to use Aqua Jet with its razor shells. Charon, expecting Duat to use one to defend a shot from its tail slap, knows that Ash can't defend all hits at that high of speed. Once Duat gets in close, Charon orders tail slap, but Ash doesn't order any defense from Duat. Instead, Duat only attacks, taking all the tail slaps in the process. Once the battle ends, the two Pokemon stand there, looking at each other. And like looking in the mirror, the both collapse to the ground from the battle. Ash and Sharon recall their Pokemon. Sharon is impressed with Ash, but Ash is disappointed with himself. All of the training him and Duat have done, and they still haven't won a gym battle since the Striaton gym. But Sharon interrupts Ash's inner conversation with Heron. That battle was great, but you will have to do better, Ash. Sharon then sends in his ace, Stoutland. Ash can tell that this thing has power. After using his Pokedex, he knows just what he's dealing with and thinks back to Lenora and her Herdier. If he had trouble with that and it was only a second Sage, then this final evolution will be a whole nother level. Ash knows he only has one real choice. So, he sends in Infernape. As Infernape emerges from the ball and hears it again, a heartbeat. He thinks, is this the one you're reaching for? As he watches the battle, Paul can see that N seems to be taking a particular interest in Infernape, so Paul watches as well. Chiron has never seen an Infernape before, so he is curious on what it can do. He wastes no time and orders a Giga Impact, and his Stoutland rushes in, and it's fast. But Ash and Infernape aren't afraid. Ash orders the Flare Blitz to counter. The two Pokemon collide, canceling out each other's attacks. Infernape does take some damage, but it made a statement. It's not intimidated by Stoutland and Sharon. Sharon can see it in Ash's eyes. His focus has changed. It's on a razor's edge, and Infernape is the same way. Him and Ash are on the same page, and they have seen many battles together. Sharon refuses to be intimidated by the duo. As a result, the battle gets really intense, with both Pokemon exchanges attack, like close combat and crunch. The battle draws out long enough that Charon sees Infernape's true power. Blaze then activates, and this catches Paul's attention. How could this new gym leader push Infernape that far? And as Blaze erupts, N hears it again, a heartbeat reacting to Infernape, and just watches more intensely. With the activation of Blaze, the battle quickly becomes one-sided, as Infernape puts Stoutland down with the Flare Blitz, earning Ash his third badge, and tying him with Paul in his badges. Charon then presents Ash with the basic badge. He also thanks Ash for the battle, as he will always remember his first battle as a gym leader, and he's glad it could be with Ash. Paul then approaches Charon. Even though I have the basic badge, I would still like to battle you, Paul says. A one-on-one, -on -one tomorrow, first thing. Charon is excited and glad to take Paul's challenge. Later that night at the Pokemon Center, the group has been talking for a while about the battle. Paul then asks Ash, Hey Ash, today, during the battle, when Blaze was activated, it was like when Infernape fought Electivire. Did you feel it again? This grabs N's attention. What do you mean, he asks. Ash just laughs nervously. No, not this time. And says, well, what was it? Ash says, well, sometimes when Infernape and I battle, it's like we are one. We can hear each other's thoughts and feel each other's pain. But lately, it feels like there's a third presence with us. Something I can't explain. It's like, then N finishes the sentence. Someone is reaching out to you from far away. Ash says, yeah, that's it exactly. N is now interested in this boy, so much so that he is sticking with him and his group as they could be the ones he's been looking for. The next day, they head back to the gym. N has no interest in seeing Paul battle due to his history with Infernape. That is, until Paul sends out Electivire. Paul wants to use it at Ash's suggestion. As soon as it's out of its ball, N can feel it. The tension and uncertainty between Paul and Electivire. N then asks what's the deal with these two. Why does it seem like they have so much tension and confusion between them? Ash explains that Electivire and Paul have been a team as long as he has known them, 
but lately the two have been having trouble battling with each other. Kind of like there's trust issues. Things finally came to a head when Electivire was struck by lightning from that storm the night before we met you. And shocked, you mean that Electivire was struck by lightning from that storm? Ash says, yeah, why? And says, nothing, just interesting. As this battle now has ends full attention. The battle itself isn't too special. Paul and Electivire are working together, but their timing is massively off and they aren't of one mind. N takes notice of this. Paul, in the end, takes the win, but not because he and Electivire improve. It's because Electivire is conditioned for harsh battles due to its training with Paul in the past. So its endurance is just as impressive as Infernapes. With this battle behind them, the group then catches a boat from Asperdia City to Verbang City, as both Ash and Paul want to battle Roxy. During the boat ride, which takes about a week, Ash and Paul train more. They make some massive developments with their teams. Yamask ends up evolving into Cofragrius, and Tranquil ends up evolving into Unpheasant. Then, the more Ash and Paul battle, the more N comes to understand the two of them. This is how they communicate, and how their Pokemon and them become one. N then notices Carablast and Shelmet, and the struggles of the two Pokemon and their trainers. The week also allowed Paul and Electivire to work one-on-one. -on -one. The boat had a great training area for trainers and their Pokemon. At the end of the week, the group arrives in Verbank City, and it is rather late. They will have to wait until the morning to challenge the gym. While formulating their strategies for the battle, Paul tells Ash that he would like to challenge first. Ash looks at Paul. Paul continues to say that the loss that he had last time has been eating away at him and he wants, no he needs the chance to make it right. Ash just smiles and says, you got it. Then N comes over to talk with the two. He says, while he doesn't support trainers and them battling Pokemon, he does support the happiness of their Pokemon. And with that, he would like to make a suggestion that could help them in their upcoming battles, but only if the two agree to it before he tells them what it is. Ash is more willing to agree, but Paul, as he still doesn't trust him due to him feeling like he is hiding something, is hesitant. But after some persuading from Ash and Iris, Paul agrees, mostly to shut the two up. With that, N walks them to another part of the Pokemon Center. When they arrive at the location that N was talking about, Paul asks, what? Is this a joke? N says, no. Hear me out. Your Carablast and your Shelmet are having trouble getting in sync with you two. Ash, angry, says so. N then suggests that Paul and Ash trade the two Pokemon, as he feels that they would be better suited with the latter. Ash thinks about this, and so does Paul, because now something that Champion Alder said is now being echoed by another. Iris, too, then chimes in and says, I agree with N, surprising everyone. She says, I've noticed it from day one, but you two can be so stubborn to talk to sometimes. So I didn't bring it up. Ash just stares at her, but then Paul says, okay, let's do it. Again, surprising everyone. Ash asks if he is sure. Paul tells Ash that he needs to learn to accept help, right? Well, if three different people are saying the same thing, then I think we might want to give it a try. Worst case is we just trade back. Ash then agrees and they start the process. Once complete, the two trainers let their new Pokemon out of their balls. But what emerges isn't the two that were traded. In their place stand two new powerful looking Pokemon. Ash immediately freaks, claiming that Paul did something wrong. But Paul just says, wait, look, Ash, the two Pokemon are familiar with their trainers. Paul pulls out his Pokedex. It reads, a Scavalier, the cavalry Pokemon, and the evolved form of Carablast. They fly at high speeds, striking with their pointed spears. Even when in trouble, they face their opponent bravely. Then, Ash pulls out his Pokedex. It reads, Selgor, the shell-out Pokemon, and the evolved form of Shellman. Having removed its heavy shell, it becomes lightweight and can fight with ninja-like movements. Both Ash and Paul now understand what they meant. One defense and one offense. These Pokemon match their battle styles. Iris then says, I once heard that Carablast and Shelmet only evolve when they're close to each other. This must be what was meant. Then, Paul looks at his Pokedex and realizes something. He gets a grin on his face and says, he's gotta go, and then he runs off. Iris asks what that was about. Ash says, knowing Paul, he's got a plan. He's gonna use a Cavalier in the battle tomorrow. After making a phone call, Paul then spends the rest of his night training and strategizing with his Pokemon. The next morning, our group is at the Verbank Gym. Ash, and Iris, and N look on from the crowd as Paul challenges Roxy to a rematch. Roxy accepts, but Paul tells her he wants a full six-on-six -six battle. Roxy asks if Paul is sure about that. Last time, he could barely handle three. Paul tells her that he is. This is something he needs. Roxy says, okay, you asked for it, and the battle starts. Roxy then leads with her coughing, just like last time. Paul figured she would, so he sends in his first Pokemon. Torterra. Roxy is curious with Paul's choice, as she didn't see this Pokemon before. She orders Coughing to use Gyro Ball. Paul then orders Torterra to set up Stone Edge defense. Coughing is intercepted, taking damage as its own speed caused it to hit the stones harder than normal. This type of strategy is new to Roxy. 
She is impressed. Paul learned from their last encounter. Paul aims to control the battle. He feels like he lost his way, who he is. But this battle, though not the end, it will be the beginning to the road of recovering himself. Paul knows he has the advantage in this setting. Roxy can't change Pokemon, but she isn't going to give up so easily. She orders a sludge bomb, and coughing starts to spin at a rapid pace, firing it everywhere. Torterra tries to defend, but some of it gets through damaging Torterra, causing it to drop the Stone Edge. Roxy sees this, then orders another Gyro Ball, and it connects with Torterra. This causes great damage, but Paul was ready. As Coffin connects, he orders the Giga Drain, and Torterra latches onto Coffin, draining it of its energy rapidly. Coffin starts to spin to escape, and it manages to break itself free, but as it starts to get away, Torterra puts back up the Stone Edge wall, and Coffin gets caught in it. Then, Paul orders Torterra to use a Frenzy plant that connects knocking out coughing and giving Paul the first lead. Roxy is impressed. Torterra is powerful, so Roxy matches the power with her next Pokemon, Scolipede. Paul chooses to stay with Torterra. This battle goes a little faster as, as Scolipede is able to maneuver around Torterra's defense and hit with its toxic. Then, when it gets in close, it uses a Venice Shock, but not before taking a Frenzy Plant at point blank range as Torterra gets knocked out. Scolipede is severely damaged in the process. Paul recalls Torterra and thanks it. After looking over Scolipede, Paul decides to send in his Pignite. The battle starts and Pignite takes an easy win when he uses an arm thrust to block a Venice Shock and then Paul wraps it up with a fire pledge. Roxy thinks to herself, I need to take control of this battle, so she sends in something with a type advantage, Crobat, but Paul won't give her the satisfaction and recalls Pignite for later. He then sends in his Sigilith. Roxy can't believe it. Paul has had a perfect counter for each one of her Pokemon and their moves. He's using every advantage that he has. This is not the same trainer she fought last time. Ash, Iris, and N all watch from the sidelines, and Ash comments, this is Paul at his best. He is going to win. The battle between Crobat and Sigilith is quick, as the two match each other blow for blow, resulting in a double knockout. Paul refuses to give Roxy any ground, and no matter how hard she pushes, he pushes back that much harder. Roxy then sends in her next Pokemon, Amoongus. At this time, Paul decides to send in his newest strength, as Cavalier, a perfect counter to Amoongus. And Paul demonstrates this when its bug, Steel Typing, makes it immune to Roxy's poison from Amoongus, allowing it to be taken out by a twin needle. Roxy's rhythm has been off this whole battle, as Paul has been the one controlling the tempo, but she hopes to turn it around now, as she sends in her next Pokemon, Toxicroak. Paul decided to recall Excavalier for now and sends back in Pignite. This battle gets intense, pushing Pignite and Toxicroak to the limit as they exchange poison jabs and arm thrusts. Ultimately, after being poisoned, Paul tries a fire pledge, but it is countered with a dig, knocking out Pignite. Paul then sends back in Excavalier. Roxy knows that Toxicroak has taken great damage, and it is now at a type disadvantage, so she will have to play this smart. The battle is a little one-sided, but Roxy uses Dig to dodge most of Excavalier's attacks, but when she sees Toxicroak start to tire, she orders a high-risk close combat that connects with Excavalier, but Toxicroak is also hit with an Iron Head, ultimately knocking both out. This battle has come down to the wire, but Paul still has two Pokemon to Roxy's one. So both trainers send in their next choice. And for Roxy, it's her last, but strongest, Garbodor. While Paul's choice is much more of a defensive option, Cofagrius. This battle takes a good amount of time. So much so that the audience has become restless. But this is exactly what Paul wanted. At the start of the battle, Cofagrius hit Garbodor with the Will-O-Wisp. But as a counter, Cofagrius was also hit with the poison at the same time. Because Paul set up Cofagrius to be a defensive a wall with things like Calm Mind and Protect, this battle becomes slow, but Cofagrius ultimately falls due to Toxic's damage compounding faster than Will-O-Wisps. But Cofagrius did what Paul wanted it to do, wear Garbordor out. As Paul stands there, he clutches his last Pokeball in his hand. We've been at odds, and our struggles have been real. I know I haven't been the best trainer, no, best partner you deserve due to my own self-doubts, but it's time we change that, Paul thinks to himself as he sends in Electivire. Roxy knows that this battle will be close. She can see it. This whole battle has been different. The look in Paul's eyes has changed. He's focused and Electivire can sense it. The battle starts. Electivire and Garbordor go at it. Every attack that Roxy fires is countered perfectly. Paul really paid attention in their last battle. Paul and Electivire seem to be on the same page and in the crowd, N can feel it. They are becoming one and N thinks to himself, could he be the other one? But he senses something else there, deeply buried between the two. Doubt. As the battle reaches its climax, 
Paul hears something, a voice in his head. Paul thinks it's just his mind playing tricks on him. Little does anyone know, another storm is surging above the gym, just like the one before. Suddenly, Electivire demeanors changes once more to an aggressive one, and it again begins to attack wildly, hitting Garbodor with the full power of thunder, knocking it out. The attack comes with no command from Paul. As this is happening, N rushes outside as Ash and Iris stare in confusion of Paul and Electivire. As N gets outside the gym, there is a storm raging violently above, striking the gym with lightning, and screams to the sky, no, he's not ready yet, you have to be patient. His heart and mind are still clouded, and almost as a response, lightning strikes all around N in what seems to be disapproval, not actually hitting him though. Back in the gym, things are getting out of hand. Ash and Iris choose to step in with Infernape and Levani. Paul is trying to reach Electivire, but it won't respond. It's too far gone. Levani does its best to shield the audience as they try to escape, with Roxy helping them towards the exits. Ash and Infernape stand at the ready as they call to Electivire. These two are of the same mind, and because of it, Infernape starts to grow brightly with Blaze, even though it hasn't taken any damage. Electivire can see this, and wants a fight as the only thing it can recognize right now is its rivalry with Inferni. Back outside with N as the lightning is striking, his bag again begins to glow like before. This causes the storm to calm slightly and the lightning to stop. N thinks to himself, what is it friend? Are you reaching out again? Then the bag glows with an intensity and suddenly the storm vanishes. N then rushes inside the gym and there stands Inferni glowing bright red with its blaze activated. But Electabire then snaps back to normal, again, not remembering anything, looking confused, and is shocked. He thinks to himself, these two boys, can it really be them? Later, after the gym is cleared and everything has calmed down, Roxy approaches Ash and Iris and thanks them for standing and protecting the crowd. She then approaches Paul and presents him with the toxic badge. Paul then tries to refuse the badge, but Roxy insists. The whole battle, Paul and his Pokemon fought perfectly. She says, even if Electivire hadn't lost control, you still would have won. Paul reluctantly takes the badge and tells Roxy to earn the badge he will get through to Electivire. Then the group takes their leave. Later at the Pokemon Center, the group is talking and Ash makes an announcement. He has decided not to challenge Roxy for a badge. Stunned, Paul and Iris ask why. Ash says, after recent events and everything that's been going on lately, and with all the stuff we've been through, I think we need to move on from this area. The whole problem with Electivire started when we came to this part of Unova, so it makes sense that we move on. Paul says, are you sure? Ash says yes. It's for the best of the group. So, the next morning, the group set out on a boat bound for Castelia City. The trip will take about a day. While trying to kill time, and ask the group if they want to hear a story of the heroes of Unova. Now, we switch over to Team Rocket. There in the desert north of Castelia City, they were able to find the source of power from the main meteorite that fell to Earth in its distant past. But there is a problem. It appears that an ancient civilization in the past discovered it as well and built an entire city around it. As Jesse, James, and Meowth are heading up the excavation of the ancient site, the leader of Team Rocket, Giovanni, arrives on the scene. The trio informs them of their progress, and they have almost opened the chamber that contains the meteorite. Meowth then asks, what is so special? Why are we digging? for this huge rock. Giovanni scowls at Meowth. You fool. It's not a rock. It's a source of power. But it's not just the meteorite. I'm after. Confused, Jesse then says, well, what else is there? Giovanni explains that in the past, the sun was blocked out from the sight of the world. This affected everywhere on the planet, except for one place. It is said that an ancient kingdom had harnessed the power of the sun and used it to survive until the real one was able to return. Then, when the kingdom didn't need it anymore, they locked this power away as the guardian of their treasures. James then chimes in, Ooh, treasures. So we're digging for valuables? Giovanni says, No, you dolt. Don't you see? The false sun they had locked away as a guardian? It was a Pokemon, and I think that that meteorite was a way to control this Pokemon. So now, I aim to make its power my own. Then, they get word over the radio that they have broken the seal on the chamber. Giovanni smiles. At last, he says, as he and the others head down to the chamber. Once they arrive at the entrance, and once they open the huge stone slab of a door, they are met with the blinding light that engulfs them. After donning protective eyewear, making them able to see what is inside, it astounds them. A whole ecosystem with lush green forests, and at the center, 
is the meteorite. Once they get close to the meteorite, above it flies a Pokemon that glows like the sun. Giovanni smiles. At last, my destiny awaits. As he flies to the top on his hovercraft, the Pokemon looks at Giovanni and lets out a loud cry, trying to intimidate this human. But Giovanni will not be intimidated. He shoots the Pokemon with a device that allows him to control the Pokemon with his hovercraft. Once the Pokemon becomes docile, Giovanni calls to it. Volcarona, you are now my property. You shall do my bidding. Volcarona lets out a loud cry in response to Giovanni's orders. As all this is happening, someone who doesn't quite belong to Team Rocket is hiding in the shadows, watching, relaying everything back to someone, a scientist in a white lab coat with glasses. It seems it's time we make our move then, he says as they mobilize their forces. He orders their mole to proceed with the backup plan once he is in the clear. With that, the communication ends. Giovanni looks to Jesse, James, and Meowth. Now we attack, he says. Meowth nervously asks where. Giovanni says, why not start with Castelia City? Back with our heroes, they finally arrive in Castelia City. Once they get off the boat, they are met by a familiar Pokemon, a Sandile, the same one that they battled back at the geysers. It wants to battle Pikachu. Ash is open to this battle as he and Pikachu want to stretch their legs after being on the boat overnight. The battle starts and it quickly becomes apparent that that Sandile has been training for this battle as it is far stronger than it was the last time that they encountered it. So much so that it gets the advantage over Pikachu and when it hits it with a crunch the electric mouse goes down but this doesn't stop the ground type as it starts to glow and evolves into Krokoro. This makes the battle even less in Pikachu's favor bringing on more harm to it. When Ash realizes that Krokoro won't stop he sends in Duot to battle it and defend Pikachu. Duot is quick to put Krokoro down with a double razor shell, but it just doesn't want to stop. Krokoro keeps attacking to the point that Ash has no choice. He has to catch it. Ash orders Duot to use an Aqua Jet that connects and before Krokoro can recover, he throws a Pokeball and after three shakes, he grabs his new Pokemon. Pikachu has sustained severe damage and they have to get it to a Pokemon Center. Once they get to the Pokemon Center, they get Pikachu checked in and it's bad. Pikachu will need a few days to recover. As the group gets settled in to the Pokemon Center, Ash wonders why Krokoro attacked them like that, specifically Pikachu, and says, well maybe I can talk to it. I may be able to deduce what the problem is with Pikachu. Just as Ash pulls out the ball, they hear an explosion from outside, and the power to the center goes out. The generators kick in, but Ash knows that they won't last long, so everyone heads outside to investigate. Once outside, they are met with people running in fear, as the city is in ruins, and the source of it is a man on a hovercraft and his Pokemon. Ash knows who this is. Giovanni. He runs to him and orders him to stop. Giovanni just laughs and asks, and who are you to tell me what to do? Ash announces himself as Ash Ketchum from Palatown. Giovanni then looks to Jesse, James, and Meowth. Is this the same trainer you always fail against? They reply yes. Giovanni says good. Let's see if you're as strong as I've been told. And he orders Volcarona to attack. Ash knows this thing is strong. He can feel it. Ash wastes no time and sends in Infernape, who counters with a flare blitz, pushing back Volcarona. But that's not all. Ash is joined by Paul, who sends in Electivire. Paul is a little hesitant, but he knows Electivire is his best chance to help stop this thing. Both Infernape and Electivire succeed in pushing back Volcarona for a bit, but its power is just too much. It's like it's supercharged by an outside force. Even Infernape's blaze only provides a little bit of relief in the struggle. Eventually, the duo is overwhelmed by the power of Volcarona, and Infernape, Electivire, and Paul are all knocked down due to its power. Giovanni just laughs. You're so pathetic. No amount of resistance you put up can stop me. Ash and Paul stand up. They are both worn out. Paul doesn't know what to do. This is more than he's ever experienced. Ash says, it's simple. We don't give up. Infernape then stands up and resonates with Ash. It won't give up, and neither will Ash. Paul and Electivire just look on in all. And watching this, can't believe it. He is shocked. The truths of this trainer and his Pokemon are perfectly in sync. Just then, N's bag begins to glow brightly. He reaches into it and pulls out a brightly glowing white stone. N asks, is this what you were waiting for, my friend? N then calls to Ash. Ash, here, catch! And he throws the stone. Ash catches it and asks what it is. N says, just trust me, it's reacting to you and Infernape. Then, the stone levitates from Ash's hands and heads toward Infernape. Then, in a quick flash, light envelops the area. Once the light fades, Ash asks Giovanni if he's ready for round two, as he and Infernape stand in opposition of him once more.
We pick back up with Ash and Giovanni. Paul and Electivire look on and all as Ash tells Giovanni that his reign of terror ends here. Giovanni laughs. You think that your flaming monkey can stop me? I'd like to see you try. Ash says, okay, and he orders a flare blitz. Infernape's flames rage as it rushes in with speed never before seen from it. And this attack that is used, it was not a flare blitz. Ash puzzled, asked what that was, as Infernape forces Volcarona into a building, quickly changing Giovanni's demeanor. N then chimes in, that was not a flare blitz, Ash, but the signature move of the legendary Pokemon Reshiram, Fusion Flare, a move with the ability to scorch the world. Ash looks on in amazement. Paul then yells to Ash to snap him out of it. Ash, you have the power to stop Giovanni. Use it. Ash then snaps back and orders another attack from Infernape. Close combat. And this too is far stronger. Giovanni can't handle the fact that this boy is challenging him. So he orders Volcarona to attack, but it's useless, as it can't keep up with Infernape and its new power. The battle rages, and Giovanni is becoming furious with Ash and Infernape. But, as it looks like Ash and Infernape are about to have the upper hand and end Giovanni's plans, Infernape's flames subside, and it begins to surge with electricity and writhes in pain. Ash can feel it too. This immobilizes the duel, putting things back in Giovanni's favor. He is pleased with this, and tells Ash how dare he challenge him, and he will pay for his indiscretions. Then, Infernape begins to glow again, blinding everyone. When the light subsides, Infernape lays unconscious, and beside him, the white stone. Giovanni orders another attack from Volcarona, and Paul orders Electivire to deflect it. Just as this happens, the attack from Volcarona is shot out of the sky by what looks like a giant ice ball. Then, above the city, what looks like a ship that is meant to sail over the sea appears with giant cannons. Over a loudspeaker, Giovanni is ordered to stand down, and from over the ship to send many different individuals dressed for black ops work. Giovanni demands to know who would dare interfere with his affairs. Then, over the loudspeaker, he hears, I am Colrus, the leader of Team Plasma, and you are trespassing in our region. Unova is under our protection. Leave now, or you will be dealt with. Giovanni just laughs. So, another insect is after my throne. Well, just like this little boy, you will be dealt with as well. And he orders Volcarona to attack the ship. While this is going on, the member of Team Plasma are helping to clear the city of bystanders. Anne approaches Ash and Paul, and tells them they need to leave now. Anne grabs the white stone and puts it back in his bag, but there is a problem. Ash can't move, and Infernape is in bad shape. All the while above the battle between Volcarona and the ship rages on. As this is happening, above the city and the battle, dark black clouds are starting to swirl in the sky. The ice balls being fired by the ship are being melted by Volcarona, as its heat is starting to flare up and envelop the ship. While this is happening, Ann and Paul are helping Ash up, and they recall Inferni when they hear from the shadows. Hello, son. Ann and Paul turn, and there stands a man dressed in a robe, and replies, Why are you here? The man responds, Now, is that any way to greet your father? Ash says, Father? And says, You're no father of mine. Paul asks, who is this man? N replies, his name is Getsis, and he is the founder of Team Plasma. Ash says, you mean the ones that are helping clear the city? N replies, yes. Getsis then tells N the reason that he is here is because of Giovanni and his actions. He wishes to stop him and offer N one final chance to reconsider his choice to join Team Plasma in their plans of liberation. N replies, as I've told you before, I want nothing to do with you or your organization. My answer will not change. Getsis says, what a shame. I was hoping to recognize reconcile with my son, but sadly, it seems that time has not come. Meanwhile, the battle above the city is coming to a climax, as Colorus activates a device that emits waves to interfere with Giovanni's control of Volcarona. Giovanni starts to lose control, so he amps up the pressure on his device, and as a result, Volcarona begins to arrive in pain, and frantically starts attacking at random. One blast comes firing towards our heroes. Paul orders Electivire to block it with a thunder punch. As the moves collide, the storm above rages, striking down with lightning throughout Castellia city. One bolt strikes the Team Plasma ship, and it starts to lose power forcing them to start a retreat, but not before Colrus gives the order to blow it. Then, north of the city, a huge explosion can be heard. This causes Volcarona to fall from the air to the ground. A second bolt hits Electivire, which supercharges it, giving it the power to push Volcarona's attack back. But this then causes Electivire to again flare up in a blinding rage, with it striking everyone in sight with thunder attacks. While everyone's attention is diverted, Getsis takes his chance to make his escape. Giovanni unable to control Volcarona, and at a loss for words, tells everyone that without Volcarona, his plans have failed. So, he orders Jesse, James, and Meowth to retreat back to the ruins, leaving Volcarona behind. This leaves Paul 
Ash and Inn to deal with Electrovire, who is raging about. Iris arrives and sees what's going on. Once she realizes Infernape is out of the picture, she calls on Excadrill to help, hoping that it will still at least want to battle, even though it's not listening to her at the current time. They are in luck, as once it sees Electivire, it wants to battle it. But this enthusiasm is short-lived, as one brick break from Electivire knocks out Excadrill. The situation is looking dire. They are all out of options. Paul then steps forward. This is my fault, he says. Ash says, what do you mean, Paul? Paul says, if I was a trainer worthy of Electivire, then I would be able to get through to it. So, that's what I'm going to do. It is at this point that N can sense a shift in Paul. Ash says, this is it. And asks what? Ash says, the part of Paul that's been missing. His resolve. We have to leave this to him. Paul sends out all of his Pokemon, trying to calm down Electivire. But in the end, it's not enough. And one by one they fall, until the only one that stands is Pignite. Pignite and Paul's battle is intense, and the intenser the battle gets, the more the furious storm surges. But Paul and Pignite's resolve is one, and all of the intense emotion between the two causes the storm to strike Electivire again, raising its power to new heights. Pignite quickly gets overwhelmed and pushed back. When Paul thinks that they've reached their limit, Pignite struggles to its feet, demonstrating that it won't let this be its limit, and Paul realizes that he can't let it be his either. Paul then has a thought. Is this how Ash feels? The drive to shatter his limits? This provokes something deep within Pignite. Pignite, and it starts to glow. Now Paul has a brand new Embor, and it has a new move. Electivire begins to charge a final thunder attack as Paul calls for Embor to use Heat Crash. The Fire Pig rushes in, throwing its full weight into the attack, colliding with Electivire with an explosion. When the dust settles, both Pokemon stand looking at each other. Then the storm surges one more time, then dissipates as both Pokemon fall unconscious. And just looks on, thinking to himself, why do you keep doing this? Paul recalls both of his Pokemon, and everyone rushes back to the Pokemon Center to check on Pikachu and to get the rest of the Pokemon looked at. Luckily, power has been restored, and after some brief cleanup, Nurse Joy is able to look at all of the Pokemon on their teams. She tells them that even though the damage is extensive, it's nothing too serious. In a week or so, all of the Pokemon should be back to 100%. This is a huge weight off of everyone's shoulders. But the mood is short-lived, as Paul confronts N. I knew there was a reason I didn't trust you. I knew that you were hiding something. Paul then sends out S. Cavalier and Torterra. You withheld vital information that got everyone hurt, and it could have been a lot worse. So you had better start talking, or you won't get another chance, as Paul orders Torterra and S. Cavalier to ready attacks. Ash and Iris try to stop Paul, but N says, hold on, Paul is right. I owe you all an explanation, so will you give me the chance to tell you everything? Paul says, you have one chance, so you better make it quick. N asks, do you remember the story I told you of the two heroes of Unova? Now we pick back up with Team Rocket as they are back to the desert ruins. Meowth asked Giovanni why he just left Brokoron behind. Giovanni said, that's simple. It can no longer battle. So just like any other tool, once it becomes useless, it will be discarded. Meowth gets quiet as they approach what used to be the sealed chamber. Now the interior lies in ruins. The explosion that they had heard was here. And the meteorite now lays in pieces. It still glows, but is not as bright as before. Giovanni blames just Jesse, James, and Meowth for this turn of events. He deduces that Team Plasma must have been here, and he tells them if they would have screened their workers better, then they would have been able to catch the spy. Jesse, James, and Meowth panic in fear that they too will be discarded, but Giovanni then exclaims, Luckily for you three, I still have use for you. They look at him in relief. Giovanni then says, It's time to prepare for Operation Tempest. Over on the plasma ship, they have settled out in the ocean for repairs. When Getsus approaches Colorus, it seems we failed, Colorus says. On the contrary, Getsus replies. It was anything but failure. Colorus says, how? Getsus says, in the eyes of the people, Team Rocket are the villains, and we are the heroes, which means we can proceed with our plans with no interruption. And I also got to see my son. Colorus says, and how did that go? Getsus replies, very well. I am now sure that he has one of the stones. Colorus then replies, well then, I have more good news. I was studying the storm during the whole event, and I think that I found the second one, but I can't be sure without more data. Getsus says that today was a good day. As he and Colorus look over a mysterious Pokemon, Getsus thinks to himself, you will soon be complete, and Unova will be mine. Back with our heroes, and explains the story that he told of the two heroes was much more than just a legend. It's a true story. Paul asks, please, there's no way it could be true, and then reaches into his bag and pulls out the white stone. I know it's true, because this is Resh 
Graham. The Dragon of Truth, he exclaims. Ash says, how does he know that? And then says, that man that we met, Getsis, dedicated his whole life to studying the old legends of Unova, and I was by his side the whole time. He claimed that he wanted to help the world, but over time, I came to realize the truth. He only seeks power. Iris then says that it seemed like his organization, Team Plasma, only wanted to help today, and says, don't trust it. That's what Getsis wants you to think, but don't believe it. Paul then urges N to finish his story, and then tells them that after many years of failure, his father finally done it. He found the location of one of the legendary dragons. This stone you see before you. By then I knew what his true plans were, so I took the stone and fled in hopes to reunite it with its rightful place. Paul then says, okay, but that doesn't explain what it has to do with us. And says, whenever the dragons awaken, it's because Unova is in great peril. And to respond to it, they seek a partner to bond with. Someone that reflects its virtue. Ash, I believe Reshiram has chosen you as its emissary of truth. Ash then asks, what about Infernape? Why did it take on the form like that today? And replies, I don't know. Throughout my studies of Unova's ancient past, I have never read anything like that ever happening before. N says that now his father knows he has a stone, and he will be looking for him. N then turns to Ash and says, here, take it. N gives the stone to Ash. Ash says, are you sure? N says, yes. It's safer with you. No, it belongs with you. Reshiram has chosen you. For what? I don't know. But you now must complete the task and return it to the ruins of white. Paul says, and where is that? Iris then chimes in. It's in the northwestern part of Unova, close to the Dragon Spiral Tower. And says, so you know the old stories? Iris says, I know more than that. I come from the village of the dragons. Everything you told us is an old bedtime story for us. And then says, well, it seems that you guys should head there, as you may be able to fill in the blanks with my information. Ash and Paul tell Iris that that will be their next stop. Iris then puts the brakes on it, saying that the village is in the northernmost part of Unova, and there is no direct route there. It'll take some time. Ash says, that's fine, but they need to get there to get answers. Iris is secretly hesitant about this, but she doesn't want to let on that she is. While the story is being told, Officer Jenny brings in Volcarona to be looked at. It is in bad shape after the battle. Nurse Joy says she can't figure it out, but Volcarona doesn't seem to be responding to any type of treatment. Then, after N spends some time with it later on in the day, he learns that it needs to return to the desert resort, or it won't survive. Since Ash, Paul, and Iris have to wait for their Pokemon to recover, they cannot go on with it. So under the cover of night, Ash helps N sneak Volcarona out of the Pokemon Center so that N can get it home. N tells the group that they will meet again, but not to wait for him, as he has another mission to attend to. But before N leaves, he looks at Paul and says, I understand that you don't trust me, but know that my words are sincere. You're almost there. Whatever doubt and barriers you created for yourself, you've almost pushed through them all. And when you do, you will unlock a new level of power between you and your Pokemon that you have never known before. And with that, N takes his leave. After the week has passed, and Paul has spent some time thinking about what N said, the group decides to move on from Castalia City, heading to Nimbasa City. Ash realizes that N never talked with Krokorok, so he decides to try and figure out himself which proves to be quite difficult, as Krokrok wants nothing to do with Ash. It doesn't even seem to recognize him as a trainer. During the trip, Iris ends up catching an Amolga, and Paul also ends up catching a new Pokemon member as well, a Palpatote. He decides to send Torterra back to Reggie for now. And then, after stopping another scheme of Team Rocket, Ash manages to catch himself a Roggenrola. Ash makes the choice to send Unpheasant to Professor Juniper. Also during this time, Ash and Paul have been doing some intense training. Ash wants to try and trigger this transformation with Infernape again, but to no avail. The two are dead set on unlocking this power again, as they might need it in the future. Paul's new inbor has proved to be an invaluable training partner for Infernape, and it keeps pushing him farther and farther each day that they train. Inbor is impressed with Infernape's control over its blaze ability, and the fact that the two are both fighting fire types strengthens their ability to train and allows them to train on levels that they both couldn't before, proving to have massive gains for the two. But even though Paul and Inbor are on the same page, Paul is still slightly struggling with Electivire. It does listen, and the two are still on the same page, but something between the two doesn't feel quite right. But even Paul can sense that they're at a tipping point. One more final push may be what they need to get back in sync. Upon the group's travels to the next city where they have their next gym badge, they come across a small town, Nimbasa Town, hosting a tournament at the Battle Club. Once they learn of this, Paul, Ash, and Iris all decide to enter it, just to battle and have a little bit of fun after all the events that have been going on. There is, however, an old face that has shown up here, Trip. He's really surprised to see Ash and Paul, but after their last battle, Trip has developed a confidence streak and looks down on both Paul and Ash. Trip's overconfidence does bug Paul a bit, but he keeps his frustrations to himself for the time being. Iris is also introduced to a brand new rival for herself, 
Georgia, the Dragon Buster. She criticizes Iris for actually being weak and being the only dragon type that a Dragon Master has. This angers Iris, and she wants a chance to battle Georgia and prove her wrong. So they all decide to enter the Battle Club Tournament, and the rounds are prepared. And it turns out that Trip and Paul are paired in the first round. Trip, thinking that Paul would be as easy as a win as he was last time, sends in his girder. Paul is determined to get back to his level of confidence that he has lost. So, he matches Trip's girder with Enbor. The battle between the two is pretty heavy, as Trip's girder has been trained well. But with Paul's training with Enbor, and the training that it's done with Infernape since it evolved, they focus more on its endurance, as its size leans more towards a defensive strategy. It becomes apparent that Paul has the more well-rounded Pokemon, as Girder is tiring quicker than Enbor. Paul comments that all the emphasis that he put on Girder's power makes his weakness that much more obvious. Trip says, what? Paul tells him, last time, it seemed you managed to close the gap between us, and you managed to beat me, but that may have been a fluke. Paul tells Trip, his performance now is a downgrade, and if he wishes wishes to win, then he's going to have to broaden his views and not focus just on one aspect of his Pokemon. Trip argues that he does do that. Paul counters this claim when he tells Trip that he focuses only on power with Girder and its endurance is lacking. Trip then freezes as Paul says, watch, and he orders a heat crash from Embor. With the power of the move from Embor's size and its increased speed, these two attributes allow Paul to close out the battle here, getting him to round two with Ash and Iris. The next day, the second round of the Battle Club tournament starts and Ash goes first, and he ends up facing Georgia. And and he loses to her Ponyard after choosing Krokrok for the battle and it just wouldn't listen to him. Next, Iris faces a trainer by the name of Stefan, and after a close battle with her Omoga, Iris is barely able to beat his sock. Paul ends up beating Georgia in the semifinals with his newly caught Palpatote, and it ends up being Paul and Iris in the finals. The two trainers didn't think that they would end up battling each other in the finals, but here they are. Iris tells Paul that she doesn't want him to hold anything back. She says she knows that he's been struggling, but I want your best. I want to battle you the way that Ash battles you. Paul says, all right, if you want my best, you then you got it, and he sends in Electivire. Iris figured as much, and she sends in her Excadrill, because it's been itching for a rematch against Electivire. Iris and Electadrill seem to be on the same page for once. Over the last few weeks, with her training with Ash and Paul, her and Electivire have managed to get over their differences, and have started battling as one. Paul specifically chooses Electivire here, because he knows if these two can get past their differences, then Electivire and he can as well. Iris and Paul's battle is very fast-paced, and full of power. Although Excadrill has the type advantage, Paul and Electivire have conditioned themselves for battles with ground types. So this battle with Iris is exactly what she wanted. Paul is at his best. Paul and Electivire seem like they are in sync more now than Iris has ever seen before. As the battle rages on, Ash feels something, a heartbeat. Then he looks in his bag, and the stone that End gave him is glowing. And as the battle nears its climax, above, another storm is starting to circulate. Ash sees this, and he realizes what's going on. The stone is reacting to the storm and the battle. As Ash watches on, the battle comes to an end, with Iris barely squeezing out a win over Paul winning herself the tournament. And just like that, the stone stops glowing, and the storm vanishes as quickly as it came. With the battle club behind them, the trio make their way to Nimbasa City and the site of their next gym badge. Ash and Paul are arguing who will get to battle first. In the end, when they get to the gym, Paul enters first, and Elisa, the gym leader, who is holding a fashion show at the time, acknowledges Paul as her next challenger, forcing Ash to sit back and watch with Iris in annoyance. Elisa tells Paul that this will be a three-on-three -three battle, so he better be ready. Paul agrees, and the battle starts. Elisa leads with her Amoga, and Paul, after battling Iris's Amoga, chooses to go with his Cofragrius. The battle starts and Paul is in full control. He knows Amoga has things like Volt Switch to escape battles, so he counters it with Protect. And after establishing a Will-O-Wisp early on, Paul's stall game is successful, and he takes an early win. This was important because it allows Paul to end Elisa's pivoting strategy. Elisa wastes no time in sending in her next Pokemon though, Electric. This thing, in its aggressive nature, manages to turn the tide of battle and takes Cofragrius down on the crackback. When the Thunder Wave connects, allowing Electric to get in with some crunches on Cofagrius when it was suffering from paralysis. Paul thinks to himself, I have the counter, so he sends in Palpatode, but he quickly learns that he was mistaken when he learns that Electric's ability is Levitate, nullifying ground types attacks. But Paul is able to establish himself a little bit here after a sludge wave hits, causing a poison. In the end, both Palpatode and Electric fall from fatigue. Elisa then sends in her final Pokemon, Zebstrika. Paul can see that this thing is powerful, so he opts to send in his final Pokemon, Embor. The Fire Pig proves that it is one of Paul's best Pokemon, as it takes down Zebstrika. With minimal effort after tanking a thunderbolt and slamming it with the heat crash, earning Paul the bolt badge. Elisa thanks Paul for a well-fought battle, and as she gives him the badge, 
Ash runs over, declaring that he will be the first challenge for Elisa tomorrow, as he wants to earn a badge too. That night is spent with Ash trying to figure out a strategy for the battle. Paul tries to offer some insight. Ash, a little overconfident, responds, I've already got the perfect strategy for tomorrow. So Paul just shrugs it off, and they go to sleep. The next morning, they head back to the gym, and Ash makes his challenge. Elisa likes his enthusiasm, so they get right down to business. Elisa sends in her Zeb Striker. Ash, a little overconfident, chooses to go with Kokorok. Paul wonders if Ash has finally lost it. Krokrok still won't listen to him, and he's relying on it, but what can he do? It's Ash's choice, not his. The battle starts, and surprisingly, Krokrok is doing very well, but it becomes apparent quickly to Elisa that Ash and it are not on the same page. And this is where Zip Striker gets to show what it's really made of, and with a full power stomp, puts down Krokrok, but not before taking damage in the process from a stone edge. Ash recalls it. He was hoping that he could use it to clean sweep the gym, so the two can get over their differences. But that's that's gonna have to wait. So Ash goes with his next choice, Excelgore. Ash then orders a quick attack, but Elisa counters with a move Ash hadn't seen yet, Flame Charge, and this connects, causing damage to Excelgore. Ash now has to deal with Zeb Striker's increased speed as well, but he is able to stay slightly ahead by having Excelgore use double team. In the end, a sludge bomb from Excelgore manages to put Zeb Striker down. Elisa then sends in her Amoga next, and Ash decides to recall Excelgore for Snivy. This battle is a little bit more interactive as Snivy is able to use Tract to his advantage, and and after a vine whip and a leaf blade, Emoga goes down with little damage to Snivy. Elisa chooses to go with her last Pokemon, Galvantula. Ash chooses to leave Snivy in, but this doesn't work out in his favor, as Galvantula is a female and Snivy's attract won't work. Eventually, it loses to a struggle bug, leaving Ash with only Excelgore. Ash sends back in Excelgore. It is visibly tired from the battle with Zeb Striker. The battle starts and Galvantula manages to hit Excelgore with a spider web, reducing its speed. Ash still tries to outspeed Galvantula, but Excelgore is getting very very tired. Ash then orders a quick attack and a poison jab from Excelgore. The speed that the quick attack puts into the poison jab is enough to knock out Galvantula with a critical hit, but out of exhaustion, Excelgore falls as well. Ash is disappointed. He really wanted to get a win here and get his fourth badge, but Elisa comes over and presents him with a bolt badge, telling him that Galvantula technically fell first in battle, so technically he won. Ash, a little hesitant, says, are you sure? And Elisa says, yes, take the badge. You and your Pokemon have earned it. So Ash takes the badge and celebrates his victory, but not before Paul reminding him that that victory was kind of hollow, so don't slack on your training. Ash doesn't want to hear it, but he knows Paul's right, so they head back to the Pokemon Center. Later that night, the trio is trying to make a decision. If they head west in Unova, it'll take longer to get to the Village of the Dragons, but all the gyms are in that part of the region. But if they head east, they can cut their time by a third, as the Village of the Dragons is closer to the eastern part of Unova. After some debate, they ultimately decide to head up the western part of Unova, as it'll allow them to accomplish more in the long run. So, the next morning, they head to Driftville and the site of the next gym. It takes a few weeks, and during that time, Ash and Paul try to bring out the transformation of Infernate with no success. The White Stone won't react. But Ash chooses not to focus on that. He's going to take the approach of when he first got Chimchar, and instead of trying to focus on the main power, just trying to focus on increasing the power of the actual Pokemon, much like he did when he helped Infernape Master Blaze. So in doing so, he chooses to focus on his other Pokemon, mainly Kokorok, Durot, and Roggenrola. Ash and Kokorok are still at odds. The two don't get along whatsoever. It acts wild whenever it's out of its Pokeball. One thing that really sets it off is how Buddy Buddy Pikachu is with Ash and all the other Pokemon and it tends to act a little bit more wild when he sees this. Rock and Roll is just happy to be part of the team and enjoys training. It really likes battling with Paul's Crustle as it's a part rock type Pokemon as well and they can test each other's endurance and defense. Then there's Duwat. It's been getting more and more frustrated as of late. With Embor evolving and all the other Pokemon becoming stronger, it begins to feel like it's being left behind and as a result, during training, it starts to make mistakes, causing it to injure itself in the process when it's unable to dodge an arm thrust for an Embor. This causes Duwat to run off in frustration, forcing the group to look for it and postponing their arrival in Driftville City by a few days. While all this is going on, Giovanni, Jesse, James, and Meowth have made base on an island off the coast of Driftville City, and they are in preparations for the first stage of Operation Tempest, and they have their sights set on three ancient shrines, said to have sealed the power of the weather inside of them. The trio aim to make up for the mistake they were blamed for, and immediately attack the shrines. After Ash finds Duat and he vows to help it to get stronger by any means necessary, the trio are finally able to move on to Driftville City, and the chance at the next gym badge. But when Ash and Paul make the challenge to the leader, Clay, 
they are rejected until someone can fix the supply issue that has occurred with the revival herbs on Milos Island. Once Paul, Ash, and Iris learn that this will be the only way to challenge the gym, they set out on a boat determined to find out what the issue is on Milos Island. But off in the distance, a wicked storm is brewing, and Paul again hears another voice calling out to him in his head. Our trio finally arrives on Milos Island. Paul comments that he thinks it's ridiculous they have to do this in order to get a gym battle. Ash does agree, but they are already here, so they should just find out what stopped the supply of revival herbs so they can get back to the mainland. Iris comments on how the weather here is horrible. She wonders if this is how it is all year long. Meanwhile, a voice that Paul has been ignoring in the back of his head is getting louder. It's getting to the point that he can no longer ignore it, while Ash is having the same feeling hearing the heartbeat of Reshiram. So, the group decides to split up to find the issue on the island, but before they can head out, they meet up with a young man who whose name is Lewis. He is a harvester of the revival herbs on the island, so our heroes decide he would be the best resource to get info from, so they join him in a guided tour. Lewis tells the group about the Battle of Legends, when the forces of nature, Thunderous and Tornadus, clashed on the island, bringing it to ruins. It went on for many years, until Landorus, at the behest of the people, pleaded with the two Jin to stop their path of destruction. Unfortunately, the plea fell on deaf ears, as Landorus was attacked as well. The humans saw no end in sight. If they didn't act, then their entire way of life would be lost. But how do you contain the literal embodiment of nature. After many attempts and failures, the humans turned to the Maiden of the Shrines on Milos Island. The inhabitants of the island pleaded with the Maiden of the Shrines. Eventually, she agreed to help, but warned, if she went through with it, then this would only be a temporary solution. If successful, she could not guarantee how long her solution would last. The inhabitants didn't care. They were desperate, anything to save the lives of their people. With that, the Maiden proceeded with the sealing ritual, binding the rage of nature itself into three shrines on the island. Once the ritual had been completed, the Maiden warned, there must always be someone here to guard the shrines. If ever come the day that there is no longer a Shrine Maiden on Milos Island, the wrath of nature incarnate would be free and no one would be safe. With that warning, life on the island settled down. The clash of nature and the process to stop it faded into legend until the present day. Lewis ends the story with a statement. The island's last shrine maiden passed away recently and there is no successor to her. Paul says, so let me get this straight. You expect me to believe the whole production of the revival herb has been interrupted by a legend? Lewis tells him that he knows it sounds crazy, but after the shrine maiden passed, the herbs unexpectedly started to dry up. I think there has to be some sort of connection. Ash then asks somewhat of an obvious question. Question. Hey, Lewis, has anybody gone to check the shrines? Lewis responds with a no. He hadn't even thought about it. Ash then makes the suggestion to go and check it out. With that, the group sets out to the closest one, the Landers Shrine. Once they arrive, they find nothing wrong. The shrine is in pristine condition. It has been very well maintained over the years. Lewis tells him that the Shrine Maiden always made sure to perform upkeep on the shrines, especially the Landers one. Lewis then says that the Shrine Maiden once told him that if Landers was ever freed, it would be the most vengeful of the three Jin, as it was only sealed out of necessity. It actually fought on the side of man, but we then betrayed it for our own selfish goals. With that, the group heads to the Tornado Shrine. What they find is a far different sight than at the Landorus Shrine. This one is in pieces. Someone smashed it. Lewis drops to his knees. He is in tears. Iris asks him what's wrong. Lewis says that the previous Shrine Maiden left him in charge of the shrines and their well-being. Now, something like this has happened. Paul tells him that it shouldn't be that big of a deal. It's not like he was charged with protecting it. Lewis, out of frustration, then yells at Paul. You don't understand. The previous Maiden was my grandmother. She was the one who charged me with this, and I have let her down. Paul now stares in stunned silence. Ash asks, well, why didn't Lewis just take over the duty of the Shrine Maiden. Lewis said he tried, but unfortunately, he was not born with the gift his grandmother had, to feel the aura of the Pokemon. You need that ability in order to make sure the forces of nature are sealed. The area immediately swirls as the wind becomes violent. In the sky above the group appears a Pokemon. Lewis, with fear in his voice, says, Tornadus. Ash says, well, I guess it wasn't a legend. The group has no time as Tornadus attacks. Out of fear of self-preservation, the group flees, with Tornadus giving chase. As our heroes run across the island, Lewis says that they are near the Thunderous Shrine. They need to get to it. Paul and Ash send out Electivire and Pikachu to attempt to push back Tornadus. As Electivire emerges, the storm above the island surges once again, and Paul hears it. Pikachu and Electivire are able to push back Tornadus, even though Electivire appears to be struggling to do so. The group then gets to the Thunder Shrine, and they are met with a set of familiar faces. Team Rocket. With barely enough time to yell no, Lewis watches as Team Rocket smashes the shrine. Above the island, in the sky appears a Pokemon. Lewis exclaims, Thunderous. It roars with a loud cry, catching the attention of the other Jin, Tornadus. This is a moment of relief, as Pikachu and Electivire were starting to fail in holding it back. 
but this moment of reprieve is short-lived as the jinn begin to battle raging in the sky above the island. Lewis states, they are doomed. They have no hope to stop two legendary Pokemon. Meanwhile, Team Rocket have made their way to the last shrine on the island. Per the instruction of the boss, they were told to break all of the shrines on the island and document their power while he attended to other matters. Trying to mount a defense against the Jin Pokemon, Ash sends out Ragnarola, thinking the rock type would be his best advantage against them. Paul chooses to use Palpatode for extra support. Meanwhile, as Tornadus and Thunderous clash, the storm rages harder. Electivire finally succumbs to the stimulation of the storm, losing control of itself once again. Paul, in an attempt to control the situation, tries to recall Electivire, but the amount of energy surging through it overrides the command to return. This sends Electivire into a frenzy, attacking everything that moves. Paul tells Ash to go and handle the raging Pokemon and stop Team Rocket. He will deal with Electrovire. Ash nods and heads out. Paul sends out Embor. He tells it and Palpatode to stand by for battle. Over with Iris and Lewis, Ash finally arrives to the scene of them fighting with Team Rocket. But ultimately, it's in vain. James smashes the final shrine, and then from it emerges the final Jin, Landorus. It glares intensely at everyone. Iris asks Lewis what they can do. Lewis, hopeful, tells her that in the past, Landorus helped the people of Milo Silent. Maybe if we plead with it, then it will help us again. Iris and Ash are game, but their pleas fall on deaf ears. Landorus, feeling betrayed by the humans, attacks relentlessly. Rock and Roland jumps in to protect Ash. The rock type is unable to push back the Jin of Lands. It catches a mud shot that hits it with enough force to leave a crater in the ground beneath it. Roggenrola isn't moving, and Ash goes to see if it's okay, but Landris continues to attack, preventing Ash from checking his Pokemon. Ash then sends an Infernape. He tells it and Pikachu to distract Landris so he can get to Roggenrola. The two manage to do so, and Ash gets to Roggenrola. It's hurt. Bad. The damage it took was severe. Without immediate medical attention, it may not make. Lewis comes to Ash's side, and he hands him the last revival herb he has. He tells him to use it on Roggenrola. Ash does this, and the little mon stands up, fully energized. It's ready for round two. Roggenrola joins Ash and his other two Pokemon in battle. They combine, still are not enough, as now Tornadus and Thunderous have joined in the fray. Back with Paul, he is struggling with his battle. It seems Electivire has been supercharged to a level that he hasn't seen before. Even with Palpatode's type advantage, it still can't deal with Electivire's raw power. This is just a testament to how well Paul trained it. But now, he has to beat it. Enbor is no match for it. The Battle Pig, with Blaze activated, can barely stave off Electivire, let alone beat it. Then Paul hears it. Paul thinks, wait, are you trying to reach out to me? Paul then feels it. The same feeling he felt from the day he arrived in Unova. Paul then calls, Zekrom, in a response. <laughs> Paul then tells Embor and Palpatode to stand down. He then approaches Electivire, throwing caution to the wind. The storm surges in the sky as Paul gets closer. Electivire heeds his assault as Paul inches closer toward it. Paul tells Electivire to be calm. He believes in it. Things have been intense, and Paul knows that if any one of his Pokemon can overcome it, then it's Electivire. This rings with Electivire. Suddenly, it comes to its senses, recognizing Paul. Then, the storm above starts to spark with lightning. It's like a car engine sputtering. From the sky, it ascends a round, black orb, landing on the ground in front of Paul. Back with the rest of the group, Ash, Iris, and Lewis are struggling. They can't hold a candle to the power of the three legendary Jin. It's bad, as they are attacking each other as well as the group. The forces of nature don't care who is in their path. It will be decimated. It gets to the point that only Infernape and Pikachu are left standing. Ash thinks they need a power play. Then he hears it. Infernape looks back at Ash. This feeling is the same one they felt back in Castelia City. Ash opens his bag. The white stone is glowing. It levitates from the bag, heading toward Infernape, which is again enveloped in light. This spectacle grabs the attention of the battling legendaries. Now, their sole focus is on Ash and Infernape as it emerges from the light with a fusion flare, driving both Thunderous and Tornadus into the ground. Landorus just barely gets out of the way in time, but it now is only focusing on Infernape as it can feel the presence of Reshram, who it knows has more power than it. It. Infernape wastes no time going on the offensive at Ash's orders. Ash knows that this power is only temporary, so Infernape needs to end this battle now. With Pikachu and Roggenrola providing support, Infernape is able to take down Tornadus rather easily when the three combine their attacks, catching it off guard, knocking it out. But that leaves Thunderous and Landorus. The two have seen the teamwork of Ash and his Pokemon and are now on the defensive as not to meet the same fate. Thunderous and Landorus work on splitting up the trio to much success. With Landorus taking on Infernape in a one-on-one, -on -one, it can tell that Infernape is reaching its limit. The harder it's forced to battle, the faster the transformation burns through its power. As for Thunderous, it's proving to be too much for Pikachu and Roggenrola. The two are easily being overpowered by the legendary, and to further complicate things, Ash's attention is being pulled in two different directions. This causes him to make mistakes when giving commands. This results in Pikachu getting caught up in an attack from Thunderous. Roggenrola jumps in to try and help, but it's not enough to push back 
back the power the two are facing. Ash calling on Ragnarola to hold steady reaches the little ball of rock and it responds with an intense glow. It captures the attention of the battlefield with its evolution into Boldor. This brief distraction is what Ash needed as he orders Infernape to grab Landorus and to use a fusion flare on it with everything it has. When the dust settles, Landorus lays in defeat, but Infernape has lost the transformation as well as its ability to fight. As Thunderous begins to launch a thunder to establish itself as the last remaining Jin standing, it is interrupted by a thunder from another. Ash looks back and there stands Paul and Electivire. Thunderous does not fear this inferior electric Pokemon and goes on the offensive, but Paul and Electivire won't be bested by the Jin again. As the two battle, Ash can hear the heartbeat of Reshiram reaching out to him, pulsating. What Ash doesn't know is that Paul can feel the same thing. The battle is coming to a close with Electivire being able to outlast Thunderous in endurance after taking a focus blast and countering with its own thunder punch that puts down the last of the Jins. With all three legendary Pokemon laid out across the island, the storm has now dissipated and the sun shines down. Then, almost to demonstrate the the cycle of life, revival herbs begin to sprout all over the island, reviving the trio in the process. But when the Jin regain consciousness, it seems they have calmed, as if they've gained respect for Paul and Ash for their efforts against them. With that, they head off into the world, now free for the first time in many generations. The group doesn't know what just happened. Things were so dire, now everything is so calm. Lewis is really worried with the freedom of the weather trio. Now the world has to be ready. Who knows what kind of impact they will have. Meanwhile, Team Rocket has made their way off of the island to meet up with Giovanni. The footage they have provided him with these three new weapons has him ready to move on to the next stages of Operation Tempest. Back with the group, Ash, Paul, and Iris prepare to depart from Milos Island. Before they leave, Lewis gives the group a small amount of the newly harvested revival herbs as a thank you for the work they did. He tells them to inform Clay that there will be a new shipment of revival herbs within the week. Paul says good, now they can get on with their gym battles. With that, the group departs back to Driftvale City. On the way back, Ash asks Paul how he was able to calm down Electivar. Paul begins to tell them about the stone that came down from the sky, but he stops himself, claiming that Electivire came to its senses and then they were able to help them in the battle. Paul has decided to keep the Blackstone a secret from his friends for now, as he is unsure if it is a power he can control, as he does not yet understand it. The next day, the group is at the gym for Ash and Paul's battle. Ash has elected to go first in this battle, as Paul seems to have his attention divided. Clay, the gym leader, greets the duo and is excited for a battle. Words of their exploits on Milos Island have spread to Driftville, and Clay wants a chance to battle with the trainers who would battle on par with with the legendary Pokemon. Ash is more than happy to take on this challenge and the battle gets started. Clay leads with a Pokemon Ash has never seen before, Golette. After using his Pokedex, he learns that it is a ground ghost type. Ash decides to go with Crocorok. He figures maybe it would want to test its strength against another ground type. And Ash is right, but of course, Crocorok won't listen to him. Every command Ash gives it is ignored. In the end though, Crocorok eventually wins, giving Ash an early lead after Crocorok lands a crunch on Golette, knocking it out. Clay then decides to go with his Palpatoke. Crocorok wants to battle this Mon as well, but Ash calls it to try and get some control back over the battle. He then sends in his Duat. The otter Pokemon is itching to battle. Remember, Ash swore an oath to help it get stronger. So, it readies its scallops, taking its battle position. Clay orders Palpito to use Water Pulse. Duat is easily able to deflect this, but this was just to draw the attention of Duat as Palpito is able to get in close and use a supersonic on it. This proves to be the downfall of Duat, as it cannot get past the confusion and Palpito just picks it apart one move at a time. Ash eventually recalls it to avoid any serious damage to it, forfeiting the round. Clay tells Ash that he thought he would put up more of a fight. Ash then chooses to send in his newest evolved Mon, Boldor. Clay says, that's a dumb move due to the type disadvantage. But Ash tells him, type isn't everything. Eventually, Ash proves himself right. Boldor was able to land a Stone Edge with a critical hit right after Palpatode was hit with a Rock Blast. With Clay down to his final Pokemon, he sends in his prized Excadrill. Ash is hoping to end the battle with Boldor, as his only Pokemon left is Crocorok, and he doesn't have the greatest faith in its ability to carry him to a win. Though, Boldor is strong, and it puts up a decent fight, the battle with Palpito did take a toll on Boldor, and it falls to a drill run. Ash, a little shaken, recalls Boldor. He holds Crocorok's ball in his hand. With reluctance, he sends back in Crocorok. The Sand Croc tries to assert its dominance as a ground type by intimidating Excadrill, but the Steel ground type won't have any of it. This throws Crocorok off, as it's never stared down an opponent that wouldn't flinch at its glare. Ash tells it that they need to work together, or it won't win this battle, but the Croc blows it off, just thinking he can do it alone like he's done in all of the other battles. It quickly becomes clear that Excadrill is far ahead in terms of 
of power and speed. Ash tries to reason with Kokoro that if they work together, then they can win, but it again ignores it and muscles forward, ending with the same result. Ash thinks he has no chance and attempts to recall Kokoro to forfeit the battle, but it refuses to return. It won't accept defeat. Out of pure frustration, it forces its own evolution, glowing intensely as it changes into the much more powerful Crocodile. This unexpected evolution catches everyone off guard, and the new Mon starts to attack with no orders from Ash. Clay and Exodrill try to mount a defense against the hostility of Crocodile, but it's to no avail, and Exodrill falls in the battle. This does earn Ash the Quake Badge, but he doesn't feel good about it, as now Crocodile is rampaging through Clay's gym, celebrating its win. Eventually, it calms down, and Ash is able to recall it. Clay then presents Ash with his new badge. Ash does take it, but with reverence, as he doesn't like the way he earned it. Ash then tells Clay if he enjoyed battling with him, then his battle with Paul will be one that he never forgets. Clay looks at Paul with a deep silence. Later on at the Pokemon Center, Paul is strategizing for his battle with Clay. He and his Pokemon are all out on the battlefield, but his attention is still divided. He now has the potential to have the same power as Ash and Infernape, but he doesn't know how to access it. Paul's inner thoughts are at war with one another. On the one hand, he's been secretly wanting something that could level the playing field between him and Ash, but on the other hand, he's never been one to wait around for something to fall on his lap. He's always pushed to the next level of power on his own. Paul eventually decides that he needs to trust his own instincts, focusing on how he can use his Pokemon and not what they don't have. This should be an easy task for him, as he has seen Clay's battle style, as well as three of his Pokemon. Paul works into the night at the request to not be disturbed by Ash or Iris. This is fine, as Ash now has his own problems to deal with. He made the mistake of letting all of his Pokemon out of the ball to let them get some fresh air. He wanted to thank Crocodile for winning the gym badge today and congratulate it on evolving, but when Ash approaches it without warning, it lashes out at him with a Dragon Claw. Luckily, Infernape is able to intercept it with close combat and knocking the croc back. This puts Crocodile in its place for now, but little does Ash and Infernape realize the same monster now has a vendetta against Inferno, and it plans to be a problem whenever it can. The next day, the trio head to the gym. Paul is quiet the whole walk there, very reserved. Iris asks Ash if he has any idea what Paul is planning to do in his battle. Ash just shrugs. He doesn't have a clue. Paul turns to them to say something, but he just smiles as they head into the gym. Clay greets Paul and tells him that he's been very anxious for their battle ever since Ash hyped him up. Paul tells Clay, don't worry, I plan to make this a good battle for you. With that, the two trainers take their positions. Clay starts the battle with his first Pokemon, Stunfisk. Paul figured Clay might use something that he hadn't seen yet, so he throws his ball. Palpitoad. Stand by for battle. Paul's plan is simple. This one is a hard counter to anything Clay has, allowing Paul to fill out Clay's strategy even more. If there's any difference in the way he battled with Ash, then he will know here. Clay tells Paul that he thought he might try something like that, but it won't matter as he orders a mud bomb. The battle as a whole is one that Paul easily makes his way through. Clay is way too head on in his battle style. Paul easily counters everything that Clay does when he uses Palpito's muddy water as a counter shield, just like his days back in Sinnoh against Ash, allowing him to take the win easily. Clay recalls his Stunfisk, verbally expressing his displeasure at the style of battling that Paul is using. Clay wants a head-to-head, -head, like the battle he had against Ash. Paul tells Clay he's a little disappointed. As a gym leader, he expected more. Clay responds with a simple, what? Paul says that since he came to Unova, every gym leader he's faced has proven to be somewhat of a challenge for him, but after watching his battle with Ash, Paul felt like this battle was going to be a simple one. This remark makes Clay angry. He says, okay, if you're disappointed, well then you're in for a rude awakening, as he sends in his next Pokemon, Palpatode. Paul just stands there quiet. Clay starts the battle by calling for an Aqua Ring so he can prolong the battle. Clay then orders his Mon into battle, but the tactic is the same brute strength. Paul orders his Palpatode to put up the counter shield, blocking the attack. This repeats for a while, but what Clay is trying to do quickly becomes apparent as Paul's Palpatode starts to tire, while Clay is still in relatively good health. Then Clay makes his Hail Mary play as he calls for a Power Wood. Paul expected something like this and recalls Palpatode, barely dodging the attack. Clay tells Paul that was a cowardly move. Paul tells Clay that he had a feeling that he had something like that up his sleeve, and all he had to do was wait. Now your Palpatode is starting to wear down. Though the Aquarine has been in effect, its stamina is starting to falter. With that, Paul sends in his next Pokemon, Torterra. Clay, having never fought a Torterra, is unsure how to approach it, so he does the only thing he knows how, head on. But again, Paul is ahead of Clay, putting up its Stone Edge defense, catching Palpatode in it with a critical hit. But this is still not enough to draw Palpatode. The Tongue Toad is still standing, and it, like its trainer, is starting to feel the frustration of the battle. Palpatode uses this frustration to force its evolution into the much more powerful Seismitoad. Clay thinks that this is his chance. He orders his newly evolved Mon to get in close and to use a move that it learned upon evolution, Drain Punch. Paul orders another Stone Edge defense, but Seismitoad's new power is able to break through the defense and connect, draining Torterra's energy. Paul was hoping for this as he calls for a Giga Drain, countering the effects of the Drain Punch as it's also a grass move that's four times effective against the water crown type, knocking it out. 
Clay recalls Seismitoad. He tells Paul that he wasn't expecting that. Even though he doesn't agree with Paul's battle style, he can respect it. Paul tells Clay even though the battle started slow, he's actually starting to enjoy himself now. Clay declares that he's not out of it yet as he sends in his final Pokemon, Crocoroks. This Crocorok is far different from the one possessed by Ash. It's in perfect sync with Clay. Paul knows that this could be a problem as he hasn't actually gotten a chance to see Ash's at full power due to the two being at odds all the time. Paul then recalls Torterra and sends back in Palpatote. As the battle starts, Paul realizes that this thing is fast. Palpatote is too tired to continuously dodge the attacks. As a result, Palpatote falls, only getting in one muddy water hit. Paul recalls it. Now that he knows what he's dealing with, it's time for him to call out his trump card. Paul throws his final ball as he declares, stand by for battle. From it, Weavile emerges. Iris wonders what kind of Pokemon that is. Ash tells her that it's one of the Pokemon that Paul left back in Sinnoh. He must have felt that he needed it as an ace for today's battle. Iris wonders why Paul never called on his other Pokemon before. Ash smiles. This is Paul. The true Paul. Paul, the tactician, that plans for anything. To Ash, this only means one thing. Paul is fully back, which means their adventures in Unova just got a whole lot more interesting. Back in the battle, Paul quickly takes control. Weavile's speed is enough to match Crocroak, and with the priority move Ice Shard, Paul quickly puts down Clay's final Pokemon faster than the first two. Clay recalls Crocroak, presenting Paul with the Quake Badge. Paul thanks Clay for the badge. He then takes his leave. Iris and Ash rush to follow. That night at the Pokemon Center, Ash tells Paul that he's impressed with today's battle. Paul tells Ash that it's the first gym battle he's had in a while where he felt like himself. Iris tells Paul that she didn't realize how much of a tactful battler he was. Paul tells Iris that's his normal battle style. The problem I realized for a while is I was trying to battle too much like Ash, and it wasn't working. It was confusing my Pokemon, causing doubt in myself. Ash says he can relate. When he first met Paul, he went through something like that when he battled Rorik back in the Orbrick gym. It took him a while to get past it, but once he did, he grew as a trainer. In a rare occurrence, Paul actually thanks Ash for staying by him, as he may not have been able to find himself again. Ash just smiles as the trio plan their next move, but in the back of his mind, Paul is still hiding a secret. The next morning, the group head out in the direction of Mr. Alton City and the site of the next gym. After three days of traveling, the group arrives at the final barrier before the gym, Charged Stone Cave. The group enters the electric cave. Right away, things seem off. The Pokemon are running in fear at the sight of our heroes. Iris yells, I know Paul's intimidating, but he's really a nice guy. Paul just gives Iris a stern look, though he does acknowledge that something isn't right, but they need to get through the cave as Mr. Alton City is on the other side. So, the group continues on. Meanwhile, deeper in the cave, Team Plasma Grunts are frantically searching for something. Oh, at the helm of this operation is Colorus. They have machines set up throughout the cave, hooked up to what it looks like the actual cave itself. It appears they are siphoning off energy from the cave. As a result, the Pokemon are becoming enraged as their habitat is being disrupted. You can tell that the Pokemon tried to fight back, but they are quickly dealt with by Colorus and the Team Plasma Grunts. Colorus tells the Grunts that they need to gather all the energy in this place. It is needed to power the containment field. Little do they know, there is an unwelcome guest among them. Giovanni has made his way to the cave. You see, while Jesse, James, and Meowth were on Milos Island freeing the forces of nature, he had gained intel that Team Plasma was here. He aims to dish out some payback for their interference back in Castelia City. As Giovanni looks on from a distance, a small Pokemon pops out of the ground at its feet. Doug Trio. Giovanni has been using it to run interference to slow down Team Plasma by damaging their equipment. Giovanni is now ready to make his move. He aims to capture Culverus and convince him that it would be in his best interest to work for Team Rocket. Giovanni then pushes a button on a detonator to prime some explosives that he had set all around the cave with a timer of five minutes till they blow. With Dugtrio and now Golem by his side, Giovanni confronts Culrus with his proposition. Culrus was actually fully aware Giovanni was here in the cave. Even though he thought he was harming their operations, Giovanni was actually doing nothing of relevance. Giovanni, agitated, is not one to be bested and always has a plan B. Jesse, James, and Meowth have made their way to the cave and are lying in wait for their orders. As Giovanni and Colorus continue their friendly chat, they are interrupted by an alarm. Ash, Paul, and Iris have made it to the camp of Team Plasma. One of the grunts sounded the alarm, warning everyone of their arrival. Giovanni, less than thrilled that he is again is interrupted by those annoying kids, chooses to take care of this problem himself, as the charges he set start to tick down to their final minute. Colorus uses this distraction to make his escape, giving the command to abandon their mission to the Team Plasma grunts. Giovanni makes his way to our heroes, giving the command to Jesse, James, and Meowth to make their move. Over with Iris, 
Paul and Ash, they have all split up in an attempt to clear out any Team Plasma grunts, remembering that N told them not to trust any of them. While Ash and Iris are heading in a less than dangerous direction, Paul gets the pleasure of being the first to encounter Giovanni. Giovanni confronts the boy, voicing his displeasure that he is here. Paul doesn't really care what Giovanni has to say, but he does have a question. This piques Giovanni's interest. Paul says, I once heard a rumor that the gym in Viridian City was under the control of Team Rocket. Is that true? Giovanni, now very curious, says, yes, but that was a lifetime ago. Why do you ask? Paul then asks if that would mean Giovanni was its leader. Giovanni again says yes, but again, why does it matter? Paul then tells Giovanni that he once beat that gym and earned the Earth Badge, but Giovanni was not the person he beat. Giovanni tells Paul that's probably because after the gym was exposed, he gave up his operations there. Paul says he figured that, but he also heard the gym leader was undefeated until this happened. Is that true? Giovanni says, my boy, for someone who I aim to cause harm to, you certainly have a lot of questions. Paul states, just answer the question, are you that gym leader? Giovanni, now a little intrigued, proclaims that he is. Paul, with a smile on his face, says good, as he holds up a Pokeball. I won a battle, he declares, right here, right now. Giovanni tells Paul he's got guts, especially with what's going on right now. As the explosions start in the cave, and they are getting closer to him, Paul says, you already have a Pokemon out, pointing to Golem. What's stopping you? Giovanni thinks for a second, okay, I'll entertain you, but if I win, then you won't be leaving here with any of your Pokemon. Paul tells Giovanni he won't be winning, as he declares, Electivire, stand by for battle. <laughs> Today, we pick back up in Charged Stone Cave. Paul and Giovanni are squaring off as the explosions ring throughout the area. Boy, you have some gall if you think I would battle you in a place like this. Are you scared, old man? Paul taunts Giovanni. I thought you were Kanto's most powerful trainer. Here, I'll even give you the advantage. My Electivire against your Dugtrio and Golem. Giovanni thinks that Paul isn't quite right. Turning to leave, telling his Pokemon to follow. A bolt of lightning then streaks across his path, inches from his face. Did we say you could go, Paul says? The next one won't miss. I see you're not one for a reason, especially when you have your mind set to something. Fine, I, Giovanni, leader of Team Rocket, accept your challenge. With the stipulation you set forth, my two Pokemon against your one. Paul and Electivire both smirk. This is the one challenge that's always eluded Paul, and there's no way he will let it get away here. Over with Ash and Iris, the two are fighting their way through the cave. The explosions are inching closer and closer as the duo fight their way through. By now, the grunts from both Team Plasma and Rocket have dissipated. Now, it's just Ash, Pikachu, Iris, and Axew. They are having trouble finding their way through the cave, disoriented from all the explosions. Iris can feel something though. There is a disturbance. It's in the flow of energy in the cave. The explosions are killing the environment. This revelation has Iris in a petrified state. She's not moving or responding to her friends. The blasts are getting closer and closer, and with nothing left to do, Ash orders Pikachu to use a thunderbolt on Iris to snap her out of her trance. With Iris coming back, Pikachu recognizes something, a feeling. It's the battle between Paul and Giovanni, running down a corridor with Ash and the group in tow, Ash hoping that this will lead to Paul. Over with Paul and the Rocket Leader, the battle is in full swing. Though Electivire is outnumbered and at a type disadvantage, the Thunder Goliath is holding its own. So much so that Giovanni even compliments Paul on the conditioning of his Pokemon. Paul sees this as an attempt to distract him, telling Giovanni to focus on the battle, or he will lose. Finding amusement at this statement, Giovanni decides to honor this request. Yelling to Golem and Dugtrio, the two suddenly pick up speed and attacks. In a flash, Electivire goes from holding its own to being overwhelmed. Electivire blocks one attack just to to get hit with another. Golem and Dugtrio are pretty fierce with their combo attacks. They are very well timed and the pressure that Paul and Electivire are now facing isn't one that Paul thought they would. Fortunately, due to the conditioning of Electivire, its endurance is allowing it to handle most of the onslaught. But this will only last for so long as Electivire is starting to falter. Paul can see this and pushes Electivire further, ordering a brick break after brick break. This does manage to take out Dugtrio, but now Electivire is exhausted, breathing heavily. Giovanni recalls his Dugtrio, commending Paul on his Electivire's abilities. Realizing that time has run out, and Giovanni, being the businessman that he is, he decides that this could be the opportunity for a deal that could benefit both of them. Oh, I'm listening, Paul says. While these two begin to talk, Ash and Iris arrive at a ledge above the battle. They begin to call for Paul, but are quickly silenced when they hear the conversation between the two. Giovanni recognizes the skill of Paul, telling him that his power is one that should work for Team Rocket, offering him a position in the criminal organization. Paul is silent to this offer at first, almost like he's considering it. Ash wants to speak up, but is quickly silenced by Iris. 
Jesus. Just wait, she says. Have faith in Paul, as they look on. Paul just smirks. So let me get this straight. You, the all-powerful elder of Team Rocket, is offering little old me a position in your illustrious organization? Giovanni thinks he's got Paul to come around to his way of thinking, and he begins to speak. Well, yes, it's a privilege I rarely, but it's cut off by laughter. Well, you really are full of yourself. You seriously think I would work for someone who is weaker than me as a trainer? Weaker? Giovanni questions, offended by Paul's disrespect of his offer. I will show you who is weaker, boy, as Giovanni calls on two more of his trademark Pokemon, Persian and Rhydon. You won't be leaving this cave. Paul just smiles. Electivire. He thinks he can still win. With the surge of electricity, Electivire roars, sparking everything around them. Paul and his Oni are finally back on the same page. For the first time in a long time. This was the catalyst needed as a strange aura of light and electricity begins to spark from Paul's bag. Then the white orb in Ash's bag begins to resonate with it as well, pulsating with Paul's bag. Both trainers reach into the bag at the same time and pull out their respective orbs. Both Iris and Ash look on as they become aware that Paul is in possession of the black orb. Wait, is that? Iris thinks to herself. But her thoughts are immediately interrupted by Paul. So, you've responded to me, have you? Electivire, if I'm correct, this is the same power that Ash and Infernape have. What do you say we give it a try? With the cry from Electivire and a surge of a lightning, Paul throws the orb in the air. A blinding light envelops the area as a mix of cries are heard coming from it. <laughs> With the flash of light, what stands before them is a hulking behemoth, surging in electricity. The force of its presence echoes throughout the cave. Ash looks on from above. Paul and Electivire. They, they became one, he thinks. Paul then addresses Giovanni. You want what you don't have. And when you can't take it, you bargain with it. So it's no longer an obstacle. You're pathetic, Paul says. This angers Giovanni. Without hesitation, he orders his remaining Mons to attack, holding nothing back. But Electivire nor Paul flinch. With a simple order of a brick break, Electivire unleashes its new power, sending Golem into the wall of the cave catching Rhydon in the process. A stunned Giovanni looks on, his best Pokemon gone in an instant. Paul hangs his head. Pathetic, he mutters once again. I was hoping for a challenge. The explosions are at the heels of everyone. Realizing they can no longer stay hidden, Ash and Iris rush to join Paul, revealing they've seen Electroviolet's newly transformed state. But they have no time for questions. Meanwhile, Giovanni is snapped back to reality by a familiar voice on the radio. It's Jesse, James, and Meowth, urging the boss to get out as the explosions envelop the area. The Rocket Master looks on at Paul and Ash. Their interference won't go unpunished as he fades into the darkness. Now our heroes have a problem. They are surrounded by explosions, but as they start to lose hope, Electivire begins to glow, surrounding the group in a barrier of electrical energy, saving them from the blasts. Once the scene calms, the barrier fades. The sight that lay before our heroes is one of pure devastation, but what they see isn't even half of it. The energy of this place. It's, it's fading in a way, Iris says, as they watch the electric rocks begin to lose their glow, falling to the floor. What's going on, Ash questions. This place is dying, Paul answers. What? Don't kid like that, Ash says. But Iris confirms what Paul says is true. The explosions threw off the balance of this place. Well, what will happen to the Pokemon, Ash says. They will meet the same fate as this place, Paul answers. Without the electricity of Charged Stone Cave, the electric Pokemon won't have the environment to sustain them. Is there anything we can do, Ash questions? But silence befalls the group. It looks hopeless, but Electivire then begins to glow, with the Black Orb separating from the Oni, returning it to its original form. The Black Orb levitates above the cave. Then, without warning, a cry can be heard, and a surge of energy from the Black Orb forces its way through the cave like none had seen before. Electricity then follows the surge. To the surprise of our group, the stones that had fallen begin to react, levitating back into their original position. The black orb then falls to the ground, now silent as its energy has been depleted. Paul then picks up the orb, tossing it into his bag. But Ash then begins to question Paul. How long have you had the orb, Paul? But Paul says nothing, turning and heading to the exit that leads to Miss Trotson City. After a few more hours and Ash giving Paul the rundown, the group makes their way to the Pokemon Center. It's late at this point, and Ash is hounding Paul for any info on the Black Orb, relentlessly to no avail. But Paul just keeps silent, only breaking it to thank Nurse Joy for her help in healing his Pokemon. As the group walk through the center, heading to their rooms for the night, they are met with the presence of an old man who 
recognizes the trio. Hey, weren't you the ones who saved Castelia City? The man questions. This catches the attention of everyone, even causing Ash to discontinue his never-ending questions for the moment. I'm sorry, do we know you, Iris asks? Oh, I apologize. How rude of me. My name is Professor Juniper. Confused, Ash questions this revelation, saying that they had already met Professor Juniper back in November Town. Oh, you met my daughter. I'm sorry, I should be more clear. My name is Cedric Juniper. Oh, Iris says. Well, that explains a lot. To answer your question, yeah, we were in Castelia City, Ash states. I thought so, the old man says. My daughter mentioned that she had met you two. Ash and Paul, was it? And don't forget me, Iris says, with the fence in her voice. Yes, yes, of course. Wanting to speed this up, Paul cuts straight to the point. What do you want, old man? Paul, no need to be rude, Iris quips. But Cedric just rolls on with it. No, no, he's right. I don't even know you, so he has a right to be suspicious. Anyway, the reason why I wanted to talk to you is because there's been some strange things happening in Unova ever since the battle you had in Castelia City. Really ask questions? Like what? Paul, clearly annoyed, begins to walk away. But it stopped when Cedric mentions the weather in the region. Juniper Sr. states that the weather patterns have become very erratic as of late. Almost like Mother Nature itself is angry with the people of Unova. Ash and Iris begin to say something, but Paul beats them to the punch. That's because it is, he says. Oh, please explain, Cedric inquires. It's very simple. The stupid people of Unova's past locked up your legendary Pokemon known as Landris, Thunderous, and Tornadus. They were freed recently and have been wreaking havoc ever since. And if I may ask, how do you know all of this, Cedric questions? It's simple. We battled them on Milos Island some weeks back, Paul states, and they were not happy. If I had to guess, what we experienced was only a taste of their power. They will attack again when they are at full strength. My, my, this is interesting. My daughter said meeting you two would be worth it. Tell me, do you have any other info on the weather of the region? Ash begins to say something about the white and black orbs, but is swiftly shut down by Paul. No, old man. That's all we know. Now, if you'll excuse us, we have a gym battle to prepare for. Oh, yes, yes, of course, Juniper says. I'm sorry for keeping you. No problem, Ash, Naira says, as Cedric walks back to his room in the center. Hey, Paul, why did you stop me from saying anything about the orbs? Ash questions. Ash, you can be truly dumb sometimes. And said, trust no one. Don't even speak about the orbs. And you just want to blab to anyone who will listen? Not while I'm around. This statement angers Ash. But surprisingly, Iris sides with Paul, saying there's too much at risk with both Team Rocket and and Team Plasma out there. We have to be careful, she says. Yeah, I guess you're right, but you don't have to be so mean about it, Ash says, as the group readies for bed. The night then fades on as Paul falls into a deep sleep. He begins to dream of a place that he's never seen before, but it's not just him there. He's joined by Electivire, and above them, Zekrom floats in the sky, but it looks angry, like it intends to cause harm to Paul. In response, Paul orders Electivire to defend him, but it is unresponsive, almost like Paul is being punished for something. Before Zekrom's lightning can hit him, his vision cuts to a scene of a mountain. Behind him is the ocean from an aerial view. What is this place? I've never seen any landmarks like this on our maps that we've been traveling. But as Paul finishes his thought, suddenly the three djinn of nature appear, readying for another battle. With a mere flick of their wrist, they knock Paul from the sky, sending him falling to the ground. Paul's heart begins to race as the ground inches closer. He begins to scream, closing his eyes, only to wake back up in his bed at the Pokemon Center. In a panic, looking around, he sees Iris and Ash, who both ask if he's okay. Breathing heavily, Paul says he's fine. He just needs more sleep. But Paul, Ash says, it's already morning. What, he questions him in disbelief? How? When? This isn't good. Paul is exhausted, and they have a gym battle today. The trio get dressed and head down for some food before they head to the gym. During the meal, Paul is having trouble focusing on eating, and he knows it. His thoughts are split between the gym battle he's nowhere near ready for and the dream, no nightmare, he had last night. He's unable to focus on any of the tasks at hand. It finally comes time for them to head to the gym and challenge its leader. But when Iris and Ash stand up from the table, Paul declares he won't be joining them, saying he's going to stay behind for some training here at the center. Are you sure, Ash asks? Paul looks at him, telling him his mind is made up, so move on. Okay, Ash says, with him and Iris heading for the door. But once outside the door, Iris stops. Hey, Ash, I'm going to hang around here, she says, in case Paul needs some help. Are you sure, Iris? He did say he didn't want us to wait. Yeah, he may not want to admit it right now, but he needs someone close. I'll stay, so you can go battle for your next batch. Oh, and Ash, don't come back empty-handed, Iris says with a wink. You know it, he replies, as he and Pikachu head off to the gym. Ash and Pikachu eventually arrive at the gym. What they see is a sight of aerial brilliance. Three flying-type Pokemon are bowing to the command of a trainer in the middle of the gym, as she demonstrates the abilities of them to the audience around. Ash and Pikachu can't help but be a 
amazed. Then they hear the sound of this gym leader speak. She introduces herself as Skyla, the flying type master. She then thanks all of the audience for joining her today and says she would like to end today's aerial demonstration with an open challenge to anyone in the audience. Ash knows this is his chance, pushing his way to the front of the crowd. Unfortunately, it doesn't take much as due to being packed into a tight group of people, Pikachu gets squished, firing a thunderbolt, frying half of the spectators and Ash in the process. This catches Skylar's attention and she demands to know who is upstaging her. As she looks to the only individual standing where the crowd took the thunderbolt is Pikachu. Skyla, confused, questions who the owner of this electric nuisance is. Ash, laughing off the situation, stands up, claiming Pikachu as his Pokemon, thinking the situation isn't that serious. But he's in for a rude awakening. Skyla isn't amused, upset that Ash and his Pokemon took the attention off of her. Ash, thinking he's in the clear, begins to joke with Skyla, but is quickly shut down for being a spotlight-stealing clown. Thanks to you, now I can't send my audience home with the finale I promised, Skyla says. Now finally cluing into what's going on, Ash interrupts her, which aggravates Skyla even further. But he does get the point across that he's the challenger. He wanted to battle her. Now, Skyla's mood slightly changes. She has an opportunity to humiliate him and teach Ash a lesson all at once. Oh, and let's not forget the audience in their show. Skyla accepts Ash's challenge on one condition. He needs to use a flying type Pokemon. To this, Ash says no problem, sending out his unpheasant. We can have an aerial battle if that's what you want. Oh, are you familiar with this type of battle, Skyla questions? Actually, I am, Ash says. I've battled several gym leaders in other regions in the same type of battle. Well then, Ash, how does a two-on-two -two battle sound to you? Better yet, let's make it a tag battle. A tag battle, Ash questions? Yeah. You said you battled in other regions. Why not have a tag battle like the trainers in the Hoenn region? Excited, Ash accepts this challenge. He wants to see what Skyla can do. Very well, Ash. My choices will be these two, as Skyla sends out Swanna and Mandibuzz, two Pokemon that Ash is unfamiliar with. Back over at the Pokemon Center, Iris is looking around. She seems to have lost Paul while telling Ash that she wasn't going with him. Luckily, it doesn't take long as she finds Paul on the battlefield behind the Pokemon Center. What she sees is a site that has become standard with Paul around, training, and this session looks like an attention one. Iris approaches Paul, trying to get some response out of him. Hey Paul, can we talk, Iris asks. Without missing a beat, Paul tells her to make it quick. He's got training to do, as he orders Embor and Electivire to lock up into a grapple to improve their physical capabilities. Well, I've noticed you've been distant as of late. More than normal, Iris says. I was just wondering why. An extended silence falls between the two. Iris thinking that Paul didn't hear the question, since she asked it when the two Pokemon clashed. She prepares to ask again, but as she opens her mouth, Paul finally begins the talk. It's been hard as of late, Paul says. Really? How so, Iris questions. This gets Paul to turn, giving the young dragon master his full attention. Ash, he's been growing with his Pokemon so much since we came to Unova. I fully acknowledge that Ash is a strong trainer and has the abilities that most trainers dream of, but what puzzles me is the way he does it. You have seen over the course of the last eight months how I achieved the methods of my Pokemon strength through intense training. Ash seems to respond well to my methods and his Pokemon, growing stronger each time we train. Then, there's me. When coming to Unova, I was presented with a situation that was a mirror image of what Ash had to face a few years earlier in Sinnoh. A Pokemon that was abandoned by its trainer. A Pokemon that may not respond to my training. You're referring to Embor, aren't you? Iris says. Exactly, Paul responds. There are times when I felt like Embor should have been Ash's Pokemon. Sometimes, I feel like it wouldn't respond to my training style. This whole experience caused me to question the the way I did things. To approach training like Ash, even if it wasn't a change that I made willingly, I shifted to his style and it threw off my Pokemon because I couldn't change who I was in the moment. I was stuck in a limbo, unable to change my training style with the Pokemon. I see, Iris says. So is that why you kept the Black Orb from us? It is. I found myself on Milos Island with the same power that was just handed to Ash, but no idea of what to do with it. Unsure if it's even something I even wanted. Power. Strength. Strength is always something I've earned on my own. I've never been handed it to me, nor have I wanted it handed to me. But Ash has been able to wield this power, like it's something he's always had, and I'm unsure how to respond to it. So I'm going to do things the way I know best, on my own. Well, if I can offer you some insight from a person on the outside looking in, would you allow me, Paul? Fine, as long as it's actually insight, causing Iris to swallow intensely. I think you're on the right track. When compared to me, you and Ash are in a whole nother league. The type of training
trainers you two are, the power you possess is something I've only seen in one other trainer. But you need to consider that if there's no struggle, then there is no growth. And I think that due to your struggle thus far, your growth will be far greater than Ash's. Then there's the matter of the orbs. I think the reason that you and Ash specifically were given them are due to the posing natures of the orbs. Have you ever heard about the legend of the two dragons that were housed within them? No, I haven't, Paul says. Well, then let me enlighten you, Iris says, as she begins to tell the tale of Unova's ancient past. Over at the gym, the crowd is going wild as they egg Ash on, saying things like, you have no chance. Pack it up, rookie. The crowd is now getting to Ash, and he angrily yells back, causing Skylet to laugh at him, losing control. Well, Ash, do you accept my terms? Turning back to the gym leader without hesitation, he yells yes, telling Gunfezit to stand by for battle. Ash and Skylet take their positions in the skyboxes with their respective flyers at their side. Well, Ash, you're going to need a second Pokemon if you wish to battle us, Skylet teases. Usually, in a case like this, Ash would turn to Pikachu as the electric mouse readies for battle. But Ash tells it to stand down. Sorry, buddy. I'm going to have to have you sit this one out. Confused, Pikachu charges back down and watches for Ash's choice. The crowd grows silent as Ash declares, Do what? I choose you. The Otter Samurai emerges, taking its stance on the battlefield. Skyla is surprised. She was fully expecting Pikachu, but isn't going to complain as she sees this as a free win. Well, Ash, not what I would have chosen, but you're the challenger, not me. Let's get this started, she says, as she orders an aqua ring and a nasty plot from her two sky dancers. Ash, not wanting to waste this free turn, orders a quick attack and an aqua jet that both land respectively. Unfortunately, this was a mute point, as Swana is just healed up, and Mandibuzz is so tanky that it barely felt anything. It is at this point that Ash thinks he may have made an error in his battling choice, but there's no turning back now. Sky Skyla taunts Ash, saying she expected better as she orders the next set of attacks in a water and dark pulse. The two attacks combine, flooding the surrounding area to cover the maximum amount of space throughout the battlefield. The moves travel with a lightning pace, eventually finding their target, even with Ash ordering his Pokemon to dodge, being both their second set of eyes. This forces both Unfezit and Duwat into the ground as they are forced to regroup. And to add insult to injury, Swana is now fully recovered from the damage it had taken. Well, Ash, you really aren't the best at combo attacks. I thought you had the experience in these kind of battles. Saying nothing, Ash just looks on, thinking Skyla is right. His timing is off. He needs to turn things around as time is against him. Choosing to take a different route, Ash orders his next set of attacks focused on Manda Buzz with an air cutter and a razor shell. Unpheasant is able to attack from a distance, but Duwat has to get in close. And this is where the true strategy of Skyla comes into the surface. Swana intercepts Duwat with an acrobatics while the air cutter collides with Manda Buzz. But again, the bird just takes it. This is when Ash clues in. Manda Buzz is the slower of the two months, while Swana is the speed of the team. This is going to make things difficult in the long run, as it seems the two can both take damage just as good as the other. But Ash has little time for his inner debate, as Skyla is on the attack again. This time, it's something new, Scold from Swana and a Steel Wing from Mandibuzz. Ash orders another air cutter from Unpheasant, telling Duwat to wait. Skyla is curious, but continues on the same path. The air cutter then collides with the Scold, breaking the attack, but one blade manages to make it through. This is where Ash's strategy comes to light, as he knew that Mandibuzz would head to do what, as it couldn't keep up with Unpheasant. Meanwhile, Ash's Water Otter has been charging its newest move. In the air, the Air Cutter lands, hitting Manabuzz in the back. It also seems to have landed with a little extra power, distracting it in the process. Skyla, wanting to prevent losing control of this battle, orders Swana in with an Aerial Ace on Duat, but Ash orders his own Aerial Ace from Unpheasant that does intercept, causing damage to both. All the while, Duat takes advantage of this opening, firing its newest move, Ice Beam. The move itself is very weak. Ash's Duat is still in the early stage of learning it as part of Ash's promise to help it grow stronger. The beam lands just after the air cutter does, sending Manabuzz into a tailspin. Stunned and having trouble pulling up from Skyla's commands, Ash orders another Razor Shell in hopes of ending one of her Pokemon. But the buzzer regains its bearings, pulling up with its feet, barely grazing the ground. Good try, Ash, but futile in the end, Skyla says, not wanting to admit that it was much closer than it appeared. 
Yeah, but now your mana buzz is feeling it, and won't be able to last much longer, Ash quips back. However, Skyla just smiles. You really thought it would be that easy? Manda buzz. Use Roost. The vulture begins to glow in a healing aura, gaining back some of the stamina it lost. Great, Ash thinks. How am I supposed to end this if both Pokemon can heal mid-battle? Unpheasant is starting to tire and Duat won't be able to fend off two air attackers. But then Ash notices something. Mandibuzz is moving slower than the beginning of the battle. Then, that means Ash smiles. I think we can do this, Ash says, ordering Unpheasant to fly down and cover Duat while it rushes forward. Unpheasant is right on top protecting it while it rushes in the direction heading toward Mandibuzz. Skyla sees Ash's target. She knows that Mandibuzz isn't ready for another dual attack, so she orders Swana in with another acrobatics to intercept. Ash knows that he can't let this hit, or it could be the end of Unpheasant pheasant, but one move won't be enough. Smiling, Ash orders a combo Aerial Ace Quick Attack to give the move the power it needs to rival Swanna's. But that's not all. The reason Unpheasant was covering Duat is because it was charging a Razor Cell that Ash orders on Swanna as well. Realizing her mistake, Skyla orders a Dark Pulse from Mandibuzz to provide support, but Ash is one step ahead again ordering an Aqua Jet from Duat to outspeed the attack. This combo strikes Swanna with both of Ash's Pokemon. The damage from this is too much for Swana and Aqua Ring to fend off. It was completely unguarded when taking the attacks, and this results in a knockout, but not without a casualty on Ash's side. As Duat lands from the aerial maneuver, the Dark Pulse hits on Pheasant, ending its duration in this battle. Darn, Ash says. I was hoping to avoid that. I see, Ash. Your plan was never Amanda Buzz. It was Swana all along. That was a smooth and deceitful approach. Yeah, it was a risk, though. I was trying to avoid losing any Pokemon, but I guess you can't win them all, as both trainers recall their respective knockouts. With only one Pokemon each, the two trainers begin the final leg of this battle, Skyla ordering another Steel Wing. Ash counters with another move that he's been working on Duat with, its own Aerial Ace. The two moves collide, but it's clear that Mandibuzz is the stronger of the two, winning the encounter and pushing Duat to the floor of the gym, while Mandibuzz retreats to the safety of the air. Duat, stand up, Ash yells. It struggles to its feet, but Skyla wastes no time calling for another nasty plot to increase its special attack. Duat, this is your chance. You wanted to get stronger, and now it's up to you, Ash yells. If you lose, there's no one else. Let's show Skyler just how far you've come. Now what Ash speaks is the truth. Duat readies itself with a defensive style stance. That's it. Let's give her the challenge she never thought she would get. Skyla, however, is unimpressed, telling Ash that this battle, though interesting, will end the same way it started, with her on top, as she orders a Dark Pulse from the souped up bird. Ash, in response, orders an Ice Beam. Duat fires the move, but nothing comes of it. Duat is too tired to give it the focus needed for the undertrained move. Skyla smiles. It's over, Ash, as the Dark Pulse consumes Duat in pure shadows. Duat, Ash yells. The darkness fades to reveal Duat on the ground. Well, Ash, it seems that was the end. The resolve you have is great, but you and your Duat will have to come back for a rematch. Those words echo throughout Duat and Ash. The last time they had to do a rematch, they didn't get it. They never got the chance. This can't be happening again. As the ref begins to call Ash's loss, Duat begins to wrestle to its feet with a slight glow around it that only intensifies as it rises up. Ash smiles. No, Skyla. It seems you've underestimated our resolve. We won't go down. Not like this. Well, Ash, I'm going to have to teach you and your stubborn mom the lesson one last time. Manda Buzz, you steel wing. It cries as its hardened wings begin to glow, looking to end Duat. Ash knows that this is their last shot, so he tells Duat to stay put so it doesn't use any energy that it has left. Skyla orders her bird to put all of its weight into the steel wing. It falls with full intention of crushing its opponent. As it nears, Ash tells Duat to ready its scallops, taking a stance as if it were to dance with fans. Duat readies itself as the bird makes contact with it. One shell is holding it back, but it's slowly losing its durability. With Ash telling Duat to hold on, they need to wait. Skyla orders Mandibuzz to push harder, which it does. Duat is beginning to lose its footing. Inching closer and closer, Mandibuzz is practically on top of it. Skyla doesn't understand why it's taking so long. Then it hits her. The glow. It was torrent. As Ash says, now do what? And it fires the other razor shell into Mandibuzz. The torrent powered Aqua Slash cuts into the bird with the ferocity of a thousand swords, dropping it to the feet of Duat. The crowd 
erupts as the ref declares Ash the winner, stunning Skylar in the process. Wow, this kid has the spunk needed to do great things, she thinks to herself. Skylar then approaches Ash as he tends to do what? Ash, you've shown that you're an ace Pokemon trainer. You proved that today by winning this, handing Ash the jet badge. Thanking the leader for it, Ash takes his prize and celebrates with his Pokemon. Ash then tells Skylar that he had a great time battling with her, but he needs to get to the Pokemon Center as he has some friends waiting and his Pokemon need to get checked checked up. Well, I'll join you, Skylar says, as I need the same. So after the gym clears out, the two set off, arriving at dusk. Ash sees Paul and Iris outside, running to greet them. So did you get the badge, Iris questions? Ash flashes the badge while introducing the group to Skylar. Hey everyone, your friend Ash is quite the trainer. He managed to beat me, though the battle was really close, laughing with Ash. Oh hey Skylar, by the way, this is Paul. He's going to want to challenge you for your badge tomorrow, Ash says. This causes Skylar to discontinue her laughter. With a sigh, I'm sorry, but I won't be able to have a battle with your friend. This catches Paul's full attention, demanding to know why. Catching Skyla off guard, well, I'm sorry to say, but I have to take a flight to the eastern side of Unova in the morning to drop off some cargo. I won't be back for a few weeks, as I have other deliveries to make from there. I'm going to be gone for a month minimum, Skyla says. Well, I guess I won't get a battle from you then, Paul says, but it will give me a chance to train more. That's the spirit, Skyla says. You can always battle me when I come back. I'm sorry, but I can't wait that long, Paul says. Well, it's a shame. Ash said that you're a strong trainer. Maybe we'll get a chance to battle another time. As this conversation is going on, a broadcast on the TV advertising traveling in the Unova region comes on. When something catches the eye of Paul, that mountain he thinks to himself, that's the same one from my dream. He then cuts off Skyla. Hey, you're a pilot, right? Do you know where that is? Paul points to the TV. Skyla takes a second. That looks like a place called Reversal Mountain. Is that in the western part of Unova? Paul asks with desperation in his voice. Um, no, Skyla says. It's in the eastern part. The mountain in the western half is Twist Mountain. Yeah, don't you remember that, Paul? That's where we gotta go to return the, our items, Ash interjects. Paul just stares quietly at the TV. Well, I gotta head off, Skyla says. I have an early start in the morning. The group waves by as she departs for the gym. Later that night, they are all again sleeping in their beds, when Paul begins to have the same dream from the prior night. Images of Reversal Mountain with the ruins of an ancient settlement. This time, though, Team Rocket is there as well. Paul wakes up once again in a sweat, but it's dawn. Looking out at the sunrise, Paul knows what he has to do. Grabbing his bag, he begins to pack quietly, changing his clothes. But this alerts Pikachu, waking it up as well. Paul looks at it, petting it on the head. Take care of Ash for me, he says, then leaves without another word. Paul takes one step outside of the Pokemon Center when he's met with Iris. Where are you off to, she says. At first, Paul says nothing, but when Iris tells him that she'll wake Ash, he blurts out, I'm going to catch a ride with Skylar. Paul tries to explain, but Iris says she already knows. She could tell by the look in his face last night. Reversal Mountain, was it? She questions. I don't know why, but I feel the orb. No, Zekrom is leading me there. The last two nights, I've had a dream, and in the last one, Team Rocket was there, so you know it can't be good. Iris thinks for a few seconds. Yeah, that does sound bad, she says. So, you'll let me go, Paul questions. Who am I to question the will of a legendary Pokemon, Iris says, grabbing her bag. Besides, I'm going with you. What? No, you need to stay here with Ash, Paul tells her. No, I don't. Either I'm going, or I will wake Ash up, and we all go together. Well, what about Ash, Paul asks. I have a feeling that he'll be just fine, Iris says. Now, let's go, or we'll miss Skylar. So with that, Paul, Iris, and Axew head to the airstrip of Miss Charlton City. A few hours later, Ash finally wakes up with Pikachu by his side, and at the foot of his bed is a note. Ash... Paul and I have taken a plane trip with Skyla. Paul has been very troubled as of late, and I feel he's going to need someone to lean on. But don't worry, let's meet again in one month's time in Absolute City. That's the site of the final gym in Unova. I'll make sure Paul is there as well. Your friend, Iris. Ash hangs his head, but smiles. Well, buddy, it looks like we're going to have to go on alone. Paul and Iris are off on their own adventure. Wiping the tears from his eyes, Ash says it'll be fine because he knows that he'll see his friends again. In one short month, that means that Ash has a lot of work to do. He needs to get through to Swiss Mountain and to Isira City for a seventh batch. Then to the Ruins of White, where he must lay the White Orb to rest, as Zen said. But not to worry. With Pikachu, Infernape, and the rest of his Pokemon, Ash will get the job done. Ash and Pikachu get ready to check out of the Pokemon Center. He hears that to the north of the city, there is a tower that is very ancient. Ash wants to stop by, as he is told by Nurse Joy that if he rings the bell at the top, it is a sign of good luck. So he and Pikachu set out. It takes the new duo about a half a day to reach the tower, but Ash is in awe by its majesty. Remember 
Remembering the words of Nurse Joy, Ash rushes into the tower. Upon his ascent, Ash realizes that this place is a safe haven for ghost types. Not wanting to trigger any of them, Ash and Pikachu do their best to remain respectful to the ones that have passed on. Upon getting to the top, Ash can see the giant bell of the tower. Walking slowly to it, Ash thinks about how he won't let Paul or any of the other rivals he's met show him up. This is the first step on the rest of his Unova journey. Ash begins to ring the bell, but on the first gong, Ash can hear a heartbeat. Then, with the second one, a more intense heartbeat rings throughout his being. The feeling is so intense that it forces Infernape out of its ball, as now the white orb is pulsating. Then it happens. Ash, Pikachu, and Infernape fade to a black scape. Both before them pierce Reshiram in an ethereal form. What follows is visions that, at first, Ash is having trouble understanding. But as the visions replay, Ash begins to make out a familiar character. Him, Pikachu, Infernape, and the other ones called Team Plasma, and a place that appears to be a site of ancient ruins. That must be the ruins of white. Is that what you're trying to tell us, Reshiram? A mighty cry echoes throughout the ethereal plane just before they fade back to the top of the tower. Pikachu rushes to the shoulder of Ash with Infernape holding the white orb. I know, buddy. I saw it too. If Paul is having visions like that, then I can see why he had to leave. I don't know what it was, but I feel like it's a warning. Things from this point are going to be dangerous as Ash and his Pokemon look out on the setting sun. Meanwhile, in Eastern Unova, Skyla's plane finally lands in a place called Lentmus Town. Once Paul and Iris step off the plane, the reason they have come to this part of Unova makes itself known. Reversal Mount towers over the surrounding area. There, Paul points. I don't know what it is, but we need to go there. Iris, trusting Paul, tells him they should rest for the night at the Pokemon Center. They can set off at first light. Paul nods, and they head off to the center. Meanwhile, somewhere deep on the mountain, Team Rocket are active. It appears they are searching for something. Jesse, James, and Meowth are are all on separate parts, radioing in their results for their searches. Then, a reading in the area of James goes off. I think I found it, he yells into the radio. A familiar voice answers back over the comms. Giovanni, good. I will be there very soon. As off in the distance, Boss Rocket flies in on the lead Team Rocket helicopter. With their arrival in Litmus Town, Paul and Iris are now in uncharted territory. One, they don't have Ash, and two, they really have no idea where they are to go. Paul only has one thought, something is calling him to Reversal Mountain. Figuring the Pokemon Center would be their best bet as a place to start, Iris makes the suggestion they head there, which Paul agrees. Upon arrival, the Pokemon Center of this deceptively sleepy town is overrun with residents and trainers that have been traveling the area. Iris and Paul watch the chaos the center is enveloped in. The two begin to ask around about what is happening, getting little to no response or answers from the trainers, grieving at the bedside of Pokemon that have been set up in common areas due to the overcapacity of the hospital. Letting her emotions take over, Iris begins to help in any way she can, giving assistance to anyone who asks, while Paul, being a little bit more level-headed, searches for the proprietor of the establishment. Nurse Joy. It takes some time, but he eventually finds her treating a Machino that has appeared to be in some sort of extreme battle. Pieces of its fur and skin are missing, like they were melted away. Paul begins to inquire about what's happening, only for Nurse Joy to ask if he can take a seat here, and Otterno will look at his Pokemon as soon as they can. Seeing the futility in his effort, Paul chooses not to draw the attention of Nurse Joy, as she needs to focus on the task at hand. He then seeks out Iris, who he finds under the instructions of Otterno, as they care for the panicked Dervan patients. Paul can do nothing but watch pondering his next move as he seeks answers. Luckily, he doesn't have to wait long as this town's only officer, Jenny, has come by the center to bring yet another trainer that has a Pokemon in critical condition. As she isn't a healthcare provider, Jenny can't really help here. However, this offers a vital moment for Paul as he questions her on what's been happening here. Officer Jenny informs Paul that all of these trainers have attempted to take the only path that leads from town that just so happens to traverse the Reversal Mountain. Normally, it isn't an issue, but within the last few days, the once dormant volcano has become active, and the Pokemon in the area are becoming more aggressive due to the increased danger to their natural habitats. This has resulted in many trainers that have landed here by plane or any that were just stopping here to become trapped until the next flight out. I see, Paul says. Well, me and a friend are planning on heading up the mountain anyway, so we can check it out to see if there's anything abnormal happening up there. I'm sorry, Jenny says. Due to the high risk of injury, I've closed the path to Reversal Mountain for the time being. I'm afraid you are stuck here until further notice. Jenny then excuses herself, as she needs to secure the path out of Lentmus Town. Paul says nothing, only looking out a window to the towering rock formation. Every fiber in his being is telling him that he needs to go there, and nothing is going to stop him.
Later that night, after things in the center have calmed down, Paul and Iris are talking about what is happening in the town. Iris says it's strange what's happening here. All these hurt Pokemon, the town being locked down, Paul says he couldn't agree more. He finds it odd that he's been having these visions of Reversal Mountain and these things keep happening. By now, Iris knows Paul and she asks when he's planning to head up the mountain. Paul tells her after midnight when everyone is asleep. Great, I'll get ready, our heroine says. However, Paul stops this by telling Iris that he needs her to cover him and distract anyone who starts asking questions. Iris is adamantly against this, protesting this bad idea, but the look on Paul's face says it all. This is something he needs to do, and no one will stand in his way, be it friend or foe. With a sigh, Iris relents, telling Paul to be careful, and she doesn't want to have to save him like she always does. With a mild smirk, Paul tells her don't worry. He's ending this craziness that's been going on in his head tonight. With that, we fade to Paul trekking up the side of Reversal Mountain, being forced to take the hard way as not to alert Officer Jenny. Looking back, Paul takes one last look, almost to say goodbye, and makes his way up the towering monolith. It takes some time, but Paul is able to make his way into a cave that is on the face of a steep cliff. Once safely in the opening, Paul notices something. He was expecting heat due to the injuries of all the Pokemon at the center, but what he finds is the exact opposite. It's cold, almost like ice. Paul knows immediately that whatever is going on, nature is not at the center of this like he's being told. So, he sends an Emboar to provide some much needed light in the void of nothing. Telling his combat pig they need to move, the two dart off into the dark, unsure of what awaits them at the other end. Back at the center, Officer Jenny and Nurse Joy are making their rounds, checking the patients of the hospital. They are making sure everyone is accounted for. This is where Iris runs interference, distracting the two the best she can. Though she is successful with Nurse Joy, as she is more trusting, Officer Jenny is another matter. While Iris thinks she's successful upon their parting, Jenny's intuitive nature says she needs to trust but verify. However, her fear is realized when entering the room of Paul and Iris only to find Iris sleeping with Axew. Not wanting to sound a panic, Officer Jenny tells her Stoutland they're heading out, but to be quiet. The two protectors of peace bolt off into the night with a sense of fear in Officer Jenny's urgency. Meanwhile, back on the mountain, we pick up with our favorite bumbling trio, Jesse, James, and Meowth. The three look very run down, being driven like slaves, as they talk about Giovanni and his strange obsession with this place. They have been digging in these ruins ever since the boss lost to that brat in Chargestone Cave. James says this obsession is unhealthy, citing his experience with Jezebel and his parents, while Jesse is just over the manual labor. Sure, doing it for a chance of profit is one thing, but chasing ghosts is where she draws the line. However, Meow states they owe everything to the boss, so when he asks them to do something, they should do it. No questions asked. Just as Meowth finishes that sentence, James strikes something with a shovel. Under further inspection, he finds it's a box. Excitingly, James yelps, I think I've found it, as we pan out to see Giovanni walking toward them, and the sight becomes more clear when we see Team Rocket had been digging in what seems to be the ruins of some sort of shrine with an altar that depicts three mysterious entities atop of it. Over with Paul, he and Embor have been walking for a good while, far longer than Paul thought they should have been. But things have not gone unnoticed, as Paul says to himself, he should have seen some sort of Pokemon by now. Officer Jenny said the local wild ones have been overly aggressive, but nothing, just silence. That is, until a tremor can be felt under his feet. This cave that he is in seems to be close to the epicenter of the shockwave. Realizing the cave is falling in on itself, Paul and Embor dart off, looking for any opening they can find. Over with Officer Jenny, she finds herself on the path looking for the missing boy Paul, but there is no sign of him. Growing frustrated with the situation, Jenny begins to turn back, only to be met with a quake as a sight catches her eye. The top of reverse mountain has begun to spew with magma and smoke. Then it dawns on the officer. Paul has headed into the mountain. Knowing her sworn duty, Jenny and Statland make their way to the opening of the lava tomb. Back with Team Rocket, Giovanni arrives at the location of James to lay eyes on the prize that he has sought for so long. At last, the boss says. He bends down, laying his grimy fingers on the historic artifact. Giovanni begins to pull the box from the resting place, but is met with resistance. Failing to pull the box up from its burial site, the rocket leader orders James to dig it out. Out. Proceeding with his command, James widens the hole until the box is fully exposed, and once Giovanni pushes his subordinates out of the way as he wedges the box from its prison. Upon freeing the box, a rumble can be felt throughout the Cave of Ruins, as fissures begin to form at the upper center of the villains. Unshaken, Giovanni opens the box, only for a smile on his face to widen sadistically. This is where a very real problem comes into play, as magma begins to seep from the cracks that have formed on the walls and the floor of the cave. With panic in their voices, the trio urge the boss that they need to go, unless they want to become a permanent fixture in this place lost to time. 
It's here that Paul emerges from the cave they had been in, only to see the panicking trio and the magma flowing into the cavern slowly. However, before Paul can say anything, the black stone pulsates, showing Paul's images of that mirror that Giovanni is holding, and three Pokemon that Paul feels are familiar, but he has never seen before. This vision is quickly ended as the mirror begins to resonate with the black orb, seemingly awakening Gio from his blissful trance. The two lock eyes with Giovanni holding a special resentment for this particular trainer, while Paul sees what the former gym leader holds, and knows that whatever it is, Team Rocket can't leave here with it. Being the aggressor on this, Paul sends in Palpatode, telling it and Ambor to hold off the cronies, while he faces off against their leader with Electrovire. The electric Oni hits the field, sparking as Giovanni greets his opponent, with sarcasm in his voice. Looks like losing wasn't enough for you, was it boy? With confidence, Paul tells Giovanni his pathetic attempt at intimidation won't work. The leader is a hack, from a bygone era. Face it old man, you, much like that mirror, are a relic from a world that has been forgotten. It's time you stepped aside and stopped this useless search for power. These comments don't sit well with the boss, electing to forego any banter for a battle as he sends in one of his newest acquisitions, Golurk. The colossal doll slams into the ground with its massive weight, further threatening the stability of the surrounding footing. Paul wastes no time in activating the transformation of Electivire and the Black Orb. Now hulking with power, Paul's ace engages with Golurk as their trainers give commands, holding nothing back. Surprisingly, Electivire seems to be somewhat on the ropes, which is something that Paul notices. Giovanni sees this as well, urging his Pokemon to strike while the iron is hot. With the will of its trainer, Golurk brings its massive arm down in a hammering motion. Paul orders a counter that should be no problem for Electivire, but something is wrong. The Oni seems to be breathing heavily, taking a knee to absorb the blow. Then it happens. The transformation fails as Electivire and the Black Orb separate in mid-attack. This pleases Giovanni to no end. He knew this kid was all bluster and no substance. Paul can't understand why this has happened, calling to Electivire, but the Oni is down and things aren't looking good. The lava is flowing in and Paul's Pokemon seem to be on the losing end, but then he notices it. The Black Orb and the mirror that Geo holds. They seem to be in harmony with each other. I wonder, Paul thinks. However, he has little time to ponder this thought as another tremor rocks the cave and something bursts through the floor. This stops Golurk's attack on Electivire as a magma storm envelops the cave, striking all Pokemon in attendance. The legendary Pokemon of Lava Heatran has made itself known. Come to find out, it's not happy with these humans that have invaded its territory. Using its power, the Magma Mon awakens the sleeping giant that is Reversal Mountain. The bubbling cauldron that is the volcano begins to rumble to life as the realization that the cave they are in is actually a magma tube as lava begins to flow slowly, picking up speed. With both of our combatants having self-preservation in their best interests, Geo and Paul give orders to halt the battle. However, Boss Rocket hasn't forgotten the humiliating defeat Paul gave him in Charged Stone Cave. And as he escapes, Geo declares Paul will fall to him one day. However, this falls on deaf ears, as Paul has another concern. While Team Rocket was able to escape from the vantage point they had, our anti-hero has to deal with the threat at hand, the enraged heat ramp. At this point, it's all hands on deck. Paul beckons his trio of Pokemon to the aid of their trainer. Unfortunately, the Triad are feeling the battle they've had. Electivire, most of all. That mirror was very draining with its transformation. However, the three choose to push on, using their natural abilities to create barriers from the heat and lava for their trainer. Unfortunately, this is only a temporary relief, as they are still boxed in with Heatran slowly pushing its way towards them. Paul looks around for any signs of salvation. It is here that he notices a small lava flow that seems to be leaking through the wall. Knowing it's a gamble, Paul orders his Pokemon to stop the defense. It's time to attack. Paul orders Papato to use Hydro Pump on Heatran to push it back. He then turns his attention to the wall behind them. Enbor, Heat Crash, Electivire, Wild Charge. Caution to the wind, the battling duo throw all of their weight into their attacks. Unfortunately, they only manage to cause a crack in this obstruction. Electivire recoils from this, dropping to one knee. Paul knows this is all or nothing. Palpatode is losing ground, and his other two are at their limits. However, Enbor isn't giving up. It's fighting type showing its competitive spirit. This energizes its teammates, with Electivire pulling itself back up. With one final effort, the two girthy mons throw their weight with all of the elements of energy they have at this wall. Finally, Fortune smiles as the wall crumbles, revealing another cave that has a direct line to an exit. Unfortunately, both Embor and Electivire are spent, as Palpatode is also at its limits. Recalling his Pokemon, Paul bolts down the tunnel as Heatran fires a magma storm. Pushing with all his might, Paul is barely able to clear the cave as the opening erupts from the side of the top of the volcano, spewing boulders 
into the air, mimicking its master. However, Paul now has another problem as he slides down the side of Reversal Mountain at high speeds. Looking for the out, he is desperate for any type of save. Fortunately, it comes in the form of Officer Jenny and Stoutland as the loyal hound jumps, grabbing Paul by his collar just as he kisses the side of a cliff and his delayed demise. Paul seems unfazed, even at the scolding Officer Jenny gives him as they descend the mountain. He can't shake the feeling. He knows that the orb needs to be returned to the ruins that were in that cave, but the mirror that Giovanni now has in his possession makes him uneasy. Later at the Pokemon Center, after an apology to Jenny and another scolding from Joy for being reckless with his Pokemon, Paul is finally able to relax in his room. However, Iris is the last line of annoyance for him as she gives him the third degree about what happened. Paul decides to tell his unwanted traveling companion about the events that took place, choosing to admit the parts about Electivire's transformation failing and the multiple near-death experiences, so Iris will stop questioning everything. The young Dragon Master's last question is about the orb. She thought Paul was going to the mountain to return it, in which she does confirm. However, with the new development of Team Rocket, Paul feels it's best to take care of them so the orb can be safe once it's returned. Iris can see the logic in this line of thought, so relents her questioning, allowing the now exhausted Paul to finally do the one thing he's been wanting to do since he got back to the center, sleep. Unfortunately, this long-awaited slumber isn't a peaceful one. Paul is shown visions of an ancient war. The beings lay waste to what looks like ancient Unova, a force of lightning, wind, and earth, causing chaos wherever they go. At the center of it is another Pokemon Paul has never seen before, and the mirror that Giovanni has. Just when Paul thinks he's going to finally get some answers, the vision fades as Zekrom cries in what sounds like pain. Waking up in a terror sweat, Paul finds himself in bed with Axie and Iris fast asleep. Looking out the window, Paul can't help but wonder what path he is on, and if Ash is on one similar to it. The next morning, with Team Rocket no longer on the mountain, Jenny has opened up the route out of town since the volcano has become dormant once more. So Iris and Paul set off bound for their next place of adventure. The duo has quite the journey ahead of them. This is shown when the two arrive just outside their next stop, Undella Town. There is a power plant of some sort. Paul and Iris decide to stop and let their Pokemon stretch their legs. However, the power plant attracts the attention of both Electivire and Amoga, as it seems to lose power when a mild explosion happens. Paul wants to just ignore this and move on to Undella Town, but something is calling Iris to this place. She can't put her finger on it, but she knows she needs to be there, and points out to Paul that she took his word for it when he said he had to do something. This triggers the young man to agree to accompany her much to his displeasure. Fortunately, this adventure isn't one in vain. It turns out that this is a substation, and is unmanned for the most part. What our heroes find inside is a damage that would signal some sort of battle that has been taking place. Luckily, the two don't have to wait long as they find none other than Jesse, James, and Meowth in the process of trying to catch a Dragonite. However, Giovanni isn't here. It seems that this is one of the trio's harebrained schemes that they think will be worth the effort. This does little to subdue the wrath of Paul as he sends in Palpatode to make quick work of the trio. This just leaves Dragonite, who seems very angry with anything that is not a Pokemon, going as far to attack Iris when she tries to get in close. This is where Axew jumps in, trying to stand up for the honor of its trainer, but Dragonite isn't having it. Striking with a Thunder Punch, Axew dodges, forcing Dragonite to hit a power console that gets overcharged, and explodes in the process. Dragonite is caught in the blast, swallowed by fire and electricity. In order to reduce the damage possible, Paul orders Palpatode to use its water and ground typing to fight off any fires that happen. This allows Iris to make her way to Dragonite. Even though the fire rages and it seems to be hurt, Dragonite still has a stubborn streak about it, refusing any help that Iris offers. Even when a piece of roof collapses in the stress of the fire, it still refuses help. Larian at Axew for offering assistance with a Dragon Rage. Unfortunately, this ends in the most obvious result, with Dragonite fainting due to its fatigue. With no other choice or ability to move the Fallen Dragon, Iris throws a Pokeball, knowing that she can't leave it here. Luckily, there isn't much resistance, with the Pokeball capturing the powerful beast. With little time left, Iris and Paul collect their Pokemon, barely escaping the burning building as the rest of it crumbles under its own weight. Paul wishes he could have gotten more info out of the dim-witted trio, but he's going to have to settle for what's happening now. It's here that Paul urges Iris for them to move on to Andela Town. A few hours later, Paul and Iris find themselves enjoying a meal at the center, awaiting a call to pick up their Pokemon. While Paul is deep in thought about the events of the last week, Iris can't seem to shut up about her excitement of catching a dragon type that is as strong as Dragonite. She finally feels like she's on her way to becoming a Dragon Master. Her relentless babble is edging on Paul's nerves, preventing him from piecing together the mental puzzle he's entranced in. This causes him to snap at Iris, saying she's only caught Dragonite because it couldn't fight back. It's 
it's not like she actually battled it and caught it. Team Rocket did most of the work. This strikes Iris. She wasn't expecting an outburst like that from Paul. Normally, he's quiet and reserved. Curious about this behavior, Iris wants to ask if he's alright. But before she can get another word out, Paul stands, telling her that he's going for a walk so he can think in peace. Turning, Paul walks off from the table, leaving Iris in silence. It's here that Nurse Joy calls over the intercom for Iris to come pick up her Pokemon. Now frustrated, Iris is intent on showing Paul that he doesn't know what he's talking about. So she gathers her Pokeballs and heads just outside of the Pokemon Center, where she has plenty of space. With a deep breath and a wish of luck to herself, Iris readies the ball of her newest Mon. Dragonite, come out, she yells. However, Iris's optimism is replaced by a slight hint of fear when Dragonite shows nothing but aggression to the aspiring Dragon Master. No matter what she does, Dragonite will not obey Iris's commands. It's to the point that the fear has been replaced with frustration, as Iris has a very childish outburst at Dragonite. However, her yelling is interrupted by a comment from an onlooker. Iris didn't know she had. It looks like you're having trouble there. Perhaps I can be of some help. And that is where we're going to leave things for right now. Now that you guys have seen this part, tell me, how do you feel about the battle that Paul had in Reversal Mountain? What is the connection between the black orb and the mirror that Giovanni was holding? And of course, who was that voice that was calling out to Iris, offering assistance with Dragonite? Let me know in the comments down below. We begin today's episode in the final moments of Ash's 7th Gym Badge. Across from him stands the leader of the Iceris Gym, Bryson, and his ace, Baratic. The Ice Fu Master is confident, having just taken out two of Ash's Pokemon, Pikachu and Boldor. There is only one choice left for our young hero, as he ponders his options. Infernape is the obvious choice, a definite win. Then there's Crocodile, who has the power but refuses to listen, which is something Ash is going to have to figure out eventually. Then there's the other members of his team. While they are strong, most of them don't really feel right here. However, there is one. Not wanting an easy win, Ash digs in. Whirlipede. I choose you. The rolling insect hits the field, ready for its first battle in a long while. Well, Ash, an unusual choice for sure, Bryson states. I didn't want to make it easy, our young hero responds. I hope it's a challenge, because me and Beardick won't just roll over. Oh, you'll get a challenge. Whirlipede. Roll out. The bug begins to spin, but try as it might, it seems to have stalled on the ice. With Beartic barreling down on his last Pokemon, Ash calls for one last move. Whirlipede. Use defense curl. Stiffing it up, the bug tightens every part of its body. This act is finished in the nick of time as Beartic crashes down with an aerial lace to hit for super effective damage. This is followed by an ice punch to keep on the pressure. This forces Ash and his insect to remain defensive with the curls as a barrage of aerial laces and Ice Punch connect, pushing Whirlipede's endurance to its limits. Ash does nothing except tell his bug to stay strong. Their moment is coming. Heeding its trainer's command, Whirlipede remains steadfast in its resolve. Just when all seems lost, Ash makes the call. Use Rollout! Spinning with all of its might, the tire bug strikes Beartic in the gut, rolling over it and leaving a cartoonish set of tread marks across the polar bear's face. This takes Bryson by surprise as he questions how that's even possible. Then he notices it. Beartic was causing damage to the bug, but the force it was using was breaking the ice covering the gym floor, exposing the dearth beneath it. This gave Whirlipede the traction it finally needed to strike back. This revelation comes a little bit too late, as Whirlipede is now above Beartic with the trajectory changing. With its full weight behind it, Ash's poison tread spins rapidly downward. Unable to dodge, Beardick throws an ice punch at the command of its trainer. This is our final clash. The rollout is supercharged with the defense curls, the weight behind it, and the fact that it's on a second pass. It comes down to whose resolve is greater, the Unovan movie star or the Kanto native. The struggle is epic, neither side giving an inch. However, this cannot last, and both trainers know it. In an attempt to take the win, Bryson calls for an icicle crash. Charging its second attack with its free hand, Beartic prepares to close this match. Ash and World Whirlipede have no choice. This is all or nothing. Push, Ash yells. The bug puts everything it has into the rolling motion that is being blocked by the ice punch. Then something unexpected happens. The friction between the two takes effect as the contact point begins to heat up. 
Just as Beartic prepares to launch its second attack, the heat causes a flinch. With all of its might, Whirlpeed breaks the defense of Beartic to connect with its head, dropping the Goliath in one motion. With a ground shaking thud, the match ends with Ash being declared the winner. Bryson is a bit disappointed, but he obeys the league rules, presenting Ash with the freeze badge. Happy with the accomplishment of his team, Ash takes his leave from the gym. That night at the Pokemon Center, Ash lays in bed, looking at his latest prize. Just one more, he thinks. Their next stop is Opelousid City. Ash can barely contain his excitement. Less than a year ago, he was in the top four of the Sinnoh League, and here he is again on the cusp of another challenge. We're almost there, buddy, Ash says to his partner. The electric mouse replies with a simple Pika. As the two fade off to sleep. This is where Ash finds out his travel plans are going to be altered a bit, as the white stone begins to resonate with him. Visions begin to flash in Ash's mind. The stone is showing him visions of a path that leads north of Isira City. It's not to Lucid City, but to old ruins that are oddly white, maybe made of marble. And then Reshiram appears above the ruins before the dream ends, with Ash waking up in a sweat. Ash questions what that experience was. He looks out the window of his room. The moon crests the mountain with a slight twinkle. There, Ash thinks. That's where I need to go. The next morning, Pikachu and Ash are on the road bright and early. They have a lot of ground to cover, and little time to do it in. As our hero reaches high noon, he sees something off in the distance. As he approaches, this figure comes into view. Before him, a tower surrounded by water. Wow, I wonder what this is, Ash thinks. But almost to say this isn't the place, the white orb pulsates to keep Ash moving. However, he can't shake the feeling that this won't be the last time he sees this place. As the sun begins to crest the mountains, Ash finally arrives at what he thinks is the place he needs to be. It seems this way because the white orb is beginning to calm. Ash wants to continue up the mountain path ahead, but the trail is very narrow, so he and Pikachu just make camp at the base, determined to finish their path in the morning. After getting a fire going, Ash decides to let out his Pokemon. All seem to be in good spirits, except for Crocodile. Once dinner is ready, Ash dishes up a meal for each one of them. They all gather around and share happiness in this moment, that is, except for Crocodile. Ash sees the Desert Gator is keeping away from the group. The naive boy sees this as it just trying to act tough, something he's had a lot of experience with before as he reminisces about Charizard and Sceptile. So to break the awkwardness of the situation, situation, Ash tries to take it a meal. Addressing the croc by its name, Ash tells it there's no reason for them to be at odds. They're all on the same side. I know you're strong, Crocodile, but you are very aggressive. That's not a bad thing, but if you don't learn to control that power, then you could really hurt someone. The dark type listens to Ash give this little speech, with him seemingly unaware that it is slowly closing the gap of striking distance between the two. It doesn't like the fact that it is second best to this human and its other slaves, so it intends to rectify the situation. The croc begins to glow in a dark aura that Ash seems to be oblivious to. With its very desire seemingly in its grasp, Crocodile prepares to attack. As its jaws begin to clamp down on the oblivious boy, it is met with the fist of Infernape that knocks it into the tree beside it. This shocks Ash back to the reality of the situation. With Infernape basically threatening the croc, it meekly retreats knowing it's lost its chance. With Infernape around, Crocodile will forever be the prisoner of this sickening group. Ash stands in stunned silence. This is the first time he's felt fear of this magnitude in his life. Crocodile just tried to end him, and he's unsure on how to respond besides recalling it to prevent any further instances. Thank you, Infernape, Ash says with a stutter. The fire chimp nods. It will always have Ash's back. The two return to their meal with even more tension than before the start of it. Though the others appear to all continue on eating and laughing, Ash is silent, thinking about the exchange with his Unovan crocodile. The rest of the night passes pretty uneventful. That is, until just before dawn, a thunder can be heard in the distance that awakens Ash and his Pokemon. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, Ash vision struggles to focus as a chopper flies above. It flies in the direction that Ash has to head. Knowing this can't be a coincidence, Ash quickly changes and recalls his Pokemon. Pikachu, let's go. The two take off, heading up the trail, fading out of view. By the point the two had caught up with the chopper, the sun has begun to peek over the top of the mountains. Ash and Pikachu stealthily work their way around in view of their prey. On the broad side of the helicopter is a logo that Ash vaguely remembers, but he can't quite place it. That is, until a person steps out of the machine, or should I say, is pushed. It's N, and he 
has his hands bound. Ash and Pikachu want to save their friends, but Ash stops it, telling the mouse to wait. They don't know who or what is going on. Fortunately, they don't have to wait long as a man who is addressed as Colorus emerges from the chopper. It's here that Ash recalls what that symbol is. Team Plasma. He remembers that N told them not to trust them, and he can finally see why. The boy focuses, listening in on the conversation. It's Colorus demanding to know if this is the place. However, N remains silent, refusing to say anything. You know, we have ways of making you talk. Ways that are very persuasive, Culver's responds, but they are not methods I prefer. However, N doesn't budge, refusing to make a peep. With a sigh, Culver's tells the grunts to bring forth the machine. While this is happening, Ash breaks eye contact with the group to devise a plan. Ash releases Infernape, Whirlipede, Snivy, and Duwat to explain the plan. What follows is actually a very well executed strategy that Ash and his Pokemon take their time with, slowly, one by one, taking out the guards surrounding the site to eliminate any reinforcements. This allows the young trainer to sneak in with all of his Pokemon, taking any of their remaining forces by surprise so that Ash and Pikachu can confront Culrus. It's over, Ash yells as Pikachu sparks, release in. At this command, Culrus simply smirks, seemingly unburdened by this threat. Ash doesn't like this. Why is he acting like he's the one in control? This thought is interrupted by N finally speaking, only to yell at Ash to get away before it's too late. But I'm afraid it is too late, Colorus says with a sadistic smile. The scientist hits a switch on a console before him that begins to shoot red energy beams from it. The targets happen to be Ash and his Pokemon, but nothing happens. Ash, unamused by this failed attempt, orders Pikachu to hit the machine with a thunderbolt. However, this command is met with silence. Ash gives another command, but again, nothing. The boy is beginning to get frustrated when Ash asks if Pikachu can hear him. This is where the mouse turns to face its trainer, but Ash is met with something unexpected. Pikachu sparks like it intends to attack its trainer. Ash tries to talk it down, even ordering Snivy and Duwat and Infernape to smash the console, but these commands are met with looks of anger toward the trainer. Confused, Ash demands to know what is going on with his Pokemon, only to be met with the maniacal laughter from Colrus. He gives the orders for Ash's Pokemon to free him and the other Plasma Grunch, to which they obey without hesitation, much to the shock of Ash and the fear of N. You know, if you had simply stayed away, then you wouldn't be in this predicament, Colorus says. What do you mean, our hero responds? Well, it's simple. This device before you has only one purpose. It blocks out the logic of these wild beasts and turns even the most obedient Pokemon into a semi-feral monster who only obeys me. Ash refuses to believe this, pleading with Pikachu and the others to remember who he is and all of the adventures they have been on, but their expressions remain the same, anger behind their eyes, ready to snap at a moment's notice. It is here that Colorus demands the grunts search the boy. After all, he has what they came here for. Ash isn't willing to go quietly, punching and kicking each grunt that approaches him. While his effort is valiant, it's ultimately futile, as there's far too many grunts for him to fight. This lands him at the feet of Infernape, as one of the grunts tackles him to the ground as he tries to sprint away. With the boy now subdued, they begin to search his person with little effect, only to move to his bag at the behest of Colorus, who is now becoming impatient. But Quickly, the search bears fruits as the prize that Colorus sought is pulled from the bag, the white stone. With a smile, Colorus demands the grunt hand it over. Stepping forward, Colorus reaches out for the stone, only to be shoved aside by N as he barely begun to clutch it in his hands. This forces the plasma scientist to drop the sleeping dragon, the orb rolling to the feet of Infernape. This triggers a reaction. The orb glows brightly as it and Fernape begin their union, only for the fire starter to emerge with an attack. However, this isn't aimed at Ash, but the grunt who is holding him hostage. And Fernape, are you normal? Ash says, looking into its eyes. With a swirl of flames, the monkey nods. Good, our hero says. Then we need to free our friends. Colrus, very displeased with these results, as it is exactly what he was trying to avoid, orders all of Ash's Pokemon to attack. Bring him the orb. Without hesitation, they all pounce on their former master. Infernape, stop them, but don't hurt them, Ash yells. The Super Simeon engages with its teammates, holding back as its power is now that of a legendary Pokemon. Ash makes the call, the two of them synchronizing as the battle drags on. This causes something the two have never experienced to happen. Ash and Infernape can hear each other's thoughts and see what each other sees. The best way to explain it is like having literal eyes in the back of their head. This is amazing, Ash thinks, to which, for once, he actually can understand Infernape 
Carnape's thoughts as they become one. This unlocks a new level of power that allows the two to quickly subdue its teammates with little effort, much to Ash's relief and Colorus's irritation. Even N is impressed. He never thought that something like this would happen. Everything seems to be wrapping up in a positive way for our hero, as the plasma grunts have begun to fall back due to the lack of confidence in their leader. However, Colorus, though annoyed, is still calm, simply ordering a command. Drop the asset. Suddenly, a large shadow covers the surrounding area. Looking up, both Ash and Infernape can see a very familiar sight, something that you wouldn't forget if you ever saw it. A boat in the sky. Before Ash can respond, the ship opens its belly, only for a giant containment unit to fall to the ground below. The crash is so intense, a cloud of dust is left in its wake. Wanting to get this over with, Ash orders Infernape to use a flamethrower to clear the area. Once they can finally see, they are met with a smirk from the white-coated man as a force field on a unit is let down. Once the beast inside comes into view, the new synergy that Ash and Infernape have triggers something. Suddenly, Ash and his fire monkey find themselves in a mental scape, to where they are greeted by the the white dragon of truths, Reshiram. This is actually the first time Ash is seeing this creature in its true form. While the three say nothing, a world of information floods into Ash. It's here he understands what the dragon before him is, but not its purpose as they are ripped from their mental scape before Ash can decipher all the thoughts of Reshiram. He comes back to the current time as the dragon who Ash greets as Kiram steps off the platform at the command of Colorus. So you know its name? Reshiram must have told you. Well, no matter. This is the master of the dragon that you have, boy. The power that you and Infernape have is only borrowed. Kiram is the only one in existence who can truly use that power. So I'm going to give you a chance. Hand it over the white stone and you can leave in peace. This triggers a response from N, who tells Ash that he can't hand it over, or the region, no, the world, will be in danger. Unfortunately, N's plea is met with the foot to the gut, as Colorus says that he's not part of this conversation, so stay out of it. So Ash, what will it be? There's a moment of silence that Colorus feels is in his favor, until Ash finally speaks. You know, Reshiram told us two things. One, the name of this dragon. And two, for any reason, not to let the White Stone fall into the hands of anyone besides me. So I'm going to tell you, Colorus, leave this place, or Infernape and me are going to end your dragon where it stands. This isn't the response Colorus was hoping for. Why, oh why, do they always want to do it the hard way? Well, Ash, have it your way. Just remember, I gave you a way out. Kiram, attack! With the flip of a switch on his console, the once docile ice dragon turns rabid as it attacks with the faculties of a mindless beast. Infernape, let's show them, Ash yells. Swelling in an inferno of power, the two have realized their ultimate potential of this form when Infernape's blaze activates. Attack, Ash screams at the top of his lungs. In a flash, the starter counters the legend and dropping it with the fusion flare. That's it. Way to go, Ash yells. However, Ash notices something that Colorus doesn't seem to be too phased by this result, to which he simply demands that Kiram stand back up. With its dull yellow eyes, the beast shifts to its feet once again, simply attacking. Infernape! Fusion Flare, Ash commands. Putting everything it has into this, the monkey charges forward, aiming to end this altercation with its next assault. With the heat melting the ground beneath it, Infernape and Ash are confident. However, this is quickly changed when Kiram strikes with an ice move that is so cold it sucks the air out of the surrounding area. And do you know what can't burn without air? Fire. This causes the flames around Infernape to wither and die before it can make contact. Then, to add insult to injury, Colorus finally gives the beast another command. Glaciate. Spiking from the surrounding area, pillars of ice trap the subdued fire type in a prison. All it can do is wail as Kiram begins charging the brightest dragon pulse Ash has ever seen. He begins to beg Colorus to stop this. Don't hurt his Pokemon. I'm sorry, Ash. You made your choice. Now, you must deal with the consequences of your actions. Finish it. In a flash, the area is swallowed by light. When things finally calm down, a crater is left in the surrounding area, as the helicopter and the trees around them have been leveled. Strewn around the battlefield, Ash and his Pokemon lay about, victims of the carnage. Ash begins to stir. As his vision begins to focus, he can see Infernape now lies battered and beaten before him, the white stone laying beside it. Ash begs for it or any of his Pokemon to wake up. They need to stop this monster, but nothing. It's dead silence, for all except the heavy breathing of Kirim. Colorus steps towards Infernape. You see, Ash, your mistake was you're too naive. 
You went into this battle overconfident, cocky, thinking there was no way you could lose. That was your ultimate downfall. Ash watches as Colorus nears what he seeks. Desperation is the only thought in his head. He needs to do something, anything. Then it hits him. He has one Pokemon left. With what strength he can muster, Ash pulls out his last Pokeball from his belt. Go, he yells. From it, Crocodile emerges, creating one last barrier for Colrus. The Plasma Leader stops. A bit surprised, Ash was holding this back. The Desert Croc eyes this human up and down, then the Ice Dragon behind him. It takes in the whole scene. All of Ash's Pokemon are down, and Ash, well, he's telling Crocodile that it needs to take the White Stone away. That man cannot have it. Beginning to clue in on what's happening, the Tard type looks to his feet. There sits the stone Ash speaks of. Picking it up, Crocodile eyes Infernape in its weak, empathetic state. Then a thought crosses its mind. Looking at the man and his slave, the croc knows when it's in a fight, it can't win. So it simply throws the stone at the man's feet. Then with a look at Ash, it tunnels away into the ground below, almost to say, screw you human. Ash watches in shock as Colorus picks up the stone, merely turning without a word. In a flash, Ash and his team, now of five members, are left on the side of a mountain, broken physically, mentally, and emotionally. And that, my friends, is where we're going to leave this part for right now. So, with part two of season two out of the way, I have some questions. What was Reshram trying to tell Ash? Why did Crocodile betray its trainer then disappear? And what is the plan that Colrus has for the White Stone? Let me know in the comments down below. We begin today's part with Paul, as he is in the Pokemon Center of Vandala Town. With Iris mad at him because of what he said, the Stoic Boy is assessing his options to where they go next. The battle he had with Giovanni keeps replaying in his head. They now have that mirror, which can negate the effects of Electivire's transformation. Paul had to assume that it would have the same effect on Infernape as well. This is a very trying set of events that for once has the boy unsure of his next move. This is when a very familiar voice from the past greets Paul, catching him by surprise. Cynthia, what are you doing here? Hey Paul, so you came to Unova, did you? Are you competing in the Unova League? I am, he says, revealing his badges. Well, you've made some great progress. If Ash were here, I'm sure he'd be hot on your heels to catch up. Well, he actually is here in Unova. We were traveling together until recently but we will be meeting up in Opelucid City. It seems you two have been busy. I'm glad to see you're still growing. Thanks, Paul says. If I may ask, what brings you to Undella Town? Oh, I have a vacation home here, and one of my former rivals, Caitlin of the Unova Elite Four, is hosting a tournament here, and I was asked to help co-host. You should join, Cynthia says. This intrigues Paul. He was wondering what his next move would be, but a place to get some good training is exactly what he needs before he challenges the next gym and confronts Team Rocket. Without hesitation, Paul asks where the registration is. Over with Iris, her frustration with the situation of her travel companion melts away when she sees the person that is talking to her. Wait, you're Claire, the leader of the Blackthorn City Gym, the Dragon Master of Johto. Iris immediately begins to fangirl over this encounter as she has been one of her idols since she was a little girl. This makes Claire a bit bashful, saying that she didn't know she was this well known outside of Johto, while Dragonite's view changes from outrage to bewilderment. This is the trainer it let capture him. What an embarrassment. As the dragon type watches, Claire says she notices that Iris was having trouble with her dragon so she was wondering if she could be of some assistance. This gets Iris's attention, as she says she would love some pointers from a great trainer like her, causing Claire to blush a bit more. Iris then goes into full explanation of the situation and the events leading up to it. After hearing the entire story and the fact that Team Rocket was involved, Claire says she may have a solution to help point Iris in the right direction when it comes to training dragon types, but they have to go find a friend of hers, as they are here for an event that is happening in Undella Town over the weekend. Iris is eager to learn anything from a trainer like Claire, so at the request of the Dragon Master, Iris recalls Dragonite and they head back inside the Pokemon Center looking for this friend of Claire's. Once inside, it doesn't take long for Iris and Claire to find this friend, a very well known regional champion, and it just so happens that she is with the person that Iris is most frustrated with. However, this isn't enough to detour her from the fangirl pandemic that Iris has been struck with. Immediately, she interjects into the conversation of Paul and Cynthia. The Sinochamp is a bit thrown off by this for a moment, until Paul and Claire speak up. While this is a first for Iris, 
Paul knows both of these legendary trainers as he has battled them both once before. Claire hasn't forgotten Paul, as his battle style is one of dominance, and the loss she had to him was one of the most decisive losses she's ever had. So, Paul, you've come to Unova as well. I have, he says, and I aim to take the Unova into championship. With a smile, Claire says if anyone she's battled could, he would be the one to do it. But that's a far way away, Cynthia says. Let's focus on the here and now. The World Junior Tournament. It starts tomorrow, and I think both of you should enter. Claire seconds this, telling Iris she should enter with Dragonite. To the Dragon Master, it seems that Iris' newest capture is a bit too stubborn to get through in the normal setting, so some high-level battles could be just the way to get you guys on the same page. Iris thinks about this for a second, while Paul doesn't hesitate. He plans on entering this event, as he needs to master a certain transformation. This eagerness is something that's new to both Cynthia and Claire. It looks like Ash has rubbed off on Paul, Cynthia thinks with a brief smirk. This moment of pride is interrupted by a very snarky yet agitated comment. It figures you would be here. Paul turns to see someone he forgot was even a trainer. Trip. Oh, it's you, Iris says very nervously as Paul and Trip have a stare down to see who is the more stoic of the two. Paul. Iris. Who is your friend, Claire asks. Bold assumption, Paul says. Yeah, Trip retorts. There's no way we would be friends as he balls his fists. Whoa. Calm down, Iris says. There's no need to get physical. Oh, I'm going to beat you, Trip says but it'll be on the battlefield. Paul says nothing, only watching as Trip walks away. Well, he's a ray of sunshine, Cynthia says. What is his problem with Paul? Oh, he's had an issue with him ever since they got to Unova. Paul was there when Trip got his first Pokemon, and since then, they have been unofficial rivals. Oh, another Ash, is it, Paul? No, he responds. Ash pushed me as a trainer. Trip isn't even on my radar. Well, I can see that, Claire says, but back to the matter at hand. Paul. Iris, you two need to get registered for the tournament. Head to the main counter. Nurse Joy will help you with that. Heading at the direction of their elders, our two heroes enter the registration. As they walk off, an old friend of Cynthia approaches to greet the Sinnoh champ. Later that night, we find Paul at the transfer area of the Pokemon Center. He's by the phone with Reggie to trade out one of his Pokemon. The rules of the tournament says he can enter up to three different Pokemon. While he has two of them with him, Paul needs one more to complete a strategy. Reggie asks how things are going, to which Paul is unusually chatty. For the first time in a long time, the two have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation that is about more than just what Pokemon Paul needs this time. Meanwhile, outside on the battlefield, Iris is getting ready with some last-minute training with Livani, Emolga, and her Excadrill, who is still a bit difficult. While Iris doesn't tend to use Dragonite in the tournament, her thought is that maybe she could reach Excadrill. They used to battle so well together, but ever since that moment... But she can't think about that. Let's focus on now, as Iris and her Pokemon begin their training by Moonlight. The next morning, Paul and Iris arrive at the Undella Battle Hall. This place is packed to the brim with spectators, waiting for the action to begin. Our two heroes can see Claire above the crowd, in a viewing box looking on with a man that Paul knows all too well, Alder the current champion of the Unova region. The stoic man looks like he is awaiting something. As he has Paul's attention, the crowd begins to let out a loud round of cheers that is triggered when the starting ceremonies get underway. Cynthia and the girl that they met at the Pokemon Center have taken opposite sides of the battlefield. This is where Iris clues in that this is an exhibition match, who then urges Paul that they need to find a seat. Begrudgingly, the boy breaks eye contact with Alder and moves in the direction that Iris is shoving him. This is where Paul stops briefly to catch Trip looking up at the Unovan champion. The boy knows nothing else around him, from the cheering crowd to Cynthia and Caitlin on the battlefield. It might as well just be Trip and Alder here. However, Iris breaks Paul's gaze, once more telling him to get his heads out of the clouds. They have to find a seat or they will be forced to stand. Saying nothing, Paul just proceeds up into the stands. Luckily, they are able to find some seats that are pretty close to the action to which Iris can fangirl over one of her idols. With the announcer commanding the silence of the crowd, he then announces the first of two exhibition matches, the first being Cynthia and Caitlyn. With the announcement to start, Cynthia sends in her most trusted and oldest Pokemon, Garchomp, while Caitlyn decides to go with her ace, the psychic type, Gothitelle. Both Pokemon hit the field with an intensity that can be felt all the way up in the nosebleeds. This is the type of high level pressure that comes from these caliber of trainers. With the command to start, the champion and elite Pokemon begin exchanging blows. Iris is in awe, seeing Cynthia of all people battling in front of her. Living in the Unova region her whole life, the best she could ever have hoped for is to watch a match live on TV. However, her excitement is quickly dashed when she notices Paul not even really paying attention. It seems he's surveying the crowd, but for what? 
Iris can't seem to figure out. Hey, you're not excited, she exclaims, to which Paul answers there's no need to be. I've been part of it before. This angers Iris, as she demands to know what Paul means by that response. This is where Paul talks about his time in the Sinner region and the battle he had with Cynthia. She used her Garchomp in a 6 on 6 battle with me, and even Torterra, my oldest and strongest Pokemon, wasn't a threat. She leveled my whole team with just one Pokemon. Wow, Cynthia is really that strong? Iris questions. She is, Paul responds. This Caitlyn is lucky. If this wasn't an exhibition match, then Cynthia would have leveled her in that pathetic excuse for a psychic type. Normally, that type of comment would anger Iris, as it seems like Paul is putting down a member of the Elite Four. But she's known him long enough to know that he's only speaking the truth, leaving the aspiring young Dragon Master to wonder, just how strong is Cynthia? But before she could find out, the match is called when the timer goes off. The crowd cheers for more action. The battle really got them going. Luckily, they won't have to wait long as the next exhibition is called for Claire and Alder. As those two take the battlefield, Paul scans the crowd. Trip, he's already seen, who seems to be fixated on this battle. But there's another familiar face in the crowd as well. Stefan, the rival that battled Ash back at the club explosion event. He might be a good challenge. However, that seems to be all that's catch the eye of our hero. That is, until he notices a strange kid in his Riolu sitting in the front row that give off the same goopy vibe that Ash does. This causes Paul to think briefly about his friend, and this brings a slight smile to his face. But this is quickly ended when the match of Claire and Alder is called, leaving the crowd in amazement. Now that these two matches have taken place, it is time to start the first round of the Junior World Cup. On the screen above everyone, the pairings are randomized. As the pairings are decided, there are two faces on the screen that immediately catches Paul's eyes. The person that he is battling in the first round is a former opponent, one of the gym leaders of the Striton Gym, Silen, and the other is a former traveling companion of Ash, the aspiring coordinator, Dawn. She is a few brackets over from him, leaving Paul to wonder out of all places. Why is she here? However, he doesn't have time to wonder as the first round, which he is part of, has been called. Iris urges his Paul to hurry. There's no time for daydreaming. The young trainer takes off running, thinking to himself, he's starting to turn into Ash. Luckily, it doesn't take long before Paul makes it to his side of the battlefield, catching eye contact with the gym leader. Paul says it's been a while and asks what Silent is doing this far from his gym. The young connoisseur reveals that this is partially Paul's fault. That battle he had with Paul and Ash made him reevaluate things. Now he is on his own journey to get stronger like Paul. This quest led him to this tournament, and Silent doesn't plan for their battle to have the same outcome as last time. Smiling, Paul says that they will see about that. On the other side of the battle area is the judge stand. Here sits Outer, Claire, Cynthia, and Caitlin. They all have front row seats to see the next champion of the Junior Cup. Alder and Cynthia are in talks with the other judges about the odds on favorite to win. While all can agree that there are a lot of talent here, the one person that has the attention of everyone is Paul. Alder comments that he battled the boy a few months back, and it seems that he has grown. Cynthia seconds this as the trainer that stands before them isn't the same one that she battled two years ago, but they all have to silence their criticisms as the choices have been made for the first round. As they hear the calls, Simi Sage, go! Kafagrigius, stand by for battle! Taking center stage, both Pokemon await their trainer's orders. Paul takes the start, calling for a destiny bond. However, Silent isn't going to let their fate in this battle be tied to one another, ordering for a dig to avoid the attack. With what he believes is their advantage, Silent uses this momentum, telling his monkey to surface and complete the attack. The ground begins to crack as the chimp breaks through, connecting with a pretty serious blow. This brings a smile to the green-haired boy's face, only for it to disappear as quickly as it came when Paul's true battle style comes into play as he takes control with the Will-O-Wisp. The ghostly flames envelop Simi Sage, inflicting it with an otherworldly burn. This is a problem. Simi Sage is a physical attacker, and now with that burn, it will cut the stat in half and slowly chip away at the jungle monkey's health. Knowing they needed to hit hard for a second time, Silent calls for a rock slide. This is countered with an iron defense. Paul is slowly taking control of this battle, playing to the strengths of his ghastly tank, while Silent can do nothing but attempting to stack the damage. Unfortunately, the condition of Simi Sage is something called into questioned by Paul when he realizes things seem a little off. He questions Silen on a hunch that he has. So did you just evolve Simi Sage? Uh yeah, I did. We came across a leaf stone and due to our mutual resolve to get stronger, we both decided to use it. Paul smirks. Then you thought it would be a good idea to enter this tournament and test your new power. That's right, Silent confirms. Just wait and see what we got in store for you. However, Paul quickly counters this. You should forfeit, he says. 
catching Silen off guard. What? Why? This is where the more callous side of Paul emerges. Look at your Pokemon. It won't make it, Paul says. Silen looks the chimp over, only to notice something he hasn't seen until Paul pointed it out. Simi Sage is breathing really heavily, but the gym leader doesn't understand why. Let me guess. It's only been a day or two since you evolved? Yeah, it was yesterday, Silen says. Paul looks deep into the boy's eyes. That is why you will lose this battle. Silent asked Paul to elaborate on this, as, from his point of view, things could go either way. So why say, I've already lost? It's simple. Conditioning. Your Pokemon has not had the time to get used to its new body. You don't exactly strike me as the type that has an intense training regimen, Paul says. And from what I remember, your Pan Sage was less than impressive. Then, you went and involved it without allowing it time to get used to this new body. Look at Simi Sage. It's breathing hard. That burn it has is taking its strength faster than it normally would. Silen takes a moment to look it over, only to realize that Paul is right, though his stubborn monkey doesn't seem to think so. However, Paul hits it with some hard truth. You are a powerful Pokemon. Me and Kafagrigus acknowledge that, but you need to know when to accept defeat, or you could hurt yourself. Looking back at its trainer, Simi Sage sees the truth in these words. With its trainer's support, both concede the battle. While this is a very lackluster performance to the crowd, who is a bit disappointed, Cynthia and Don watch on and all, both thinking the same thing. This Paul isn't the same one that competed in the Sinnoh League. He has grown up so much, they think, as they watch Paul offer a handshake to Silent, telling him and Simi Sage that when it has gotten used to its new power, they will battle again. With that, Paul leaves the battle area, heading back to the locker room. It is here he is greeted with Dawn. Hey Paul, it's been a while, she says. It has. I'm glad to see you've grown, he responds. So what brings you to Unova? I actually came here with Cynthia, so I thought I would see what Unova was made of, Dawn responds. Well, I can say that it's far different than Sinnoh, but not in a bad way. I can see that, the coordinator says to Paul. By the way, what you did out there was a nice thing. You didn't want to hurt that Pokemon. Oh, that was nothing. I just didn't want to waste my time battling somebody that would lose. Sure, Don says. Well, either way, it was a nice thing. Paul tries to answer Don, but is cut off by Iris and the reaction of the locker room. They are gasping over what they are seeing on the screen of the TV. Curious. Paul and Don go to see what all the commotion is about. What they find is Trip on the screen, who has been declared the winner. However, the picture before them is rather R-rated. The Pokemon he used was his Conkeldor, and on its knuckles is something red, while the faces of all the judge watch in horror as the boy leaves the battlefield, while his opponent, a young boy, cries at the possibility of this potentially fatal encounter. And this is where we are going to leave things for now. So tell me, did you guys like this one? How did you feel about Paul's battle with Silent and the way it ended? What exactly did Trip and his Conkeldor do to their opponent? And what does this mean for the rest of the tournament? Let me know in the comments down below. We pick up moments after the violent display that was seen on the monitors in the locker room of the Junior World Tournament. Don, Iris, and Paul all watch on in horror as both Trip and his Conk Eldor walk into the lounge area. A silence befalls the room as Trip looks with a smile on his face. What? Are you guys scared? This tournament is single elimination, the boy says. So, it's either going to be me or you. And I got news for you. It won't be me. Iris is the first to speak, telling Trip that what he did went way too far. How could he order his Pokemon to hurt another one like that? But Trip stands firm telling the aspiring dragon master that his pokemon are strong and strength alone will be what wins this competition so i won't be holding anything back the smug boy says as he eyes down paul paul begins to say something when a tournament official interrupts telling trip that he needs to come with them both the tournament community and alder would like to have a word with you with the shrug trip recalls his fighting type and follows the official out of the room. What was his problem, Don asks. That's Trip. He's had a bit of a chip on his shoulder since Ash and Paul came to Unova. Wait, Ash is with you guys? Don inquires. No, Paul says. He's on his own journey right now, but we're supposed to meet up in a few weeks in Absolute City. Oh well, I hope he's doing all right. But anyways, Paul, how have you been? I was good up until now. Yeah, that kid is a little extreme, Don says. But Paul doesn't answer, leaving both Don and Iris to have a conversation amongst themselves. Thoughts of the past play in Paul's head. There were several times where he he could have crossed that line that Trip just did. Luckily, he had Reggie, someone to keep Paul grounded so he understood the difference between victory and humiliation. Whether he knows it or not, Trip 
has crossed that line. It's here that Paul makes a silent vow to himself. He will be the one to battle Trip in the tournament. He will not lose until they have their battle. Maybe Paul can do for Trip what Reggie had done for Paul before. He can bring him back. This is where Paul's inner monologue is interrupted by the boy Stefan. Well, I didn't think I would get to see you guys without Ash. You three seem to be inseparable the last time I saw you. Oh, Steven, Iris says to which the boy corrects her with irritation in his voice. But the aspiring Dragon Master ignores this, telling Stefan that they separated from him for the time being, as Paul had some business to take care of in this part of Unova. Well, I had hoped to battle him here in the tournament, but I guess you guys will have to do. So that means I'm coming for you too. Iris is excited about this, with Dawn joining in the conversation, getting to know her new friends. However, this is interrupted with the announcement of the next rounds. They have four more to end today's rankings. It just so happens that the energetic kid that acts like Ash is up first, as the name Cameron is called. The boy jumps up, ready for his chance as he and Rilu rush off for the battlefield. While it was close, Cameron was able to close out the battle with his Rilu. This leaves Dawn, Iris, and Stefan who all close out their matches with the win. The day draws to a close as the group awaits the announcement for the pairings for day two. Paul, Don, Iris, Stefan, Cameron, Georgia, and a girl named Burgundy who's upset with Paul for eliminating her self-declared rival Silent. However, Paul seems unbothered by her excessive whining, but the reason why it's taking so long is because the match that Trip was part of. Technically, he should be part of the pairings, but because of the circumstances of that outcome, the last spot of the top eight is left in limbo. At this point, it's been near an hour since the end of the tournament, and the crowd is becoming restless. That is, until the announcer for the tournament finally speaks, giving everyone the much-awaited news. The people that were for sure in the top 8 all appear on the screen. Then, Champion Alder gets on the mic to explain the outcome of the final participant. As he does, the rest of the trainers are in their locker room when the last person they expected to walk in does. There stands Trip with a smug smirk plastered across his face. Wait, you, Iris declares? But why? Those tournament officials were clueless. I simply told him that I was in shock by Conkeller's outburst. The fear of the situation kept me frozen in self-preservation. They bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. You lied, Don says with anger in her voice. You're the worst type of trainer. But Trip simply laughs. You're naive. The world is a place where only the strong survive. I didn't see that until I met you, Paul. After our several battles, I realized that it's only power that matters when it comes to Pokemon and competition. So, thanks for the life lesson. It really helped me become a better trainer, but he's at a loss for words. The rest of the top 8 finalists are disgusted with Trip's outlook on things, but before anyone can add to the conversation, Trip simply tells them that he'll see him tomorrow. If they were smart, then anyone who gets paired with him should probably just forfeit, if they don't want the same thing to happen to their Pokemon. Trip simply walks out, leaving everyone in stunned silence, though Paul has one thought. This is his doing. If Trip's gone this far, then only his Pokemon have the conditioning to take Trip on in the level of battle that he's going for. Paul then runs from the locker room, leaving Don and Iris in silence, wondering what's up with him. Paul rushes to the arena. His intentions are to meet with Cynthia and the rest of the tournament community. Luckily, he finds them there still discussing the events of the day. Paul apologizes for his interruption, but it's imperative that he makes a request of them. Look kid, our decision was final. We won't be changing our mind, Albert says without even hearing Paul out. But since Cynthia knows this look. That's not what Paul wants. So she speaks up saying, let's hear him out. Paul's request is a simple one. He wants to be the first to battle Trip tomorrow. This piques the interest of everyone to which Alder asks why he would want to do that. All the pairings are randomized, so it makes no sense to change things. Yes, Claire says, why do you think we need to make any changes? Because what happened today was my fault, Paul says. Oh, how so, the Unova champion asks. I've had several encounters with this person over the past year that I've been in Unova. I think that he is trying to manipulate you guys into turning a blind eye. A bellow of laughter rings from Alder. You think we could be manipulated? You must not know who we are. But I do, Paul says. You guys are all high-class trainers whose job is to promote the future growth of each of your regions. With that mindset, I think it's easy for you guys to get tunnel vision when addressing issues. I think you may be overstepping your boundaries as a participant of this tournament, Alder says. You should go back to the locker room before your comments force us to make changes to you. But Paul stands firm. I'm aware of that. It's this reason why I'm not asking for you to ban Trip from the tournament. I'm simply asking for you to make me his first match. If I'm wrong, then you lose nothing by doing this. But if I'm right, then I think my Pokemon are the only ones that have the conditioning to battle him without getting hurt. This response has a surprise effect on everyone that Paul addresses, but for different reasons. Cynthia knows Paul isn't one to play around, so he may actually know something that the rest of them don't. Clara finds this side as one that she thought Paul would never have. Caitlin just stays quiet, awaiting her champion's response. Then there's Alder, 
The goal of this boy to undermine them as the overseers of this tournament, this doesn't sit well with him, but he's no fool and can read the room. His response is a simple one. We will take your request into consideration. Now please leave. With a simple thank you for your time, Paul takes his leave. Later at the Pokemon Center, Iris, Don, and Stefan are sitting with Paul. The topic of conversation is what Paul was doing when he left the locker room, but he insists that it was nothing important. He just needed to ask the tournament committee a question. Well, what was the question, Iris asks? But Paul isn't budging, much to Iris's irritation. Well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, Don says, knowing Paul far better than anyone else here. How about we change the subject for once, Stefan says. I know today was kind of a bummer, but let's look forward to tomorrow. We are all in the top eight. That means any of us could battle at some point. Doesn't that excite you? It does, Iris says. I can't wait to take my secret weapon for a test drive. It's going to bring me victory in this tournament. That's a bold claim, a voice says from across the room. Looking, there stands Georgia, the Dragon Buster. She's been giving Iris trouble the whole tournament, trying to stir the pot and frustrate her as much as possible. It's been working, as each time, Iris begins to turn red in her face whenever she's around. This leads the two to an argument as everyone watches. Iris insists that Georgia won't be acting all confident when she wins the tournament. I guess I'll just have to show you the real truth on the battlefield, Georgia says smugly as she walks off. All the while, Paul notices Trip standing in the shadows of the room, watching the group make fools of themselves. He then disappears into the darkness as Paul begins to formulate a strategy on how to best deal with him. The next morning, all the combatants are present for the announcement of the pairings. The crowd is cheering loudly as Alder addresses them, reassuring everyone that the events of yesterday were a one-time thing, and they have the safety of both them and the participants in mind going forward. Now, let's get started. With that, the parents begin to randomize on the screen above. Paul stands tense, hoping that the committee took his request into consideration. His heart begins to pound as the parents begin to appear. Then, it begins to sink when he realizes what has actually happened. He and Trip are on opposite sides of the pairings, with his being first and Trip's being last in this current lineup. If Paul wants to battle Trip, then he's going to have to win his way to the finals. With a feeling of disgust, Paul looks up at Elder, who is looking back. That should remind you of your place, boy, the champion thinks to himself. Paul realizes immediately that this was deliberate, but there's nothing he can do now. He has to get ready for his first match, which just so happens to be against Stefan. Paul enters the battlefield, focused on nothing but the road ahead. This kid is just a stepping stone on his path to Trip. Stefan has a similar mentality, as he wants to demonstrate the power power of his strongest Pokemon. Sock! Go! The fighting type hits the field with its trainer declaring that they will be victorious in this battle. Paul tells him that that desire is great, but there's one thing that beats desire every time. Something Ash taught him. Purpose. That's what I have. Electivire! Stand by for battle! Over with the judges, Cynthia is questioning Alder about the parents. She thought they had agreed that they would make the one alteration in the best interest of everyone's safety in case Paul was right. Alder claims that he thought he had made the changes, but maybe the randomizer didn't take his commands. So he guesses that they will have to just wait and see on how everything plays out. I guess we will, Cynthia says unsure on how to take Alder's remark. Meanwhile, Claire and Caitlin sit in silence with their own thoughts on the situation. On the battlefield, the match with Paul and Stefan is called with Paul as the winner. The battle was short and to the point. Paul and Electivire were both moving as one with the precision of a surgeon. Truth be told, Stefan never stood a chance. Paul recalls his mind looking up at Trip. Fine, if I have to do it the hard way, then that's how it'll be, Paul thinks while Trip just smiles as he walks out of sight. Paul clears the battlefield as the next match is one that the crowd has been scratching their heads for. Iris versus Georgia. The two are arguing amongst themselves instead of actually starting the battle. It gets to the point that the announcer has to remind them that they are in a tournament, and if they don't choose who to battle with, then they will both be disqualified. This snaps the two out of their single-mindedness as they both ready their balls. Georgia is confident that she will win this. After all, what does this wannabe Dragon Master know about battling as she sends in her certain victory? Heretic. Iris, on the other hand, has a choice to make. She wanted to try to make some progress with Excadrill, but it's too good of a chance to pass up. Iris will show Georgia that she really is a Dragon Master, as she declares, Dragonite, go! So, you finally have yourself an actual Dragon type that can battle. Well, looks like it can battle, Georgia says but looks can be deceiving. However, Iris isn't bothered by this comment. She knows that Dragonite has what it takes to best Georgia, and this is her chance to bond with it, just like Claire said. With a smile, she gives her first command. Flamethrower. Unfortunately, Dragonite doesn't respond, as it seems the Dragon type is having a stare down with its opponent. Well, if it won't battle, then this will be a piece of cake, Georgia retorts, as she orders an Ice Beam. Happily, 
the ice type begins to charge its attack. Iris urges Dragonite to fly so it can protect itself, but again, the dragon doesn't move. Then, the worst thing that Iris could possibly imagine happens. The ice beam hits. Dragonite doesn't even try to dodge it. A veil of haze descends on Dragonite. Well, it looks like your Pokemon is just like its trainer. It loves to be on the losing end, Georgia says. This brief teasing from the Dragon Buster has left her and Baratix guard down, and it's something she won't soon forget. As Dragonite emerges with a flamethrower charged and ready as it delivers a burst of intense heat right into the face of Beardick. With no guard up and no time to block the attack, it is a critical hit that one-shots Beardick and brings the battle to a close. And Georgia can't believe it as Iris celebrates her win. Dragonite actually listened to her even though the command was slightly delayed on its end. Georgia tells Iris that she got lucky. If Beardick's guard wasn't down, then she would have won. But Iris hears nothing as she continues to pander to the crowd with bows of her victory. Iris is then told to clear the battlefield in order to make room for the next match. Realizing she's overstayed her welcome, Iris recalls her dragon type. Up next is Dawn and that kid Cameron. We see them declare their Pokemon, being Riolu and Mamoswine. While that battle gets underway, Iris and Paul have a chance to meet up. Wasn't that great, Iris says? I finally beat Georgia. No, Paul replies. It was sloppy. Your dragon I did all the work while you take all the credit. You don't think that that battle was actually your own victory, do you? The only reason you won was because Dragonite was a better fighter, not because you were the better trainer, Paul says. Well, you don't have to be so mean about it, Iris responds. What's up with you? You've been more uptight than usual. Iris, this isn't a game. This is a competition, Paul says. I don't know if you realize it yet, but you face me next. I won't go easy on you. If your Dragonite is against me, then you will lose. This comment changes Iris' demeanor. Paul then says that Iris has to be smarter than this. What if she gets paired with Trip and he tries the same thing he did yesterday? Her or her Pokemon won't be able to handle that type of intensity. Paul then says one final thing before leaving. If you want to achieve your dreams of becoming a Dragon Master, then you need to stop being so naive. Stop living in your own version of the truth and start accepting reality. If you do that, then you will be able to break the barriers that you have placed in front of yourself. Paul then walks off to leave Iris with her thoughts as the match comes to a close with Cameron being declared the victor over Dawn. She really had the battle in the bag. That is, until Cameron got a last minute assist when his Riolu evolved mid-battle to clutch the win from behind. This just leaves the last match of the quarterfinals in Trip and Burgundy. Needless to say, this one is one-sided as well. When Trip uses his jealousy ghost typing to take on Burgundy and her Darmanitan. While the battle isn't as physically brutal as the one that he had with Conkeldor, Paul notices that Trip uses some pretty underhanded tactics to torment the Darmanitan mentally. The whole time, Trip has the look of enjoyment on his face as his opponent writhed in pain from its mental anguish. This was a sly move as it didn't catch the eye of the officials. However, on the other hand, Paul swears that Alder was enjoying it as much as Trip was. Paul doesn't get this old man. Just a few months ago, he was trying to help Paul get through his personal demons. But now that Trip is around, it seems like the champion is embracing him. Well, it doesn't matter. He has the next round to prepare for, as he and Iris are up next. Once on the battlefield, Paul looks into his traveling companion's eyes. He notices the look in them has changed from the last conversation. So, Iris, have you finally decided to embrace the truths around you? Holding a Pokeball, Iris declares that she won't be losing this fight. And this is where we're going to leave this part. So tell me, how did you guys feel about this one? Why is Trip acting the way he is? Why does it seem Alder is embracing Trip's behavior? And what new resolve has Iris found? Let me know in the comments down below. We begin today's part as Iris and Paul are in mid-battle. Well, kinda anyway. You see, things are rather one-sided at the current moment. Paul's choice was a simple one, his water ground type Palpitoad, while Iris decided to pull out the big guns, trying with her Excadrill. There's only one problem. Excadrill remains locked inside of its bore mode, and it's unresponsive to its trainer. She's been pleading with it now for well over a minute, which Paul doesn't understand why she would choose that thing. It doesn't listen to her, and she hasn't really done anything to try and work with it. So why risk it on a stage like this? Why not use something that can actually battle? But Iris doesn't hear him, as the referee is counting down for her to get her Pokemon to start battling or take the loss. It's at this moment that Iris begins to panic, as she doesn't want to take the loss, and Paul can see it across her face. While he's not really one to show pity in official battles, he does try to throw her a bone here, ordering his Palpitoad to fire a Hydro Pump at Excadrill. The Tongue Titan does so, firing his most powerful Water Blast at the mole, trying to arise 
any type of movement out of it. At first, it doesn't look like anything is happening. That is, until from the stream of water, Extra bursts in its drill form, performing a drill run, colliding with Palpatode with as much force as it possibly can, driving it into the stadium wall. And this single-handedly does two things. One, it prevents Iris from getting eliminated as Extra Drill has finally entered the battle. And two, it shows Paul just how strong this Extra Drill actually is, as he's never really had a chance to really gauge any of its abilities because it's never really been used by Iris outside of the one battle that they had with the Scolipede. This has Paul getting a little bit antsy because he might actually get a great battle out of Iris. After all, it wasn't looking like that when this started. Paul then turns to Palpatode, telling it to quit playing around. They have a battle to win. However, when he looks at his toad, something in its eyes has changed. There's a level of determination that Paul has never seen there before. And then it happens. An evolutionary light bays the stadium as Palpatode takes on its final evolution into Seismitoad, causing Paul to smile while Iris gulps, because whatever chance she just had may have just been flushed away. As the newly evolved Toad emerges from the light, it stares down Excadrill, who, just like the Toad, doesn't seem to flinch. They both know what this is. This isn't just a Pokemon battle. It is to test the strength of the two, to see who the superior fighter really is. Knowing she's got to do something, Iris calls for a drill run from Excadrill, causing the mole to tunnel beneath the stadium, using its camouflage to the advantage so that way it can hide itself from Seismitoad. However, unfortunately for both Iris and Excadrill, Seismitoad has a new ability that Paul is all too familiar with, as it tells the Toad to just wait, feel it out. One of Seismitoad's natural abilities is to feel the vibration in the ground and the air around it which means it's in a perfect position to counter Excadrill. And we see this when Excadrill surfaces right at the backside of Seismitoad, hoping to catch it off guard. However, before it was able to even break the dirt, Seismitoad was airbound, charging another Hydra Pump that blasts Excadrill back into the hole from whence it came. At this point, Iris is desperate. She calls for a Focus Blast to offset the pressure that is flooding the tunnel that Excadrill had just created. Unfortunately for her, it's no use. The Mole cannot hear her command, as it slowly resurfaces with spirals in its eyes, essentially becoming a water weight and Paul being declared the winner. This will move him to the final round to where he knows who his opponent already is. The only thing he can do is look at the kid Cameron as he walks on the field and hope that this boy has what it takes to at least prevent some serious damage to his Pokemon. Cameron is then accompanied by Trip as they are told to choose their combatants and in one simultaneous throw, they both declare, Samurai, Superior, I choose you. Now we find ourselves with Paul and Iris in the locker room. They are joined by Dawn. Dawn is trying to console Iris, telling her that she did her best, but this is Paul we're talking about, so it wasn't going to be that easy to win. But Iris isn't upset by this. She understands why she lost, to which Paul doesn't really even have to say anything because she says it for him. She shouldn't have gone with Exedril, and she fully realizes that it was a bad choice but she really wants to make some progress with the Iron Digger. She doesn't understand it. They used to be so close. They used to battle together all the time. Without fail, it would obey her commands and they would win and win and win. That is, until that battle. But that flashback is enough to cause Iris to shut her mouth because it's not a subject that she really wants to talk about right now. This causes Dawn to turn to Paul, who is staring at the monitor, displaying the match that is out in the main stadium. There, they can see what Paul and the rest of them had feared. Superior is coiled around Samrot, and while Samrot is doing its best to fight back with the razor shell, Superior's typing gives it the advantage with its leaf blade, pushes the shell back slower and slower, while Superior slowly tightens up on Samrot, coiling even harder and harder, until Samrot can no longer breathe or move, and the leaf blade connects, ending the battle. Wow, that was quicker than both yours and Iris's Don compliments. However, Paul says nothing as he just watches the screen, while the ref orders Superior to break its hold on Samrot, as the otter is now unconscious due to the lack of oxygen, but Superior has refused to break its grip. In this moment, Paul decides that he's using the best that he has, as both Electivire's Pokeball and the Black Orb resonate with each other with a slight vibration. Because the matches of the semifinals went so quick, the tournament officials have decided to take a brief interlude so that way the combatants can stretch the legs, get food, and plan their next strategies, as the finals will be a one-on-one. -on -one. During this time, we find Iris outside while she's holding both Dragonite and Excadrill's ball. She she doesn't know where she's going wrong. Claire did say for her to compete in the tournament in order for her to bond with Dragonite, but it doesn't seem like she's made any progress. And just like she was being summoned, Claire
Claire pops up, telling Iris, don't worry. It's natural to doubt people when they give you advice, especially when it's somebody you look up to, and the advice doesn't really seem like it was that good. Oh, Claire, I didn't say anything. I wasn't thinking, but Claire just smiles. It's okay, Iris. I understand. I was once a buddy young trainer just like you. It's going to take a long time for you and your Dragonite to get on the same page. However, your Excadrill, why, that is a little bit more interesting. How so, Iris asks. Well, it doesn't look like it's a newer Pokemon that's just rebelling because it doesn't want to be caught like your Dragonite. It looks like a Pokemon that you've had for a long time. Let me guess, is there some wounded history between the two of you? Iris looks at Claire with tears in her eyes. It's like she's been holding back some emotions for the longest time. It's okay, you can tell me. I promise I won't judge you because of it. Now we flash over to Paul, who is just sitting alone in the locker room. He's not really doing anything. He's just staring at the floor, but this isn't a stare of worry or grief or anything like that. He's focused. This is the Paul we know all too well. A Paul that has a resolve, that understands solutions to problems, that plans ahead, that has tactics to handle people. And he intends to use this same type of battle strategy that he's done so many times in the past to put Trip in his place, even if he and Electivire have to briefly cross that line in order to make him understand. Luckily for Paul, his moments in silence won't last much longer, as the crowd has begun funneling back into the stadium and the announcer has made his way back to the mic, telling the combatants that their battle is about to begin, so they need to make their way to the battle area and prepare for the final bout of the Pokemon Junior World Tournament. Standing, Paul irons his resolve as he heads out to the battlefield. In a mere moments, he stands across from the one trainer that he knew he was going to face this entire tournament, Trip. Slow roars over the crowd can be heard as they build, which Trip comments on, telling Paul that the last time they battled, they didn't have anything like this. But it certainly is going to be an exciting venue with Grandpa watching. Grandpa, what do you mean Grandpa, Paul asks. Oh, you didn't know? Grandpa Alder, he's always looked out for me, making sure that I didn't fall off of the path. You know, trying to keep me right. It's at this moment, Paul has a harsh realization his opponent for this tournament wasn't ever meant to be trip because the winner of this match gets an illustrious prize that isn't awarded to many people they get to battle one of the illustrious trainers that is one of the head judges the winner can name any one of the four that they want to battle with while this revelation of Alder being trip's grandfather is surprising paul doesn't let it shake his confidence merely focusing on the battle telling trip that he better stand by for battle because electivire will as the oni pops from its ball i figured you might use that thing again but not to worry. I'll just use the same Pokemon that I used to end that kid Cameron's reign in the tournament. As his starter, the one that Paul watched Trip pick pops from his ball. Superior. The ref declares that this will be a one-on-one -on -one battle with no time limit. The battle will be over when one side is unable to continue. Now, begin! The battle begins with Trip making the first move, calling for a light screen, as he knows that Electivire is an Electro-type, and most of them use specialized attacks. However, this is Paul, and he is prepared for all scenarios, as he orders the Oni to use one simple move, Brick Break. That shatters the screen of mental energy, connecting with Superior's head. Good move, Trip says, in a goading tone. However, Paul doesn't respond, merely ordering Electivire on its next assault with a wild charge. Ever the focused trainer, aren't you, Paul? Oh well, I guess I'll have to stop playing around too. Superior, use Leech Seed! The Serpent fires a bundle of speeds at Electivire that slowly powder the Oni in a scattered dust that, in an instant, begins to wrap all of its limbs in individual vines, even its torso, with the effects of the move slowly beginning to take its toll. So, you remembered that Electivire had Brick Break, and you lured it in with the light screen so you could hit me with the Leech Seed. Clever move, Paul says, but it won't be enough. Oh, that wasn't my only plan. We're just getting started. Superior, use Coil! The Serpent tightens its body into a spiral, increasing its attack, defense, and accuracy. However, Paul wasn't going to let this attempt go on, as he orders a second Wild Charge that finally connects, causing some resisted damage. Paul's beginning to see that Trip has been planning for this battle a long time. He's been taking his time methodically planning out his path to victory, and so far he's set up a pretty good strategy. But there's one that Paul has that Trip doesn't, as he pulls out the Black Stone of Zekrom. The stone pulsates with the Electivire. As Paul declares, you will not win this. Now, it's time. The stone begins to emanate a brilliance of shining and electrified aura as it levitates over Electivire and begins to merge with it. For the first time in a public setting, the world gets to watch the fusion of Electivire with the legendary. Complete silence befalls the building as they witness the miracle taking place. This has captured the attention of everyone in attendance, including Alder. Then, 
in a very confident and sure voice. You can hear Paul tell Electivire, it's time to end this. Use Fusion Bolt. Wait, Fusion Bolt. But that's, however, Alder is too late as he sees the new form of Electivire emerge from the light, surging with electricity as it slams its entire body into that of Superior. Though the Serpent has a type resistance to this, it can't help but writhe in pain as the effects of the electric type legendary move run through the course of its body. Trip is unsure on how to respond to this. He's frozen in fear. He's never seen aggression like this from a Pokemon outside of his own before. No, not even his Pokemon are capable of this. Then he looks across the field to Paul. His eyes are locked on Trip. Then suddenly a shiver runs down the boy's spine. What is this? Fear? No, there's no way I'm afraid. I've beaten him before, and I'm the grandson of Alder. There's no such thing as fear in my vocabulary, but but why can't I move? Why does Paul intimidate me so? However, his own thoughts are interrupted when Paul gives a final command. As the Oni is squeezing the serpent in its arms, Paul orders for a bolt strike to end this. At this point, even before the bolt strike, it's obvious that this is overkill. The battle was won by Paul. This form, this fusion with the legendary, was too much even for a trip's well-trained starter to handle. However, Paul, he's crossing a line. This gets the attention of Cynthia, Claire, Iris, and Dawn. They all watch on as Paul has consciously made this decision and watch Electivire light up the surrounding area to the point that no one can see the battlefield. However, this doesn't last long as once the light fades, Superior lies smoldering on the battlefield with a look of horror plastered across Tripp's face. There's nothing but stunned silence. What just happened here? However, Paul is the one to break this. You know, if you're going to commit to a role, then commit to it 100%. You have to be willing to cross that line at any point. No matter the consequences, you can't let anything hold you back. And what I just saw right now was a little boy who's afraid to act on what needs to be done. Trip says nothing as the referee finally comes to his senses. And even though that match terrified him, Paul is declared the winner. Paul recalls Electivire as the fusion dissipates, telling Trip that he doesn't have a choice. You can't just tiptoe on either side of the line. You either cross it or you don't. Don't beat him around the bush because he doesn't have time to waste with weaklings like him. Paul then walks off, leaving everyone in a stunned silence. That is, except for Alder. The old man knows that that was not just a message for Trip. That was also a message for him. Well, things are about to get a whole lot more interesting, the champion thinks to himself. Now we follow up with Paul in the locker room, to where he is met with Iris and Dawn. Both of them berating him. Why would you do something like that? You're no better than Trip has been throughout the entire tournament. I thought you grew in past this, Paul. However, the young boy just sits silent, listening to the two girls chastise him. Well, don't you have anything to say for yourself? You guys just don't get it, do you? Trip is exactly what I was becoming before I met Ash. And there was a couple of times that I almost crossed the line like he did today. I tiptoed on the path like he's been doing. He needed somebody that would set him straight. If it wasn't going to be me, then who was it? There was no one else here that could stand up to his Pokemon. No one else that could drive that message home. I had to cross that line one more time in order to show him that he should not ever consider doing it again. But using the stone of Zekrom to do that, that was way too much, Iris says. I had to make that point. There will always be somebody stronger than him. And at the wrong time, he can make the wrong move that could cost him greatly. Believe me, it's not something that I wanted to do. However, both me and Electivire had resolved that it was something that needed to be done. And if Zekrom didn't agree with it, then we wouldn't have been able to take the transformation. Wait, Zekrom, what's that, Don asks? Oh, it's just a legendary Pokemon that Paul keeps in his back pocket for emergencies. Iris responds like it's no casual thing. But still, that doesn't give you a right to abuse its power. I wasn't abusing it, Iris. I was using it to set an example. Besides, Trip wasn't the real enemy of this tournament. You didn't hear what he had said to me. Alder, that's his grandfather. That's why Trip got away with all of the things that he did. Alder's been protecting him throughout the entire tournament. That explains why, when Trip was evolved, Alder seemed to have changed his personality. Before, he had no skin in the game. His family wasn't involved. But now that his family, his grandson, has been going up against us, and he's running the risk of running into some trouble, whose side do you think he would take? I get one prize for winning this tournament. The chance to battle one of the people that were left to judge the competition. And that choice is a very simple one. So, you're gonna battle him again, are you? Iris asks. I am. He needs to be sent a message. He can't abuse his position of power like he has been. And when it comes to his grandson, he shouldn't be teaching him that he can get away with anything. After all, he won't always be there to protect him. That was something I had to learn when 
when me and Reggie stopped seeing eye to eye for a while. So wait, I'm confused, Don says. Are you not back to being the old Paul? I would say he kinda is, Iris responds. Just in the fact that he doesn't like the way things are being ran, so he's gonna do whatever he has to, to send a message. Even if that means that he must cross a line or two. But it's not gonna be a permanent cross. He's just returning for a day pass, if you will. Unfortunately for the two, they don't really have much time to discuss this, as Paul's presence is requested back on the battlefield, as the closing ceremonies are about to take place. Standing up, Iris tells Paul, good luck. If there's anybody that can actually beat Dalder, then it would be him. Paul says nothing, simply walking down the shadowy corridor, ready for his next encounter. On the field, the crowd is showing mixed emotions. Some are excited, other ones are uncertain on what they've been seeing. This tournament has been more of a bloodbath than anything, but one thing is clear. They still have one final phase of this tournament, the prize for the winner, who is undoubtedly Paul. He stands with the referee next to him, asking to name the challenge he aims to make. Paul's response is one that is simple and straight to the point. You, Alder, champion of Unova, you are my challenge. However, just as they thought Paul was done, he says something else. You're gonna have to learn that you can't protect family, no matter how close they are. You'll pay for interfering with the tournament, whether it was directly from you or not. This triggers Claire, Caitlin, and Cynthia to ask Alder what Paul is talking about. However, the old man claims he doesn't know. For whatever reason, it seems that Paul may have him mixed up with somebody else. But no matter, he will go battle the boy and set him straight. He then confidently walks off, as the three girls are not buying the answer they were just given. Moments later, Alder finds himself on the battlefield, standing across from Paul, his accuser. Well, kid, you seem to have quite the wild imagination. If I recall, I helped you in the past, didn't I? Stuff it, Paul says. I know what you've been up to. You've been protecting him. Tripp even admitted that you were his grandfather. Well, so what if I am? That doesn't mean anything. You have no proof to base your allegations on. Don't tell me that's the reason why you won this entire tournament. No, at first it was my concern about Tripp, but the moment I realized that he wasn't the one I had to worry about was the moment I knew I needed to battle you once more. Well, regardless of your reasons, I promise you that you won't be winning this battle, Alder says, as the referee calls for the start, and Paul makes the first move. Emboy, stand by for battle! Well, that's quite the choice there. Let me guess, you assume that I was going to use Bufalon again. That's why you decided to go with your fighting type. Well, I got news for you, kid. You jumped the gun. Volcarona, go! This catches Paul by surprise. He's never even seen an event with Alder not using his Bufalant, so he assumed it would be a safe bet, especially considering Electivire has battled twice today, and Seismitoad hasn't had the chance to recover from the battle with Iris and Excadrill. Oh well, a bug type? That shouldn't be too hard for a fire type. So he figures he'll just go big and one-shot it right now. Embor, use Heat Crash! However, Alder doesn't waver and neither does his bug type, as they simply just take the fire type attack, much to Paul's surprise. This is when he finds out the whole truth, that Volcarona isn't only just a bug, it's also part fire type, so it has a perfect resistance against this heat crash, allowing Alder to set up his move. Toxic. Suddenly, Embor is flooded with the poison dust as it is in direct contact with the bug type, and it is quickly taking effect as the battle pig breaks contact at Paul's command coming back to its side of the field. Oh, uh, what? You didn't like their together time? Well, I guess it was a little bit too much for you. But don't worry, this will be over soon, Alder says with a chuckle in his voice. He then responds in kind with a hurricane. Now Paul understands why Volcarona was chosen, as he tries to mount some sort of defense, ordering an arm thrust to stave off the flying type attack. For the most part, this works. Unfortunately, though, with each thrust of the arm, it causes the poison to circulate through Embor that much faster. Knowing he has to do something, Paul decides on a course of action that may or may not work in his favor, as Embor really isn't that familiar with this move yet. Use Scold! Just as the winds die down, boiling water spews from the pig's mouth, much to the shock of everyone including Alder, that douses the bug, causing some significant damage. I see Alder thinks to himself, well, you had some sort of trump card just in case things didn't go exactly as you planned. I really like your style, kid. However, my business is my business, and I'm going to teach you not to meddle in any of my family business. Volcarona, use Quiver Dance! Shaking off the fluids from its wings, the moth begins to vibrantly dance around the battlefield, raising its abilities and dodging the next attack from Embor. At this point, things become obvious to Paul. Embor is breathing heavily, and it does doesn't have much longer in this battle. However, with a final big push, Embor should be able to close this out. That's when he orders the fire type in with another heat crash. The battle pig readies itself as it throws its full weight at Volcarona. Unfortunately for them, Volcarona is able to dodge this move, and in a brilliant disperse of power, it uses Hurricane once more at Alder's command, sending the boar into the stadium wall. Embor, are you alright, Paul says. The pig pulls itself from the wall, nodding that it is, only for its final bit of strength to be sapped by the poison. 
That's it. The battle is called in Alder's favor. Well, that was fun. I have to say so myself. I look forward to seeing you in the competition at the Unova League. I'm sure that you'll be much stronger then, Alder says, followed by him simply turning and walking away. This moment is a harsh realization for Paul. He wasn't even close to Alder's level. He wasn't in the battle that he had with his Bufalant, and he certainly wasn't in the battle that he had with this Volcarona. He's going to need to tighten up his training schedule if he hopes to have any chances at beating this man in the future. With the battle between Paul and and Alder behind them, this brings the tournament to a close, with everybody getting the chance to see Paul crowned as the champion. While he does accept the position, he feels like it's a hollow victory. Trip wasn't a competition, and the real person that he needed to battle was Alder, but he couldn't even hold a candle to him, literally. So he does what he does best. He accepts it in as, as respectful way as possible, bringing the tournament to an end. Later that night at the Pokemon Center, Iris and Paul are talking with Don. Are you sure Alder was doing all those things that you said he was? Don asks. Paul says he is. But Iris simply rebuttals that it doesn't seem like it. Why would the champion be trying to hide the fact that his grandson is participating in the tournament? It wouldn't make any sense. These are things I don't know, Paul says. However, I do know this. Something's up with Alder. He's not the person he pretends to be. Why do you say that, Iris asks. It's simple. When Alder looked at me before he walked away, Zekrom's orb resonated slightly. That tells me that there's something more here than meets the eye. And I'm sure we're going to find out sooner than later. This brings things to the next morning, as Dawn has to say goodbye to her new friends. She's actually heading over to Johto to compete in their grand festival, and this was just a stop before she headed over there. Though things got a little bit wild, she did have fun, and she tells Paul she was glad to see him again. Hopefully next time she'll get a chance to see Ash. She then tells Iris it was nice to meet her, as she boards the boat, bound for the Johto region. Well now, that's all this is over. Where's our next stop, Iris says. I had a thought about that, Paul says. According to some of the locals, there's a new gym that opened up to the north of here, in Humalau City, I do believe it's called. Well, why don't we get going, considering we still have to meet Ash in Opsilucid City. So, with the events in Undella Town now over, the two turn, heading deeper into Unova, with a new understanding that things behind the scenes aren't quite what they're supposed to be. However, it doesn't seem that the duo are going to be alone, as they have captured the attention of a very interested Pokemon. And now we fade to the city in the north, as a very familiar person, Geovan Vani stands out on the shoreline, gazing into the ocean. I know you're out there, somewhere. And this is where we are going to leave things for now. So tell me, how did you feel about the Pokemon Junior World Tournament arc? How did you like Paul's Seismitoad evolving in the battle with Iris? Do you feel like Paul was right in the line that he crossed with Trip to give him a taste of his own medicine and then question his abilities as a trainer? And what is up with Alder? Something just doesn't seem right with him. And lastly, what is Giovanni looking for in Humalau City? Let me know in the comments down below. We begin today's story with Paul and Iris as they are on their way to Humala City. While the two haven't been traveling that long, they have been able to make great distance as there hasn't really been anything to stop their journey thus far. Well, that is, except for a slight annoyance for the two. Every time that they stop, some of their items appear to go either missing or misplaced in each other's bags. This has caused a couple of brief arguments between Paul and Iris because they started accusing each other of taking things without asking. However, it eventually becomes clear to Paul that when these events happen, the Black Stone is also reacting like there's some sort of intimate danger and they need to be on guard. However, Iris is too stubborn to listen to logic here and she just continues to berate Paul for taking things out of her bag without asking. This whole experience has continued for several days, wearing on the nerves of both of our traveling heroes. However, Paul has been timing these instances and he's learned that whenever they happen, the stone resonates for about 10 seconds and then it dissipates. And that's when whatever happens or is going to happen seems to stop. While the information that they have is very little, whatever it is has the ability to remain transparent to the human eye, which can mean it's only one of two types of Pokemon. So that night, when they start their fire and begin to eat, Ash decides to have one of his Pokemon out with him, in particular, Cophagrius, and he has a plan. He just needs to wait and time it. In order not to raise suspicion, he also tells Iris to bring out all of her other Pokemon, as he thinks they should have some time out of their balls. Iris is not against this. However, she's curious to why Paul wouldn't bring out his other Pokemon. He just claims that he has some stuff that he wants Cophagrius to do. However, this is odd to Iris, as the ghost type is just in its coffin form, laying there, like it's waiting. However, the wait won't be long. As everyone settles down to eat, Paul can feel the stone starting to resonate in his jacket pocket. Without hesitation, he declares, Now, Cafarigus, flood the area with shadow balls. Suddenly, the ghost type springs to life 
life doing as its trainer commands. While Iris and her Pokemon think Paul is crazy for doing this as they dodge the shadow balls that are randomly being fired about, he watches carefully for any sign that something is hit. Then a slight burst of energy followed by a cry of pain is caught from the corner of his eye. Kafarigus, there, Paul declares. In the blink of an eye, the ghost type pounces, jumping on whatever his trainer was pointing at, and then begins to constrict something that squeals in pain. However, neither Paul nor Iris can see what this thing is. Iris thinks Paul is crazy and Kafarigus is wasting his time. That is, until Paul tells Kafarigus to use a will-o'-wisp. As the flames begin to erupt, a brief squealing can be heard as Kafarigus squeezes tighter and tighter until the squealing stops and something appears bound in the tentacles of the ghost type. What is that, Iris says. The Pokemon that's been causing us so many problems, Paul responds. Every time that it's tried to do something to us, the stone has resonated. I don't know why, but there may be a link to the two, Paul says as he looks at the unconscious Pokemon. Hours later, Ash and Iris are sitting around the fire. All is quiet as the unconscious Pokemon has been laid into a bed with a little bit of a burn heal to treat the wounds that were caused by Kafarigus. While Iris is concerned for the little thing, Paul, on the other hand, has nothing but questions. He wants to know why this thing has been following them, and more importantly, why it resonates with the stone. It's at this moment, he finds himself wishing that he was having one of those visions from Zekrom right about now. However, the stone just remains silent, choosing to keep whatever secrets it has for the time being. For their own protection, Kafarigus has remained outside of its Pokeball, on watch over the Pokemon, as they are not really sure if it's friend or foe at this current time. Iris spends majority of the night with Axew, tending to the wounds of the injured Pokemon, while Paul stands guard for any would be attackers. For all he knows, this thing is not alone. Luckily, when daybreak hits, this mysterious Pokemon starts to stir, waking up first in a panic as it doesn't really know where it's at, not really having much recollection of what happened the day before. That is, until it sees Paul and Kafarigris. Then, it starts to panic even more, turning it invisible in an attempt to get away. However, just like a Stoutland, Kafarigus is on it, binding the Pokemon once more, preventing it from escaping. The stress of the situation causes this mysterious Pokemon to pass out once again, leaving Iris and Paul in quite the conundrum. They don't really know what to do with this thing. Paul's first reaction, well, they should probably just leave it. It's wild, and they've already treated its burns. So, in a few hours, it should wake up, and it will be just fine. However, Iris doesn't like this idea, telling Paul that they're not that far from Himalaya City, so they could just take it to the Pokemon Center. Reluctantly, Paul allows this, telling Iris that if she wants to bring it, then she's gonna have to carry it. He won't be the one to weigh them down with unnecessary baggage, considering he's got a gym battle to get to. He and Kafarigus then walk off, leaving Iris with Axew and the mysterious Pokemon. Luckily for Iris, she's able to call upon Dragonite, who is willing to give her a hand in carrying the Pokemon so that way she doesn't really have to. And when to get a little bit of payback for Paul leaving her behind, Iris asks Dragonite if it can give her a ride to the Pokemon Center that just so happens to be over the next couple of hills. Reluctantly, the Dragon allows Iris to mount its back, and off they go, with Iris sticking her tongue out, telling Paul that she'll see him in the city. However, he simply just sighs, recalling Kafarigus as he doesn't really need to use it as a guard dog anymore, and then continues walking. Now we find ourselves with Giovanni. He patiently awaits on the beach of Himalaya City as his three subordinates have yet to check in with him, as they are on the tail of the next piece to his puzzle to being able to assemble an ultimate weapon. Luckily for Boss Rocket, he won't have to wait long as he gets word from Jesse and James that what he seeks is actually on his way to the city now. You see, they've been tracking both Iris and Paul since they left Undella Town, as their target is actually the Pokemon that's been playing mischievously with the two that is now on its way to the infirmary in Humilau City. Giovanni smiles as he watches Dragonite sail in, knowing that all the pieces are finally in place, and thanks to the kid that's been hunting him, things couldn't have been easier. Now we pick up with Iris as she is waiting inside of the Pokemon Center. This is where Paul walks in, simply ignoring Iris and heading to the counter of the center, to where Nurse Joy's Audino stands, ready to take oncoming travelers. He then turns all of his Pokemon into Audino, telling it that he has a Pokemon battle he needs to get to, so please hurry. The diligent healthcare worker nods as it speeds off with Paul's Pokeballs in order to get the task done as quickly as possible. This is where Iris approaches her friend, telling Paul that that's what he gets for leaving Iris behind. 
mind. However, he simply retorts the walk that he had was one of the most soothing things he's had since he set out on this journey in Unova, as he didn't really have to deal with anybody. The peace was so calming. While Paul is just trying to have a little bit of fun at Iris' expense, the aspiring Dragon Master doesn't really find this funny, and in turn chooses to yell at him. However, this is interrupted when Nurse Joy comes out to ask for Iris. She tells her that her Meloetta will be fine. However, it was hurt very badly. Does she know what happened to it? This is where Iris corrects the nurse, telling her that it's not her Pokemon, but she does know what happened to it, then pointing to Paul, saying that he was the one who attacked it with his Kafarigas, and he used Will-O-Wisp on it quite intensely. Nurse Joy begins to side-eye Paul only for the boy to tell her that it was attacking them, so he was only defending him and his Pokemon. However, he does take interest in the fact that Nurse Joy knows what it is, asking what she knows about this Meloetta. Nurse Joy tells Paul that she doesn't really know much. Up until today, it was only a rumored Pokemon said to exist in myths and legends, and one legend in particular said that it was an ancient king's favorite Pokemon, and it sat at the heart of its kingdom with the ability to calm minds or rile spirits, depending on who controlled the reflection of Meloetta. So what does that mean, Paul asks. I don't know, the nurse replies. After all, it's just an old story, something that's been passed down on the eastern half of Unova for many centuries. But what I can say is, Meloetta will be fine. It's just going to need a few days of rest. This is where Iris asks if she can go in and see it, to which Nurse Joy replies that she can. However, Paul's not really interested in this, as Otterno has returned with his Pokeballs. He grabs his six Pokemon and tells Iris that he's going to the Humalau Gym, as he's got his seventh badge to win. Then after that, they're heading to Absolute City, so that way they can finally meet back up with Ash. Oh, so you're here for a gym battle, Nurse Joy says. Well, you'll be happy to know the gym is pretty easy to find. Just walk down to the beach and look for the battle arena. It'll be right there. It's not really any a fancy building or anything like that, as the leader, he doesn't really care about that stuff. He just cares about the thrill of the battle. Paul thanks Nurse Joy and tells Iris that after he's done with this gym battle, he'll be back and he'll be leaving with or without her. So she had better be ready. Iris merely just gives him another tongue as Paul walks out the door. From the vantage point that Paul has, he can see the beach clear from the Pokemon Center. So he begins to walk. While the trek there really doesn't have anything of significance happen, for some reason the black stone continues to pulsate. Zekrom is uneasy and Paul doesn't understand why. However, since there's no immediate danger, he just can do nothing but move on to his gym battle. It's very quickly that he finds himself on the beach, looking for the spot that Nurse Joy told him about, which he happens to find rather easily. However, when he approaches the battlefield, there's no one here. It sits really just on the open sea, and the only thing that could really define it as a battlefield for a gym is the fact that it has a bit of the water fenced off by a pier and some fencing down below to kind of separate it from the open ocean. However, it's not really much for a gym, Paul thinks to himself. As a matter of fact, it's one of the laziest looking gyms that he's ever seen. And the fact that there's no leader in sight really leads him to question if this is actually a Pokemon gym at all. However, his thoughts are interrupted when someone pops out of the water onto the pier. Hey bro, are you here for a gym battle by any chance? Paul is a bit put off by this bronzed, spandex clad individual. Yes, I am. Have you seen the leader? I would like to get this underway as soon as possible. Wow, straight to the point, he says. Well, I'm Marlin, and I happen to be the leader of this here gym which is exactly what Paul was afraid he would say. By the way, and what's yours? Paul responds in kind with his own name, asking if they can get started. He really is in quite the hurry. Wow, dude, I was really hoping we could just vibe and take a chill pill. You know, enjoy the surrounding and the up and coming battle. But if you're in that much of a hurry, I guess we can get started. You can take your position over there while I'll take this one. Paul does as he's told, as he wants to get this battle underway, but he seems to realize that the leader has forgotten something about this battle. So, Marlon was it? How many Pokemon are we going to be using here? Oh, right. Well, I guess, how does a two-on-two -two sound? After all, some of my Pokemon are kind of wore out. We've been out fishing and just enjoying the day too much, so I don't think they're really up for battling. Paul turns to see a giant Waylord and some other water Pokemon just offshore. Fine, a two-on-two -two will suffice. Will these be normal rules? Oh, right, yeah. You're allowed substitutions, but I can't. And also, the battle will end when one side is out of both Pokemon. So, are you ready to get started, little man? A bit irritated on how this interaction is starting to go, Paul confirms that he is ready. However, there doesn't happen to be a referee available. To which Marlin says, yeah, I kind of gave him the day off considering it was a slow day. But you know what? That'll be all right. I'll just take care of it and make the calls. That is, if it's all right with you. Fine. Whatever Paul says. Let's just get this battle started. Very well, little dude. Mantine, you're up, little bro. Marlin throws his first ball, revealing that 
his Pokemon is indeed Mantine. And this all but confirms what Paul's suspicion was in the beginning, considering this battlefield was set on the ocean. Marlin is a water type trainer. However, he doesn't want to make it easy on himself. He could use Electrovire and wipe the floor with this guy, especially with the Black Stone. However, he doesn't want to use it at this current time, considering Zekrom seems to be super uneasy. So he decides to go with one of his newly evolved Pokemon. Seismitoad, stand by for battle. The water ground type bursts from the ball, hitting one of the platforms ready for its trainer command. Marlin compliments Paul on his water type, telling him that it looks really strong. So this should be a good water Pokemon battle. However, we all know Paul and he's not much for the talkative type, especially when he's in battles. He just tells Marlin to start the battle, to which the gym leader obliges, giving Paul the first move. Well, Paul's not going to wait around to find out exactly what this man Tyne can do. So he orders Seismitoad into the water to even the playing field, followed by a sludge wave that the toad shoots from its mouth, heading straight for Mantine. Marlin realizes that this is a good attack, and if it does hit, he could be in some trouble. However, his Mantine has just the right counter for this type of situation, ordering a Psybeam and using it as a shield to fend off the poison type move, basically nullifying it. That was a good choice, but you're in my element, and you're going to have to do better than that, Marlin says, as he orders Mantine to dive. Paul won't let Marlin get the surprise on him, so he orders Seismitoad to do the same. However, to add a little boost to its dive, he tells the toad to grab onto the bottom of the platforms and use it as a launching pad to push itself through the water. This allows Seismitoad to catch up with Mantine rather quickly, hitting it with an icy wind at the command of Paul. This ends up freezing one of its fins in the water. However, Marlin doesn't seem to be phased as he's just going with the flow of the battle by using the momentum that Seismitoad had to counter with a seed bomb that connects with Seismitoad, driving it up out of the water back onto one of the platforms. While that wasn't enough to end Paul's water type, it was a serious hit, as that was a times four weakness. Now that he has a little bit more information on this thing, Paul decides to recall Seismitoad. Then, he declares, Kafarigus, stand by for battle! The ghost type emerges from the ball, taking to the platform, steadying itself, waiting for Paul's command. So, a ghost type, is it? Well, not to worry. We can still handle this. Now, Mantine, use Air Slash! The water type bursts from beneath the waves, slicing through the air with its fins, sending the attack in the direction of the ghost type. However, Paul doesn't flinch at this command, ordering his Pokemon to use Calm Mind to up its special attack and defense. Kafarigus just takes the hit as it tightens its defenses and increases its focus. However, Mantime dives back beneath the waves as Paul calls for another Calm Mind. Marlin realizes what Paul is up to, and he can't let this get out of control, so he decides to go for a big play, ordering Mantine back out of the water to use a Hydro Pump. The high-pressured water type move hits Kafarigus, but the damage is minimal, allowing Paul to call for a third Calm Mind. This has gotten Marlin to sweat a little bit as that once calm exterior is starting to give way to a little bit of nervousness, to which Paul notices and comments on, telling Marlin, what, I thought you were just going to go with the flow of the battle. Well, it doesn't work that well when the flow is no longer in your control. Isn't that right, Kafarigus? This is where Marlin tries to make his big play, telling Mantine to jump out of the water again with another Hydro Pump. However, this time, Paul is ready to go on the offensive, as he orders a Will-O-Wisp that blinds the water type as it is enveloped with the burn. Quickly, it's back into the water again, trying to soothe whatever damage that it has from that will-o'-wisp. It's at this point that the battle is completely flipped and Marlin knows it. However, he can't change Pokemon, so he has no choice but to push forward, ordering an air slash. Mantine is forced to surface one more. However, this brings doom for the water type as at Paul's command, Kafarigus uses its most powerful move that's been upped by the status condition that Mantine has and the calm minds that it used on itself as Hex takes control of it and drives it into the platform below, ending the battle. Marlin's impressed. He didn't think that Paul would be able to take control like that. He is quite the tactician. Recalling his Mantine, he compliments Paul on his decision to swap Pokemon mid-battle. It allowed him to really take control. However, Marlin's last Pokemon won't be knocked out as easily as this one was. As he declares, Jellicent, go! The ghastly jellyfish hits the water just floating on the surface. Calm, cool, and collected, waiting for its trainer's command. Paul knows this Pokemon all too well from his previous battles with Trip. He knows that it's a ghost type, and this could be a dangerous matchup for his Kafari. However, he doesn't want to recall it. The stat buffs that he has right now are way too much in his favor for him to even consider that. So, he waits for Marlin, the referee slash gym leader, to call the start of this next round, to which he does almost immediately. However, as the loser of the last match, Marlin takes their first move, calling for a scold. While this normally would be a dangerous move, due to the stat buffs that Kafarigus has, Paul isn't really worried about it. That is, until its secondary effect kicks in, as it causes a burn on his ghost type. Well then, it looks like we're even for that last match, Marlin says. However, Paul doesn't respond to anything just asking his ghost if it can still battle. Kafarigus nods, 
readying itself for the next command, to which Paul doesn't hesitate, because he has one move that could end this in his favor right now, calling for a destiny bond. Smart, Marlin says. However, that's not going to work, as he orders Jellicent to dive, avoiding the move, creating an opening for it, to which the gym leader gladly uses, as he calls for his own hex. While this normally wouldn't be an issue for Paul's current state, things are just not lined up for his Kafarigus. It's burn, plus its type weakness, and the stab that Jellicent's going to get from this is going to make things extremely dangerous for him. And Paul can do nothing except watch as his ghost type falls to the same move that he used to win his last battle with. Recalling Kafarigus, Paul considers his options, which at this point is only one, Seismitoad. However, how will he use it to beat this tank of a Pokemon? He can tell that Marlins is far better trained than what Trips was. He knows how to use the ghost typing of this Pokemon, but he can't wait for much longer as Marlin tells him if he doesn't make his choice, he'll be disqualified. After all, Marlin Marlin is the referee. Seismitoad, stand by for battle, Paul declares. The toad hits the platform, ready for its next round, to which Paul wastes no time, calling for an icy wind. However, Marlin simply counters by ordering Jellicent to dive once more, avoiding the attack. Knowing that he's going to have to take this battle in the water, Paul orders Seismitoad in, to which the jellyfish is lying in wait for Seismitoad to enter, as Marlin gives a command for a scald. Paul quickly counters this with the hydro pump, which is exactly what Marlin wanted, as Paul finds out the hard way what Jellicent's ability is water absorb which quickly heals it from any real fatigue that it may have had great one of my moves is completely unusable paul thinks to himself while marlin just cackles you see i told you that my jellison wouldn't go down that easy so how are you gonna get yourself out of this one while it's a bit risky paul's gonna have to invoke his inner ash here so he orders seismitoad to use a mud shot but not to aim it directly at jellicent instead use it to cloud the water quickly the battlefield becomes murky hiding seismitoad and allowing paul to enact his plan marlin's not quite sure what what Paul is up to. However, he needs to clear this muck out of the way if he plans to beat his opponent, so he starts ordering scalds, which Jellicent fires, trying to clear the murkiness of the water with the pressure from behind the attack. This allows Seismitoad to move freely through the water, as not only is it unseen, but its ability to feel tremors in the ground is coming into play here. You see, mud is still ground, and the murkiness of the water, even however thin that the sand is, is still something that Seismitoad can feel. This is allowing it to pinpoint Jellicent right to the spot to where it is, and Paul uses this to his advantage as his toad creeps up behind Jellicent, landing a sludge wave at point blank range. This hits for massive damage, allowing Seismitoad to get the added effect of poison on the tank. Then, as quickly as it attacked, it disappears back into the fog of the mud. Marlin quickly orders the Hex to try and capture Seismitoad. However, it's gone before the attack can be completed, and Paul counters it with his next move, another mud shot, upping the murkiness and the thickness of the mud and the water in the surrounding area. This is allowing Seismitoad to move freer and freer, while Jellicent is slowly getting gummed up as it can't really deal with the mud in its way. Marlin is beginning to panic as his fish begins to struggle and it's losing health fast, so he orders a recover to stave off some of the damage from the poison. However, Seismitoad is quickly on the attack with an icy wind from the depths that causes some damage and manages to drop the speed of Jellicent just a little bit. What follows is Paul and his tactician skills of battling as he surgically dismantles Jellicent one move at a time with Seismitoad until the jellyfish just floats to the surface, swirls in its eyes, unable to battle. Marlin has no choice but to declare Paul the winner, presenting him with the wave badge. You're a really good trainer, he says. I'm glad I had a chance to battle you today, but if you don't mind, I'm gonna get back to fishing with my Pokemon. I kind of need a little bit of a break after using my brain so much in that battle. Marlin then dives into the water to go fish with the Pokemon that had been waiting so patiently throughout the battle. Paul really is unsure on how to handle the oddity, but he has what he came for, his seventh badge. So with that, he departs from this gym back to the Pokemon Center, and he decides to take the longer route back to enjoy the views, kind of taking Marlin's advice to just go with the flow for once. However, this may come to cost Paul, as when he finally arrives back at the Pokemon Center, it's pure pandemonium. Everyone is running around in chaos. Things are destroyed. Tables tipped over and machines sparking as Iris sees her friend approaching him, telling Paul that they have a problem. Team Rocket broke in. They stole Meloetta. And this is where we are going to leave things for right now. So tell me, how do you feel about this part so far? We're gearing up for the final confrontation between Paul and Giovanni, so I hope you're excited for that. Is Paul going to be able to use the powers of Electivire and the Black Stone to overcome Giovanni with his reveal glass? And how did you feel about the battle between Paul and Marlin? Honestly, with that one, I kind of felt like Paul was going to have that no matter what the situation was, as even though Marlin is depicted kind of as a strong gym leader, I feel like he's just too laid back for Paul not to be able to handle. Anyway, let me know your thoughts and comments down below.
aftermath of where we left off last time. Paul stands at the door of the Pokemon Center with Iris telling him that Team Rocket took Meloetta. While this is important, there's one thing that we have to remember here. Paul only has one thing on his mind, a rematch with Giovanni, especially after their last battle was no contest at Reversal Mountain. All these thoughts are playing in his head as he is fresh off of the battle with Marlin, but Iris is able to get through to him by smacking him on the back of the head, telling Paul that he needs to pay attention. They need help here. They have to get everything back online so that way the Pokemon can be seen. Realizing that Iris is right, because he's going to need his Pokemon looked at, he begins to help put everything back together. Slowly but surely over the next couple of hours, they are able to get everything inside of the Pokemon Center back up and running. This is where Paul asks Otano if it can take his Pokemon again and give them a look over, specifically Seismitoad and Kafarigas. While the normal type takes his Pokemon to go look at them, Paul and Iris debrief about exactly what happened here. Team Rocket had just bombed the Pokemon Center trying to grab the attention and draw anything away from Meloetta's room. While that happened, Meowth was able to sneak in and take control of Meloetta, sneaking it out a back way. Paul asks Iris exactly how she knows all this, and she informs Paul that Axew had been wandering the Pokemon Center trying to find any stragglers when it saw Meowth carrying Meloetta out the back way. Well, which way did they go, Paul asks. This is where Iris points out they just took Meloetta to the beach and then took off in a boat. However, they didn't head up or down the coast. They headed straight out into the ocean, in the direction of that storm that's on the horizon. While Paul doesn't really care for Meloetta that much, he does know two things. One, it seems to be tied to Zekrom in some way. And two, if Team Rocket is after it, that means that whatever their plan is has to do with it, Zekrom, and that mirror that they found at Reversal Mountain. As those thoughts are going through Paul's head, Zekrom's orb slowly starts to resonate, confirming Paul's suspicions. It's here that he tells Iris, first light, he's heading out, and he's going to go find wherever Team Rocket took Meloetta. However, Iris quickly informs Paul that it's not he that's heading out, it's we, because she's going with him. Team Rocket has been a thorn in her side just as long as they've been in his side, and she wants to make sure that Meloetta is okay. Knowing that he's not going to get out of here without her by his side, Paul reluctantly agrees. Later that night, after everyone settled in, Paul makes a call to his brother. He's going to swap out a couple of his Pokemon. He's trading out Kafarigas for Sigilith, and he's also going to swap out Weavile for his Gastrodon. The way he sees it, being out in the open ocean, they're going to need as much water and flying type support that they can get. And these two are the best he has for the job. The next morning, after they've gathered all the supplies that they can, Paul and Iris head to the beach, seeking any type of boat or vessel that can take them out into the open ocean. However, unfortunately, their pickings are slim, as there doesn't really seem to be any type of boats anywhere near. All the docks are empty, and there's not really any patrons in sight. There's not really much they're going to be able to do. Iris then suggests that they use their Pokemon to get out there. She can fly out on Dragonite and Paul can swim out on Seismitoad. However, he reminds her that they may need their Pokemon to actually battle, so it wouldn't be a good idea to waste their strength actually getting there. Well, I was just trying to offer a solution to our problem, Iris says with a tone in her voice. However, what is a perceived problem doesn't remain one for long, as a familiar person from yesterday's gym battle comes swimming by in the form of the gym leader Marlin. He's atop his Waylord, asking if Paul and Iris are okay. They look like they're trying to get out somewhere. While Paul isn't really the talkative type with Marlin, as he's trying to figure out a problem to their solution, Iris fills the gym leader in, explaining that an evil group called Team Rocket stole a Pokemon, then headed out into the ocean, where we can't seem to get to, as there's no boats or anything around. While Marlin is surprised, he doesn't really seem to be upset about it. In fact, he's just really chill, much like his gym battle with Paul was yesterday. However, he does offer a solution in the form of his Waylord. Nothing in the ocean around the city is faster than it, so there's no reason why it wouldn't be able to get them out there in a reasonable time, and considering that they may need some help, Marlin says that he'll go with them. It's here that the gym leader asks where exactly are they going, and with a serious tone in his voice and look on his face, Paul says there as he points out to the storm that is off the horizon. Ooh, are you sure, Marlin says? That thing's been brewing for about three days now. I wouldn't go there if I were you, but Paul simply retorts, Team Rocket is there, and if they're there, that means that's where we need to be. After all, there's only one thing they seek, and it's ultimate power. If you say so, Marlin says as they begin to sail off on Waylord's back. It takes about an hour or so to get to the actual storm, but once they hit the borders of the Torrential Typhoon, it becomes harder and harder for Waylord to push through the waves. Though its massive size does provide some sort of stability in the water, the size of those waves are even too big for it to handle, and our heroes end up getting tossed side to side while the giant beast does its best to navigate the choppy waters. Luckily for the trio, it doesn't take long, and Waylord is able to break into the eye of the storm, where there's no no cloud coverage and the waters are calm even 
with the sun shining down. This is where something captures the attention of Marlin and his waylord. It can't be, the water type specialist says. That's supposed to be sunken. What do you mean, Paul replies. Marlin points. Above them floats a set of ruins that used to be at the bottom of the sea. Marlin confirms this, saying that he's dived this spot several times. It's somewhat of a tourist attraction in the area. If you have a Pokemon that can reach the depth, and you can hold your breath long enough, of course. Are you sure? Iris responds. Marlin says that he is. He recognizes the pillars and the artwork all over the shrine. He would know this place anywhere. But why is it floating above them? It's here that they hear the crack of a ball, and Paul has released Seismitoad. I don't know, he says, but whatever the reason, we need to be up there. Telling his frog that they need to be up where those ruins are, Seismitoad grabs Paul and jumps into the sky as high as it can, barely able to grip the bottom of the ancient ruins. Well, I'm not going to be left out, Iris says, as she cracks the ball for Dragonite, telling it that she needs to go up there where Paul is. Reluctantly, the dragon does as her trainer asks, grabbing her and lifting her into the sky. And this leaves Marlin pondering on how exactly he's going to get up to the ruins, because normally he's used to swimming down to them, not going up in the air to try and get to them. It's here we pan up to see Paul on Seismato's back as it slowly scales the side of the ruins, making its way to the platform above. As the inches closer and closer, the black stone begins to resonate harder and harder, warning Paul of impending danger. This is where Iris on Dragonite's back pulls up to Paul and Seismatoad, asking what the plan is. Paul says it's simple. Whatever Giovanni is planning, we stop it and get this Meloetta back. Solid plan, Iris says, as they bridge the top of the ruins, staying out of sight, trying to get any type of vantage point on Team Rocket and what they're doing. After scouting about for a while, Paul and Iris are able to make their way to the front of the ruins. It's here they see Giovanni holding that mirror that he found in Reversal Mountain, and Meloetta on some sort of altar. Iris begins to ask a question as Boss Rocket begins to speak, forcing Paul to tell her to be quiet. They need to hear this. Today is the day we've been waiting for since we came to the Unova region. Everything that you guys have done has led to this moment, Gio says. So what is exactly supposed to happen here, Meow says. To which Giovanni responds that this place is known as the Altar of the King. In ancient times, it's said that Meloetta gave the King the ability to control the forces of nature themselves, and with it, they they ruled over a power that no one dare challenge. It is my aim to recapture this power and use it to crush people in my way like that nuisance Team Plasma. Well, exactly how does it work, James asks, to which Giovanni says, let me show you, with a sadistic smile. With Meloetta on its place on the altar, Giovanni then sets the mirror directly across from it. Meloetta's reflection appears in the glass, causing it to glow, then what seems to be some sort of signal shoots out over the sky, expanding over the region of Unova, followed by nothing. Well, that's really anticlimactic, Jesse retorts, to which Giovanni just says, wait. Suddenly, they can feel the forces of the storm that is around them. High winds and gusts and what feels like an earthquake on levitating ruins. Then, with a strike of thunder and a flash of light, the three forces of nature, Landris, Thunderous, and Tornadus, appear above the ruins in the sky. This instantly brings back bad memories for Jesse, James, and Meowth, as the last time those three were around them, things got a little bit dicey, and the twerp isn't here to save them. However, Giovanni simply chuckles. It's time. My plans have finally come full fruition. By ordering the forces of nature to look into their reflection in the reveal glass, Giovanni triggers something primal in them, causing them to contort, reverting them to a form that doesn't seem natural to what they've displayed in the past. At this action, two things happen. The first is that Meloetta is then jolted awake by a sudden shock of pain, signifying somehow there is an energy link between it and the three forces of nature. And the second thing is, these forces of nature have their power exponentially increased as they begin to influence the storm around them as the winds gust violently and lightning strikes all around everyone. This leaves us panning over to Paul and Iris. The black stone is resonating intently. These creatures are not something that Paul or her can let unleashed upon the world. All of Zekrom's thoughts and its feelings are flooding into our hero. He knows the time for hiding is over. He has to confront Giovanni, but they need a plan. This is where Paul turns to Iris, telling her they need to break up the trio. If they try to fight them all at once, then things will be impossible. But if they can get them alone, then they will have a chance. Well, what do you want me to do, Iris says. This is where Paul tells her that he will be the distraction, and it's going to be her job to use Dragonite and draw the attention of the other two. Lead them both down to the ocean level where Marlin can battle one of them. You two keep them as far apart from each other as possible, while I and my Pokemon handle the third one. It's here that Paul releases both Gastrodon and Sigalith, telling them that he's going to need their help. It's 
up to Sigilith to find a way to break Meloet out of its confinements, while Gastrodon is going to run defense for the trainer. It's time to use a little bit of that counter shield technique he stole from Ash back in Sinnoh. With the plan in place, Iris takes off on Dragonite, readying her position, while Paul walks out to confront Giovanni. It's not hard to get Boss Rocket's attention, as the sight of Paul is something that he is a little bit infuriated with. This boy has been nothing but a nuisance in his side. However, that's going to end today, Giovanni says, as he orders the three Therian legendaries to attack their new prey. The first up is Thunderous as it strikes down with a thunder attack. However, Paul's plan is set into full motion, with Castrodon putting up a counter shield protecting its trainer. This also blocks the other two incoming attacks. It's here that Paul goads Boss Rocket. What's the matter? I thought these were supposed to be legendary Pokemon, yet they can't get past a simple Gastrodon. Oh, I'll show you the power of legendaries, Giovanni says, as he orders all three of them to strike at once. This is where Iris comes in, as she bolts down on Dragonite's back, taking out one of the legendaries pointed down to the sea, where Marlin has been patiently waiting, only to find Iris with the Pokemon and tail saying, here you go Marlin, this one's for you. Dragonite then uses its superior speed to evade an attack from Tenetus, drawing the ire of Waylord, to which Marlin can only say that this isn't cool, he wasn't ready for that kind of fight. However, Waylord speaks to the contrary, as it bursts a giant stream of water from its spout in the form of the attack that strikes Tornadus, making Waylord the sole target of its aggression. Over with Iris, her and Dragonite are back up on top again, this time drawing the attack of Thunderous. Dragonite uses Thunder Punches to deflect the attacks of the Legendary, as its trainer sits on the back of the dragon, taunting Thunderous that her dragon is far more powerful than it could ever hope to be. This sends the Electro-type into a frenzy as it takes off trying to attack Dragonite. Iris tells Dragonite they need to hurry. They have to pull Thunderous as far away from the other two as possible. With that, it takes out over the open ocean, heading into the storm. This just leaves Giovanni with the third force of nature, Landris. So, you hope to weaken me by splitting up my three legendaries. Well, I got news for you. In these new forms, nothing you do can stand to their power. Oh, I'll have to disagree, Paul says, as he pulls out the black orb, initiating the transformation between Electivire and Zekrom. Didn't you learn last time, boy? That won't work against me, especially when I'm in possession of this, Giovanni says as he holds up the mirror. You know, I've had some time to think about that, and after seeing what happened here, I've come to a conclusion. The only way that mirror is actually going to be of any use to you is if you keep it on that altar. I have a theory that if it leaves that place for whatever reason, then that means that your transformations of these legendaries are going to weaken and eventually fade, giving us a chance to take back over. Would you risk your one trump card in the name of trying to gain an advantage? Geo simply laughs. What kind of fool do you take me for? You actually think I would fall for your trick of trying to get me to actually take the mirror off. I would never risk anything like that, especially when I have full control. Look at this. As long as Meloetta and the mirror are in place, my beasts will reign supreme. And first I will take out you, and then I'll move on to the rest of Unova, restoring the glory of Team Rocket. Well, if you're so confident in the power of your legendaries, let's test it against mine, Paul says, as he orders Electivire to use a fusion bolt. The Dragon Oni draws in all the surrounding electricity as it charges for one of its most powerful attacks, only for a Giovanni to laugh. He can't believe the arrogance of this kid and him thinking that Landris would be affected by an electric type move like that. However, Giovanni proves to be an arrogant one as this was merely a distraction, allowing Electivire to get in close so that way it can attack with the move that it truly wanted to. A brick break that cracks the legendary on the head, causing it to falter in its levitation. You think I don't know my type matchups, old man? That's something even the most basics of trainers know. I, per se, don't really care about type matchups. All I care about is the ability to win which I'm very confident that Electrovire is going to. Paul's attitude towards the whole situation causes something in Giovanni to boil over. His frustration with this kid has reached the point to where he can't take it anymore. The pure insolence of this brat is something that Giovanni will no longer tolerate. It's at this point that something happens. Giovanni's eyes begin to glow red, as do Landorus's and Thunderus's and Tornadus's. All three legendaries begin to glow in a rage-filled aura, and then begin attacking randomly, destroying anything around them, doesn't matter friend or foe, causing whatever havoc that they can. Luckily for Paul and Electivire, Gastrodon is there to provide a counter shield protecting it from any type of weather attacks that come its way. Though he is blind with rage, the sight of Paul evading every one of the attacks from his legendaries is enough to send Giovanni into a frenzy, which in turn influences the legendaries even more, sending them on a whirlwind trip to destroy anything and everything in sight. The surrounding storm begins to intensify, closing in on the ruins that float above the ocean. This is where the waters again become choppy, and Waylord is unable to keep up with the swimming as it is battling the legendary Tornadus. This gives the Windrider 
the ability to overtake the giant whale with a hurricane that strikes it, sending it to the bottom of the ocean. Over with Iris, the intensity of the thunder clouds are not working to her favors, as now Dragonite is not only being forced to dodge the attacks of Thunderous, but also the wild lightning strikes of the surrounding weather. While her dragon is fast, it's still not fast enough to evade, and eventually it and its trainer are struck down, sending them careening into the waves below. This just leaves us with Paul, as Electivire is busy trying to subdue Landorus and its rage before it destroys the very platform that they stand on. Unfortunately for our hero, the scuffle between his Pokemon and the Legendary is too much for him to try and get to Giovanni's area. He doesn't have the way around to try and get to the glass and free Meloetta or the reveal glass. However, this is where Sigilith comes in. It has made its way to Meloetta, trying to use its psychic powers to break whatever link that is had on this Legendary Pokemon. Unfortunately, the energy feedback from the reveal glass is way too strong, and Sigilith just doesn't have the power to fulfill what its trainer desires. This results in the psychic type being overtaken, as it is shocked and knocked unconscious. Realizing there's really only one chance, Paul tells Gastrodon that he needs to get to that altar. Use its ability for the counter shield to protect him at all costs. The sea slug plants itself firmly on the ground. As Paul takes off, it fires its counter shield to evade any stray lightning bolts and help defer the two clashing Pokemon away from its trainer. With a stroke of luck, or just a miracle, Paul is able to make his way around the battle, over to the altar where Giovanni stands. However, the intelligent person that Paul was goading into all this is now just a senseless, mindless beast, babbling nonsense as he drools from the mouth. His mind has been consumed by the power of the reveal glass. This all but confirms Paul's suspicion as to what the reveal glass truly is. It is a device that shows the true self of whoever is within its reflection. For the legendaries, it showed these transformations. When it was around Electivire, when it was fused, it defused him, forcing him back to its regular form. And then Paul looks at Meloetta from the glass. He notices something. Meloetta doesn't look the same as when it's on the table. Is it possible, he thinks? This is where Paul gets an idea. He's going to need Electivire's help, but there is a slight problem. He notices the other two forces of nature coming in as they begin to attack Electivire from the sky. They have no choice. They have to do it now. Electivire, I need you to use Bolt Strike. Aim for the mirror. The Oni looks over at Paul, realizing that its trainer is extremely close to its target. For a second, it begins to question the orders. However, Paul tells it he knows. Just do it. Without a second thought, the Oni begins to charge as much electricity as it can as it bolts up into the sky, leaving all of the legendaries pondering what happens next. Although Paul knows all too well as he returns Sigilith and runs for whatever cover he can find. Just as he gets off of the altar, Electivire comes crashing down, shattering the entire shrine that levitates above the ocean into two separate pieces. The force of this strike is enough to cause a defusion between Electivire and the Black Stone, as well as shatter the mirror, returning the three forces of nature to their ordinary forms. Giovanni, from the stress of the situation, falls unconscious, leaving Jesse, James, and Meowth to gather their boss and find a way off of this rock before it sinks. Paul looks around him. Both Electivire and Gastrodon are completely out of energy. He returns his two Pokemon as the ruins begin to fall towards the water. And just as he braces for impact, he notices one shard of the mirror at his feet. This may come in handy, he says, as he picks it up, pocketing it for later. However, this action could cost him, as both sides of the ruins come careening down into the water with a giant splash, just as Iris and Dragonite fly overhead, looking for their friend. The last thing she sees is the ruins sink below the waves, with no sign of Paul in sight. This brings Iris to tears as she doesn't know what's going on, but luckily for her and Dragonite, Waylord and Marlin emerge from the depths with Paul in tow. While he's a little bit beaten up, and currently unconscious, he will be alright. Iris quickly heads down to Waylord, embracing both Marland and Paul, thankful that they are alright. This brings Paul to, only for him to request that Iris release him. She does so, as she lets happy tears erupt from her eyes. Later that night, at the Pokemon Center, Iris is talking with Paul, trying to make sure that he's okay. Paul insists that he's fine, he's never been better. He's just glad that this whole mess with Team Rocket is out of the way. But now, they have to find Ash, because there's still one set of people that are looking for the orbs of you and that is Team Plasma, Paul says, as he holds the shard of the reveal glass in his hand. And that is where we are going to end our story for today. So tell me, how did you feel about this part? Did you enjoy the way that I put a spin on the rocket arc using Paul and Electivire instead of Ash and Pikachu? I really enjoyed telling that part of the story, considering you don't really get a perspective of a rival becoming a main character. How did you feel about Paul and him bringing back his Gastrodon to help with the counter shield technique to provide some sort of support? And 
what happened to Meloetta? Was it still attached to the ruins as it went under? Also, what's going to become of Giovanni? Will he be coming back to seek revenge against Paul and Electivire? And what kind of importance is that shard of the reveal glass going to play? Let me know in the comments down below. We begin today's episode with Paul and Iris as they enter the boundaries of her hometown, Opelucid City. Their trip from the beaches of Humalau had taken about a week, to which it should have only taken two to three days. Unfortunately, Iris has been dragging her feet, doing whatever she can to prevent them from arriving, as there seems to be a reason she doesn't want to be here. However, Paul didn't really care. This is the site of his last badge, and where they're supposed to meet Ash. So whether she likes it or not, they were going to end up here eventually, and Paul was the reason why they ended ended up getting here in a week rather than two. Iris' insistence on procrastination has really been getting under Paul's skin as of late, and this has caused him to be a little bit more abrasive than usual towards her, and she doesn't really seem to understand why. However, there has been one thing that has been made clear. Iris seems to have an issue particularly with the gym leader of Alpo Lucid City. However, whatever that issue is, she seems to be tight-lipped about it. Not that Paul would care about it either way. But unfortunately for Iris, regardless of how she feels, the two soon find themselves at the gym doors. Iris is almost in tears, pleading with Paul not to go inside. She doesn't think she's ready to face Drayden. Regardless if you're ready, I have to in order to get my final badge for the league. So whether you like it or not, I'm going inside. It's your choice to wait out here or to come inside with me, Paul says as he enters the building. Reluctantly, Iris hangs her head as she follows him inside. However, the two won't have to wait long as they are greeted with the sight of an old companion, Ash and Pikachu, as they are in their final moments with the gym badge battle against the leader, Drayden. Infernape's blaze has taken effect and given it the power that it needed to crush this Haxorus, ending the battle and earning Ash his eighth and final badge of the Unova region, the Legend Badge. So, it seems your skills haven't dulled, Paul says, catching both Drayden and Ash's attention. While the Dragon-type master is stoic and doesn't really respond to anything, Paul is excited to see his friends. It's been about a month and a half since they last parted ways, and he is eager to catch up with them. However, Paul and Iris quickly find that Ash is not alone, as the one person that this all started with, N, is present with him. Before Paul can say anything, N addresses him. So Zekrom finally chose you, did it? Wait, how did you know? It spoke to me long before we had even met. It needed you to come to terms and get over things with your Electivire before you would be able to handle the power that it was trying to bestow upon you. But it's good to see that you found yourself and your Pokemon. That means that Zekrom and your bond is truly one. This is where Drayden joins the group with a very deep <clears throat> This causes the attention of the group to shift to the gym leader. However, his gaze is on none other than Iris. Internally, she is panicking. This was the exact thing she was afraid of. And now she has to face Drayden down. However, what she was mentally envisioning is the exact opposite that happens. As Drayden grabs her, lifting her in the air, telling her that it's so good to see her. He was really worried about her. This confuses Iris, as when she left, she wasn't exactly on good terms. And she kind of abandoned her teachings under the tutorship of the Dragon Master. The only thing she can do is question Drayden on if he is actually mad at her or not. Oh my heavens no, I knew that you may need to walk your own path. I was just upset when you had left because I wasn't sure if you were in any type of danger or not. I really wish you would have said something to us. It would have been okay with me if you wanted to follow your own path. Sometimes that's just what people have to do. And I can see by the look of your Aksu and the confidence that you've gained, it was exactly what was needed. Suddenly, all of that internal dread that Iris was feeling just melts away, knowing that Drayden still has confidence in her. However, this is quickly changed when Drayden requests to test her newfound confidence with a Pokemon battle. He wants to see if she truly was able to find what she was looking for out on the road. This is where Ash encourages Iris, telling her that he is really strong. Infernape was able to win, but it took its Blaze ability to activate before it could actually beat that Haxorus. So if you want to become a Dragon Master, Drayden's definitely the one you want to battle against. All Paul can do is hang his head. It's like Ash wasn't even present for the conversation that just happened. However, Iris eventually comes around to this idea, accepting Drayden's invitation for a one-on-one -on -one battle. After all, she has a a new Pokemon that nobody but Paul knows she has. So with that, those two head to the battlefield, preparing themselves for a one-on-one -on -one battle. This is where Paul requests to talk with Ash. There's some things that he needs to fill him in on since they've been apart, to which Ash agrees as a lot has happened to him as well. And 
and because N doesn't really have an affinity for Pokemon battles, he decides to join both Paul and Ash, considering this conversation does concern both the white and black stones. Outside of the gym, in a very private place, Paul begins to unload, telling everything that has happened to Ash. He explains about Reversal Mountain, to which N confirms that that is the resting place of Zekrom, and that is where it's meant to be. However, Paul was unable to deliver it there, and Team Rocket was the ones who interfered with it. They dug something up, something that Giovanni had referred to as the Reveal Glass. It ended up being some sort of ancient artifact that controlled a Pokemon known as Meloetta, and the three forces of nature that we were battling against. Wait, you mean Landorus, Thunderous, and Tornadus? That's right, Paul says. It caused them to transform into these more powerful, primal versions of themselves, and it took everything that Zekrom and Electivire had to put them down. It's here that Paul pulls out a piece of the Reverse Glass. The only way we were able to stop everything was by shattering the mirror, and this is the only piece that remains. However, we were able to stop Team Rocket, as Jesse and James took their boss to Arceus only knows where. Hopefully, we won't be seeing them again. So how about you, Paul says, were you able to get the stone to the ruins that they needed to be at? Well, I did make it there, Paul says. Unfortunately, we ran into some problems. What kind of problems, he asks. Well, Team Plasma was there, searching for the White Stone. They had taken N captive in hopes of gaining any type of information, so me and my Pokemon interfered trying to save N and stop Team Plasma all at the same time. Unfortunately, we were met with some unfortunate circumstances. Team Plasma has a dragon that is very similar to both Zekrom and Reshram, and it was able to best Infernape when it was transformed. What do you mean, best Infernape? Exactly how it sounds, Ash says. Infernape lost. This dragon was like a cold and emotionless husk. It sapped all of the heat from the air, causing Infernape's transformation to fade. And then there's Crocodile. What, was it still being a menace? The last time I saw you guys, it wasn't really listening to you. It was more than that, Ash says. It tried to attack me, literally trying to end my life. Luckily, Infernape was there to stop it. But then during the battle with Team Plasma, it did something that I didn't think even it would do. It took the White Stone after Infernape's transformation faded from battling that ice monstrosity, and it gave it to them. It gave it to Team Plasma, and then Crocodile just took off and I haven't seen it since. Paul clenches his fist. He can feel nothing but anger. He's angry at Ash, but he's also angry at Team Plasma. I knew it wasn't a good idea to leave you alone, Paul says. This is my fault. However, N contradicts this, telling Paul that he did exactly what he had to do. There was a reason that Zekrom was pulling you to Reversal Mount, and you went there. And because you did, and because you trusted Zekrom, you were able to stop Team Rocket from using the power of Meloetta and the theory and forces of nature. So, you did exactly what you needed to do, and you were exactly where you needed to be. Don't be hard on Ash or yourself for making a choice that you knew was right. Okay, so where do we go from here then, Anne? Unfortunately, we don't know. We haven't seen nor hide or hair of Team Plasma since they got the White Stone. It was at that point that me and Ash decided the best course of action was to come here to talk with Drayden and earn Ash his last gym badge in the process. Well, what were you able to find out from him? Actually, we never got that far because Ash wanting to battle Drayden took over and, well, you saw the results of it. And replies as he looks at Ash, Yeah, but now that I got my badge, that means we can talk with Drayden. And then after that, Paul, you can battle Drayden as well so you can get your last badge. Paul says nothing, merely contemplating what their next course of action is because it seems that neither one of them has thought about it. But his thoughts are interrupted when both Iris and Drayden come outside, telling our heroes that they had a great battle. So why don't they come inside so everybody can get to know each other? Once inside, Paul gets right to the point, asking Drayden what he knows about the white and black orbs. I appreciate your tenacity, young lad. If you would kindly give me a moment, I'll be more than happy to answer this question. You see, thousands of years ago, Unova was a very different place. The Pokemon you know as Zekrom and Reshram, they didn't exist here. But one day, a visitor came from the stars, an asteroid carrying with it something that wasn't natural to this world. It slammed into the force of the earth with the might of a god. This phenomenon is what caused the original single landmass that existed here on earth to break up, causing all of the land to divide across the globe to form continents and different regions. However, that asteroid, the center of it, is what remained here in Unova. But it wasn't just a normal asteroid. There was a visitor that was now trapped here on our planet. And it was a being of great power. It had the ability to influence facets of nature like no one else before it. But this creature could also be influenced by man, individuals with strong truths or ideals. This eventually caused the creature to split 
into three different beings, three different dragons, the ones you know as Reshram and Zekram. But what most people don't know is there is a third one, Kirim, the original body of this creature, if you will. It is devoid of any and all virtues waiting for someone to make it whole once again. However, over the course of history, Zekrom and Reshram have come to play a very important role in the ecosystems of the region of Unova. You see, every thousand years or so, they will awaken, spending their time absorbing as much of nature energy as they possibly can. And then, when it comes time, they will revert back to their stone forms and head back to the places that we call the White and Black Altars. It is here that they spend the next thousand years dissipating the energy that they have absorbed into the Unova region, allowing for nature and the weather to flow in a natural harmony. But every so often, something happens that forces the dragons to sleep prematurely. However, if they are forced to sleep before the cycle ends, then they will not have enough energy to dissipate back into Unova, which could cause catastrophes to form in the balance of the nature in the region. So, in order to help this, they choose avatars that could handle their power, as they they slowly spend their time gathering up as much nature energy as possible before they truly begin their next cycle. That's why your two Pokemon have been chosen. The elements of fire and electricity are the base nature elements of your two Pokemon and those two dragons. They were perfectly compatible. However, in order for them to be able to lend their power to these avatars, the trainers that they are with, they have to be of a sound mind and soul. If they are not, and the Pokemon do not have a perfect alignment with them, then it will cause the avatar Pokemon that they have chosen to run wild. That's exactly what happened to Electifier. Ash says. However, Paul doesn't acknowledge him except for to say to be quiet so he can finish listening to the story. Drayden goes on to tell the two that their Pokemon have been chosen and it's their job to make sure that both Zekrom and Reshrom get the energy that they need before their next sleep cycle truly begins. If they don't, then it will be at the cost of the future of Unova. Great, Paul says. And Ash doesn't have his stone anymore. That means that we have to get it back. Yeah, I know, Paul, but I don't even know where to begin to start looking. Well, I have one more thing that I have to take care of before before I can help you. Pulling out a Pokeball, Paul challenges Drayden to a gym battle tomorrow. First thing, he wants a chance to battle Drayden's best at their peak, so he wants to make sure they're well rested. Drayden simply laughs. I'll be more than happy to accept your challenge. On one condition though, I want you to use your full power. I want to see the power that Zekrom has bestowed upon you. Paul simply smiles. Oh, don't worry. I don't intend on holding back. That night at the Pokemon Center, Ash gets a chance to talk to Paul one-on-one -on -one once more, inquiring about his strategy to take on the Dragon Master. This is where he learns about the Pokemon Junior World Tournament that they were in, and how I'll was acting funny throughout the whole thing, and Paul came to find out that Trip is the grandson of the regional champion, which explains a whole lot if you think about it. And Paul also explains that Palpatine evolved during his battle with Iris to clinch him the match, allowing him to face Trip in the finals. While Paul won the tournament, he still lost his battle against Alder, which he's a bit sore about, but his hope is that he'll get into the Unova League and get a chance to face the champion again, whether it's one on one or six on six. He knows that next time the results will be different. Ashton asked Paul. Paul what his plans are for his gym battle in the morning. What's his strategy? Paul tells Ash that he really doesn't have one. Normally, he is very tactful when he enters gym battles, but Drayden requested that I use my strongest Pokemon, and that included Electivire, so I know for sure that it will be involved. But as for the other ones, I don't really know at this current time. Well, it's going to be a fun battle to watch, Ash says, as we fade to the next morning. Paul and Drayden find themselves standing across from each other inside of the gym. The two say nothing, but share a look of intensity. Drayden is curious about this Guardian of the Black Stone. He wants to know what kind of power he truly wields. The ref declares that this will be a three-on-three, -three and the battle will be over when one side's Pokemon are all unable to battle. Then, he calls for the start of the match, with Drayden wasting no time sending in his first Pokemon, Flygon. The dragon type beats its majestic wings as it soars into the air, ready for its first opponent of the day. While Paul was having trouble deciding on his choices, he knows the perfect Pokemon to take this on, something that can match its speed, power, and bounce. As he declares, Seismitoad, stand by for battle. Paul's newest of all Pokemon hits the field, springing in into action. Drayden wastes no time taking the first move, ordering his Flygon in with a rock slide. However, Paul is quick to counter this with a mud shot. Iris comments that that was a pretty intense move. However, Ash just follows up saying that they're both testing each other out right now, trying to get a feel for what the other can do. And this is evident when Drayden tells Flygon to climb as high as it possibly can. They're gonna try something fun. 
However, Paul isn't the type to let anybody get the advantage on him, ordering Seismitoad to jump as high as it can and catch the dragon. However, this is exactly what Drayden was hoping for, as he orders one move that could set Paul's entire strategy off kilter, with a dragon tail that drives Seismitoad right into the gut back down to the ground. While the move itself wasn't that bad, it has an unforeseen effect as it sends Seismitoad back into its Pokeball, forcing Paul to choose his next Pokemon. This is where Paul finds out what Drayden's strategy really is. He understands who exactly he's trying to bring out. He wants Electivire. However, Paul doesn't want to resort to Electivire right off the bat. He wants to conserve it for as long as possible as he's not still fully sure on what Drayden can do. So, he makes his second choice for the match. Enbor, stand by for battle! The Fire Pig hits the field, snorting a burst of flame, signaling that it's ready to take on the dragon type hovering above it. Not quite the choice I wanted, Drayden thinks to himself. However, we can still make this work. Flygon, use Earth Power! The dragon dives steadily into the ground, causing the gym floor to begin to crack and be become molten underneath the feet of Embor. However, Paul's not going to let his fire type just take the damage, ordering a fire pledge. Using its thick arms, the pig punches into the ground, sending bolts of fire through it that find their target in Flygun, scorching the dragon as it takes back to the air letting out a brief cry of pain at the first damage it has finally taken. While this Pokemon isn't the one he was hoping for, he is happy by the choice, as he gets to test the merit of this fire type a little bit more. As he orders Flygon in with another rock slide, suddenly boulders begin to hover around it as it uses its tail to bat them down at Embor, trying to hit the wild bacon in order to cause some damage. But again, Paul has the perfect counter in this, calling for an arm thrust that steadily breaks the boulders, shattering them as the two Pokemon meet eye to eye with Drayden making another command for a Dragon Tail. This again has the same effect, forcing Embor back into its Pokeball and Paul to choose another Pokemon. However, he's not going to play Drayden's game, sending back in Seismitoad. Still not the Pokemon that Drayden won, but he can play this game for a while. However, Paul is of a different mind. He's not going to let this old man chip away at each one of his Pokemon until there's nothing left but one fresh one, so he needs to end this with the next couple of moves. However, luckily for him, he has an idea on how he can finally get this Flygon into a position to where he could end a battle ending blow. Starts with Flygon's next move, Rock Slide. Drayden seems to want to use this as a momentary diversion. However, Paul knows exactly what he needs to do with this, telling Seismitoad to use the boulders like platforms as they come flying towards it. Jump from boulder to boulder to make its way up until Flygon. That way, it can't use that moment of temporary blindness to get an upper edge on them. This movement catches Drayden off guard, as Flygon can't get a lock on Seismitoad as it's jumping from boulder to boulder. This is where Paul turns Drayden's trick on him, ordering for a sludge wave that blankets the field of vision for Flygon, blinding it in the process. Quick, Flygon, use another rock slide. Try to break this, Drayden orders. However, it's too late as Seismitoad has made its way to Flygon, and with one fail swoop, hits it with an icy wind that drives it into the ground, and ending the battle with this four times effective damage on the dragon type. Impressive, young man. That was quite the show. I didn't think that you would be able to figure out my strategy that quickly. You seem to be a very tactician style battleist. I can't wait till you get to see my next Pokemon. However, Paul says nothing, merely focused on the task at hand. This is his eighth gym badge, and he's not going to let some old man prevent him from earning it. Wasting little time, Drayden sends in his next Pokemon. Hi Dragon, go! The triple mouth lizard emerges with a ferocity that strikes fear into both Seismitoad and a little into Paul. This pseudo legendary is very powerful. It's something that is noticed right off the bat by everyone in attendance. However, Paul isn't going to let this stop him. He chooses to keep a distance until he understands what this thing is capable of, ordering a hydro pump from his frog. However, he quickly finds out why this head dragon is so powerful, as this hydro pump is countered with a dragon pulse, and it's not just one head that counters, but all three. The power is overwhelming as the darkness of this dragon pulse pushes through the hydro pump, driving Seismitoad into a wall. While this isn't enough to end the water type, it's clear that damage was massive, and one more hit like that could end its tenants in this battle. Knowing that it's best to give it some rest, Paul recalls it, choosing for his fire starter once again. Embor, stand by for battle! The fighting type hits the field with a thud, ready to take on the pseudo legendary. Paul chooses to use type advantage here, hoping that Embor's fighting type will give him just the edge needed to put the pseudo legendary down and get him one step closer to his gym badge. Paul starts the battle with a fire pledge, hoping to catch this thing off guard. However, Hydreigon is no fool and neither is its trainer, as they simply order a dark pulse that easily overpowers the move hitting Embor. Luckily for Paul, 
and the pig, there is a resistance to the dark type move, so this prevents a massive amount of damage. However, Paul can't let it think it can get a free hit like that in again. He needs to lure High Dragon in, and he thinks he has just the way to do it. Embor, are you good to go? The pig snorts a bellow of fire once more, signaling that it's ready. Alright then, it's time to turn on the fire. Use Heat Crash! The pig surrounds itself in fire as it barrels down the field, throwing all of its weight into this tackle. However, Drayden has a move specifically set up to counter fire types, as he orders High Dragon to use a Zen headbutt. While the dark type is easy for those two to resist, a psychic type move is a completely other story. And Paul can do nothing but watch as the two heads that are on the arms of Hydreigon crash into the pig, stopping it cold, or for so Drayden thought. This is exactly what Paul wanted, as he knew this would trigger one thing from Enbor. It's blaze, as the flames around it begin to surge, intensifying its heat crash, giving it the power to push through the Zen headbutts and actually connect with the full body of Hydreigon. However, this is not enough to drop the pseudo-legendary, as it merely just shakes off the fire-type attack that it just took. Luckily for Paul, Enbor is now enraged for close-up fighting, and this allows it to to fire an arm thrust at the command of its trainer. While two of them are actually able to connect, the third and fourth one are caught by the two heads of Hydreigon, while the third one lets out the final attack of this battle, a dragon pulse that drops Enbor, ending any hope that Paul had of his fire type gaining a victory here. Recalling Mr. Pig, Paul stares silently at the ball, proud of what his starter was able to do. Still wanting to preserve his last Pokemon, Paul chooses Seismitoad, stand by for battle. Hitting the field once more, Seismitoad is ready for its third and final stand in this fight. It's going to do whatever it can to try and cause any damage to this behemoth of a dragon. Drayden takes the first move, calling for a dragon pulse. Luckily, Seismitoad has the speed to jump out of the way just in time before getting hit. This allows it to counter back with the mud shot that is able to actually connect. Paul realizes that he's going to have to stay as long range as possible if he has any hopes of dropping this dragon with Seismitoad. So, he goes on the offensive again, ordering a sludge wave. However, Hydreigon has the perfect counter for this ordering a flamethrower that just incinerates the poison type move. What can we do, Paul thinks to himself. There has to be some way to create an opening. However, with those three heads, it's easier said than done. This is where Paul notices something about Hydreigon. One of its heads, the left one, it seems to be struggling a little bit, like it can't stay completely up. Maybe Enbor's arm thrust did a little bit more damage than he thought it did. This could be his opportunity. So, instead of trying to take on all three at once, let's specifically target them. Try and take it out one by one. This is where Paul orders Seismitoad in, breaking his plan for a long range attack. Seismitoad is easily able to avoid a flamethrower and a dragon pulse, getting in close, and then at the command of Paul, lands an icy wind on the left head. While this isn't enough to drop the dragon as a whole, it does freeze that head, preventing any more attacks to come from it. However, this did come at a cost, as now Seismitoad is pushed back into the gym wall with a dark pulse that ends this battle. Paul recalls his toad happy with the results that he just received. Now, his final Pokemon can bring them home. Electivire, stand by for battle. The Oni hits the field ready to take on any challenge that's placed before it. Finally, Drayden says, let's see exactly what this thing can do. With the start of the battle, Drayden orders Hydreigon to use a Dark Pulse. However, Electivire is the most conditioned Pokemon that Paul has, and this simply won't stand up to a simple Brick Break from the Oni. Driving it through, allowing it to crack one of the heads with the fighting type move, quickly dropping the dragon and bringing it to an end. Not even a transformation, Drayden thinks, and he was able to do that with an Electivire? This is going to get good. Drayden recalls his pseudo-legendary, preparing for the final battle. Iris knows exactly who's coming out. Drayden's oldest and strongest Pokemon, the ace of his dragon squad of Unova. Haxorus, your turn. The Axe Dragon hits the field, staring down Electivire, ready for the challenge that stand before it. This is where Drayden engages with Paul once more, telling him that he wants his very best. He wants to push his dragon to the limit, and he wants to see what the Chosen can do what they are truly capable of. You want to see the extent of our power? Fine then. Pulling out the black stone, Paul tells Electivire it's time as they begin to resonate, taking on the transformation. The Onin is now surging with electricity as it pulsates in this new form. Drayden is happy with what lies before him. He can't wait for his Haxorus to get a chance to test its might. The battle starts off rather cordial with the two testing a dragon claw with a brick break. While Haxorus does hold its own, it's apparent from the start that Electivire was holding back. Alright then, Haxorus, use Dragon Dance. Jiggling majestically, the dragon focuses, 
raising its speed and attack power. Now let's try that again. Use Dragon Claw. Once again, it is met with a Brick Break. And to no surprise, Electivire is still able to hold it off. This causes the Dragon Master to become a bit stern. Surely a stat buff like that would have been enough to cause some sort of damage. Well then, let's go for Dragon Dance times two, Drayden says. Once again, Haxorus does whatever it can to tighten its attack and its speed, increasing its levels far beyond the normal capability of its species. Let's just see how tough you are, Drayden says. Haxorus, it's time. Use X Scissor. This is where Paul finally decides to put a little bit of effort behind his attack, ordering Electivire to use a fusion bolt. The Yoni jumps into this roof of the gym, nearly disappearing with how dark it is. Then, in a flash of light, drops itself on top of Haxorus in a flare of electricity that surges throughout the gym. While this was not enough to end the dragon, it's clear that Haxorus is after that exchange. You wanted our best, Paul says. So, let me show you exactly what we can do. Electivire, it's time. We're no longer holding back. Use Bolt Strike! The Oni begins drawing in electricity into its body, focusing it into a fist, like it's going to make a punch. The amount of power that is surging at its fingertips, it's clear that if this Bolt Strike hits, it'll cause great damage to the gym and everything around it. This is where Drayden tells Paul to stop. He forfeits. He is satisfied. Paul has demonstrated his ability to wield the stone on a master level and as a worthy guardian of it. Without hesitation, he approaches the boy, presenting him with the eighth and final badge of the Unova region, the Legend Badge. And that, my friends, is where we are going to end today's story. How did you guys feel about this part? Are you happy that Ash is back with the team? Was Iris truly able to resolve all of her issues with Drayden? Did you enjoy Paul's gym battle with the Dragon Master? And of course, are you ready? Because the next episode, we get to start the Unova. Of a leak, and best believe things are going to start flaring up. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. We begin today's episode with our friends arriving at the ultimate goal since they arrived in the Unova region, the site of the Virtuous Conference. This is a week-long event. Each day, trainers are going to have to battle their way through the ranks to secure their top spot. The challenges will be tough, and every battle may be their last. However, Ash and Paul have one goal in mind. They are here to win. Although at this point in the group, Paul is the odds-on favorite because he has the clear advantage over Ash, still in possession of his Dragonic Stone. As the two stand in the opening ceremonies, watching the person light the torch to signify in the start of the event, Paul turns to Ash. Don't let the fact that you lost Reshram's stone be a distraction. You need to bring your A-game here, Ash. I won't accept anything less than us in the finals. Got it? Ash smiles, telling Paul that he wouldn't have it any other way. With the announcement of the tournament ready to start, we can quickly see some familiar faces appearing in this final frontier. Stefan, Cameron, Bianca, and Dino, all former competitors that Ash and Paul have experienced along the road. And let's not forget Trip, the newly revealed grandson of Alder, the champion of the Unova region. Giving the boy a glance, Paul can see that their last battle had an effect on him, but he's not quite sure on what it is. Trip seems slightly reserved, which could be because his confidence has been shaken or because he's planning something. Either way, they're gonna have to wait to find out. But Ash and Paul's rival gazing comes to a halt when Alder makes an appearance at the top stage, welcoming everyone to the Unova League as he signifies the randomization of the battles for all 128 of the participants. Day 1 is going to be single elimination. Each trainer will only get one shot to advance to the top 64, so they must choose their best candidate for a single paddle. While this happens, Iris and N sit in the crowd, watching intently, looking for any signs of anyone that may be involved with Team Plasma. The reason why they are doing this is because when they were with Drayden, N informed everyone that Getsis and Culverus had always made it their plans to unveil their cleansing of the Unova region at the grandest stage of them all. And there is none other than the Virtuous Conference. So N thinks that they could strike soon. And with his sensitivity to the stones, he's the best candidate to keep an eye and a feeling out for any type of disturbance, specifically focusing for the signal of Reshram. Though our heroes are intentive, there's not really much they can do while they're sitting in the crowd. So the rest of the day plays out. Both Ash and Paul have no problems getting past the preliminary using both Pikachu and Embor to clear their way into the top 64. Cameron and his newly evolved Lucario also secure him a win. Bianca and her Mancino have an impressive showing as well. This brings us to Dino and his Heatmore who burn up the competition along with Stefan and his Zeb Stryka who electrifies the crowd. Then there's Trip. 
he easily makes his way past the first round. However, his methods aren't as brutal as what Paul saw in the Junior World Cup. So maybe he actually did get through the kid. And lastly, there is a newcomer that no one's ever met before. Someone by the name of Virgil, whose Espeon was able to psychically clinch a victory in his first match. That brings everything for day one to a close, with Iris and N no closer to finding out any leads to where Team Plasma may be. That night at the Pokemon Center, they have the ability to meet up with both Paul and Ash. This is where N addresses Paul, trying to figure out if there was any type of resonance from the stone. Maybe it was able to pick up something that he wasn't. However, Paul just says Zekrom has been docile, calm, unusually calm, like it's the calm before the storm. I was afraid you would say something like that, N says. We have to stay vigilant. We can't let them get the upper hand on us. After dealing with the forces of nature and Giovanni, Paul is all too aware of the importance of this. However, there's nothing they can do if Team Plasma doesn't make a move. So the group just spends the rest of the night eating and relaxing, preparing for the day ahead. Day two of the Virtuous Conference is much like day one. However, here there is a slight change. Every trainer is going to have to use three Pokemon. Pokemon in order to advance to the top 32. With Ash, this is relatively easy, because he gets the chance to use Excelgor, Boulder, and Snivy to collectively win him his position in the next round, while Paul is very much the same. He doesn't waste any time, quickly closing things out with his Crustal, Excavalier, and Torterra to bring him the win. And just like in day one, Stefan, Cameron, Trip, Virgil, Bianca, and Dino all manage to clear their spot in the top 32. However, this time, Paul gets a chance to view the battle that Trip has because he's the last round of the day. While Trip did win, it seemed like it was a bit of a struggle for the trainer, as his Conkeldor was barely able to bring him the victory. This is the same Pokemon that ruthlessly pummeled its way through the competition in the Junior World Cup. This is where N joins Paul, demonstrating his ability with emotions. You have history with that boy, don't you? He says. However, Paul says nothing, the silence basically confirming what N suspects. Well, you know, you should talk to him. He seems conflicted, like... He's lost his direction. This comment does elicit a response from Paul. His direction is not my problem. This is a competition, and if he can't cut it, then he will be knocked out, whether it's by me or some other trainer, he says, as Paul walks off, leaving N to stare at the young boy with the internal struggles on the battlefield. Now, they come to day three of the conference. This is the top 32. Paul and Ash demonstrate their mastery of the Pokemon they've caught in Unova. Paul uses Copperigus, Seismitoad, and Sigilith to clinch his win into the top 16. While Ash decides to go with Unpheasant, Whirlipede, and Dewat. However, he does have a little bit of a struggle when his Dewat gets paired up with the Steelix. Its overwhelming size was almost too much for the Otter. However, during the match, it was able to learn a new move that brought it victory. Revenge. It was able to drop the Steelix and get Ash his top 16 spot. This just leaves the other combatants. And just like the two prior days, there are certain standouts. Stefan, Cameron, Virgil, Bianca, Dino, and Trip all managed to make their way into the top 16. However, there is a standout star here in the form of Virgil. All of his evolutions are extremely well trained. At this point, he's demonstrated mastery of each of their typings, and, well, he hasn't dropped a single battle to anyone, with each of his evolutions able to carry him to victory in each round. While most are just happy to be inside of the competition and have made it to the top 16, Virgil has caught in the attention of Paul, as even though Paul is on somewhat of a mission here, he does yearn for a strong opponent, and he knows with the competition shrinking, the battles are going to get more intense, and there's a very good chance that he could meet Virgil in the top 16 or above. Now we come to day 4. This is the top 16 match, and Ash is supposed to be the last one up on the card. He's been standing outside, getting ready for his match, preparing on the three Pokemon that he's going to use. While he does have six with him, he hasn't quite decided on which ones he's going to get a chance to send out in this battle. However, things quickly turn south when, out of the corner of his and Pikachu's eyes, it seems like a familiar silhouette catches their attention. No, it can't be, Ash says. Crocodile? Wanting the chance to see if he can make amends with them on and find out why why it betrayed him? Ash takes off into the forest, searching for the Unovan crocodile. However, it doesn't seem like it's going to be an easy find, as whatever he saw has quickly disappeared. Fortunately for Ash and Pikachu, there are footprints that seem to be leading deeper into the forest. The electric mouse reminds its trainer that they're up next, and they don't have time for all this. However, Ash assures it that they will be back in time. He just wants to go take a look. A couple of more minutes, and then they'll head back to the stadium. Ash then runs, taking off, following the footprints deeper into the forest. This brings us back to the stadium. 
Trip has just finished his match, securing his spot in the top 8. The person he managed to beat was Bianca and her Embor. While the battle was a little bit one-sided, as Bianca isn't as skilled as Trip, it still seems like he is dealing with something internally. This just leaves Ash and his opponent, Stefan, being called for the final match. While Stefan is present and accounted for, Ash is nowhere in sight, leaving Paul and Iris to wonder what has just happened to our young hero. Back with Ash, he's made it to a point of the forest where the footprints have disappeared, and he knows that there's no longer any point in searching. With the trail running cold, he begins to turn, heading back to the stadium. However, this is where he's caught in a pitfall trap, as the ground gives way, and both Ash and Pikachu fall into a hole that was dug by something. As Ash and Pikachu begin to gather their senses, they can hear a brief laughing coming from above, followed by a couple of voices. One of them sounds very familiar. That's... it's colorous, Ash says. He begins to scream demanding that the scientists let him out. However, he doesn't get a response at first. That is, until one of the walls of the hole gives way and something bursts through it, slamming both Ash and Pikachu into the other wall. Once the boy's vision comes back into focus, he's being stared down by a very familiar sight. Crocodile, Ash says. I knew it was you. However, the croc is not as happy to see Ash as Ash is to see it. It has a very maniacal look on its face, like at any moment it could take a snap at the boy, ready to send him on to the next life if he will. Then they hear a voice from above. That's good, my pet. Bring them up here. Doing as it's told, Crocodile secures his prey into its clutches, jumping to the top of the hole, allowing Ash and Pikachu to finally see who was above them the whole time. While one of them was indeed colors like Ash thought, the other one is someone that Ash isn't familiar with, but is very familiar with Ash. So you're the one that was chosen by Reshram, are you? Once Ash is able to focus, even though Crocodile is pinning him to the ground, he can finally make out who they are. Colorous and someone who everyone is referring to as Master Getsis. Ash doesn't even acknowledge the question, merely demanding to know who they are and why they have captured him. Feisty guessed it says, well, no matter. We merely need to just keep him separated for now. Keep him detained, so that way we can make sure he doesn't rejoin with the other. That could be a huge problem for our plans, Getsis says. This is where Crocodile backs off and some grunts secure Ash and Pikachu in bindings. While they're being locked down, Ash watches the strangest thing. Crocodile approaches this human that's clad in a black cloak and submits to its feet like this human is its master. That's good, my pet. You have done very well, Getsis says. Wait, your pet? What's going on? That crocodile's mine. This is where Getsis begins to laugh uncontrollably. You actually thought this was yours? Oh, heavens no, my boy. You are severely mistaken. This crocodile is my pet. It belongs to me. I am its master. Always have and always will be. This isn't making sense to Ash. If he belonged to Getsis, then why was he able to catch it? But Getsis offers some clarity on the situation. I said I was its master, not its trainer. I don't use feeble Pokeballs like you do. I make Pokemon submit to my will. Crocodile is no exception to that. However, I do have to thank you for getting it to evolve from its weak sand dial stage. That thing was so useless back then. But now, it's the most useful creature within my arsenal. You can tell that that comment kind of hurt Crocodile a little bit. Like, everything that it's done up to this point has been in order to gain the approval of this human. Ash even comments on this. How dare you talk about Crocodile like that? If it's your Pokemon, then you shouldn't be disrespecting it like that. You should be encouraging it. Look, what you just said, that hurt its feelings. Feelings. But this just causes Getsis to laugh even more. You fool, Crocodile was never my friend. It was merely a means to an end. A tool, if you will. Whether it seeks my approval or not is irrelevant to me. As long as it does what it's told, that is all that matters. Like when I told it to track you and bring me one of the orbs. It did so, though it took longer than I would have expected. However, it fulfilled its mission, becoming stronger in the process, which is something you always want from a tool. Ash can't believe what he's hearing. How could this person think so little of a Pokemon, especially one that seems to do nothing but live for him. And while all this is going on, Crocodile is just taking it, more submissive than Ash has ever seen it. It's like a shadow of its former self. Ash doesn't understand what's happening here. However, he does know one thing. He can't let this continue. He orders Pikachu to try and break its binds with an iron tail. However, the mouse is unable to. This causes Getsis to laugh even more. I'm afraid that won't be happening, boy. You are a problem that needs to be dealt with. If I let you near the other one, then things would 
get out of hand and no longer be in our favor. So I'm going to need you to sit tight just until we secure the second stone. However, gets us nor the grunts really know who Ash is, and he's way too stubborn to idly sit by and let them just do whatever they want, especially when it could cause huge trouble for everyone else involved. And since the grunts were a little bit too overconfident in how they secured the boy and not really binding his legs, Ash uses this to his advantage, jumping to his feet, trying to do whatever he can to free himself or Pikachu. In the process, he's able to free himself enough to where he can bum rush Getsus, tackling into the old man, causing them to both fall to the ground. While Getsus really isn't hurt, more annoyed than anything, one other thing does happen. He hit Colorus' staff, which just so happens to be the trigger for the locking mechanism on both him and Pikachu. With the mouse now free, it begins to fire off thunderbolts in rapid succession, trying to hit anyone or anything in the vicinity so that way he can free his trainer. While the mouse is mildly successful, allowing Ash to get free of his binds and get close to his partner, its little rebellion quickly comes to an end when Crocodile subdues the two once more. However, the thunderbolts being fired off did trigger one thing, and he's nearby and he saw everything from the distance. The green-haired boy begins traversing the forest rapidly, trying to find the source of it, knowing that it was Pikachu. Unfortunately for him, he quickly finds himself inside of the den of Team Plasma, where Ash is being held captive. This is where Ash yells to end that he needs to run. They got him, and they'll get him too. However, the next interaction isn't quite one that he expected when Colorus greets and warmly, asking him to reconsider his offer. This will be the last chance he should rejoin them. However, Getsis just ignores the old man, turning all of his attention to Crocodile. My friend, why would you do something like this? You know that Getsis is using you. What happened to the innocent Pokemon that I used to know? The one that loved life. The one that wanted nothing more than to protect the people around it. Where did that little sand dial go? These words trigger something inside of Crocodile, and for whatever reason, it breaks its hold on Ash and Pikachu. This is where Anne tells Ash, it's time. You need to get out of here. Go. Get back to the stadium and warn the others. Wait, N, what about you, he says. Don't worry about me, Ash. Just go. However, this isn't an option for Ash, as the Team Plasma Grunts begin to converge both on him and Pikachu. However, the one Pokemon that was running the things, Crocodile, seems to be immobile for the most part. This gives Ash the chance to call on Inferno, allowing it to break everything off, giving N, Pikachu, and Ash enough time to get away from Team Plasma. The Grunts begin taking off at the order of Colorus and Getsis, trying to find the two before they get back to the stadium. However, Infernape and Pikachu are easily able to create a distraction, battling off any Pokemon that come their way, while also failing trees in the process to block the paths of the Pokemon and the grunts hunting them. This creates enough of a distance for Ash and N to finally get back to the stadium. Ash stops, asking N what that was all about. What was going on with Crocodile and what do you know? However, N tells Ash that there's no time for this. He has to go find an official and warn them about what just happened. Meanwhile, Ash, you have a battle to get to. Your round was put on hold until now. If you hurry, you may be able to still make it. The threat of Ash getting disqualified from the tournament is enough to cause him to refocus all of his efforts, dashing for the stadium battlefield as quickly as possible. Luckily, he's able to get there in time. Just before the ref decides to call a disqualification, Ash looks down the battlefield to his opponent, Stefan. While it's been a while since they've seen each other, Ash is kind of excited even though all the things he just gone through. He tells Stefan to give it his best battle because he doesn't plan to bring anything less than his A-game. However, Stefan is a little bit peeved that Ash would make him wait this long. It makes him feel like that he's not important, or Ash doesn't consider him a true rival. However, the two's bickering is going to have to wait as the referee has been waiting long enough and he orders the start of the battle. So, Stefan starts with something strong, sending in his life hard. Knowing Ash needs to go in big, and Pikachu can't exactly battle right now due to all the stuff that it just went through, he decides to start with something that could easily win him the first battle of this match. Do what? I choose you! The sea otter emerges from its balls with its double scallop in its hand, ready to take on this life heart. With the signal to start, the two begin exchanging blows. Lipard uses night slashes, trying to tear into Duwat for a massive amount of damage. However, the otter is quick, using Aqua Jet to dodge around and firing back with hits like Air Slash, Razor Shell, that cause a great deal of damage. Duwat is still fresh, so it has the ability to keep this up for long periods of time, causing Lipard and Stefan to get frustrated because they've barely been able to land a hit. However, things don't last forever, and eventually Lipard is able to land a Night Slash on Duwat that hits with a massive amount of damage. This, however, is met with one of Duat's newest moves, as at the command of its trainer, it fires a revenge that hits Lipard, dropping the cat and bringing the first part of this battle to a close. While Stefan isn't happy about the loss, it doesn't really worry him that much. He wanted to gauge to see what Ash was going to bring out, and Lipard allowed him to do that, so he chooses
chooses to start off the next match big going with type advantage as he sends in his Zeb Striker. The four hooved electric monster emerges from the balls, slamming its front legs into the ground, ready for its next battle. While Ash wants to be smart about his choices, the truth is he doesn't really have anything that could take that thing head on right now that isn't at full strength. Both Infernape and Pikachu have battled, and the rest of his team doesn't really have a good matchup against it. So he asks Duot if it's okay with staying in. The otter nods, signifying the start of the battle. However, due to its battle that it had with Lipard, it's not moving a little slow, and this comes into play when he tries to use an Aqua Jet to dodge a wild charge. However, it is able to connect, knocking out the otter, evening up the score between the two trainers. Mulling over the decisions of his second Pokemon, Ash is having trouble deciding on what he wants to use. However, this is where Pikachu decides that it wants to enter. While it is tired from the battles that it had with Team Plasma and the electricity exerted trying to escape them, it knows that it can win this one. It just needs the chance. So, never wanting to doubt his partner, Ash chooses to send it in. However, there's one thing that the two didn't take into account. Zeb Striker has a move that's going to allow it to far outpace the speed of the electric mouse. When Stefan orders it to use a flame charge that connects with it. This literally turns on the heat, as not only does it cause damage to Pikachu, but it allows Zeb Striker's speed to increase. And unfortunately, because of the drain that Pikachu's endured to its stamina, this isn't a good thing. As it tries to fire off an Electro Ball at the command of Ash, it's unable to hit Zeb Striker as it speeds around it, hitting another flame charge, increasing its speed once more. This gives Zeb Striker the pure advantage, as it then brings down its massive front hooves with a stomp that ends Pikachu's tenure in this battle. This brings Ash down to his final Pokemon, which he was hoping that he wouldn't be at this quickly in. However, he doesn't have a choice. There's only one thing that he has in his entire arsenal at this current point that can even have any hopes of bringing him victory. Inferno, I choose you. The battle monkey emerges from its ball, ready to take on this challenge. As Ash tells it that it's the last mon standing, so all of the hopes that they have ride on it. It blows a spit of fire, ready for its trainer's commands. While Inferno stamina isn't as low because it didn't battle as much as Pikachu, it still is at a risk. However, its trump card Blaze could make things go in Ash's favor. Things begin as Zeb Striker starts to take advantage with its new speed. However, Infernape's dig allows it some invasion of its own, hitting the zebra with a good amount of damage. Then, at the command of Ash, Infernape drops Zeb Striker with a close combat, bringing the second battle to a close. This brings Stefan to his final Pokemon, as he declares Sock Go! The fighting type emerges from its ball with its hands on its belt, ready to start this battle, and clearly confident in its ability to bring victory. However, Ash is no pushover, and neither is Infernape, and it's about to be made apparent who the strongest fighting type out of the two is. As the battle starts, Stefan calls for a bulk up that allows Sock to increase his attack and defense. However, Infernape is quickly on the offensive when Ash orders an acrobatics that connects with the fighting type for super effective damage, and because Infernape isn't holding any type of items, this is going to be double the normal power. This manages to drop the fighting type to one knee, causing great concern in its trainer. However, they're not going to give up. Sock struggles back up, pulling itself together, ready for the next exchange, as Stefan orders a brick break. However, things don't go too good for the fighting type in their second exchange, as Ash commands a flare blitz that just roasts the fighting type in one solid move, dropping it, securing Ash's spot in the top eight, and bringing the battles for the day to a close, much to the displeasure of Stefan. However, this is going to be short-lived, as we pan to the outside of the stadium with Ash's other friends still out in the forest trying to find our young hero. They have yet to find out that he's returned to the stadium and it was able to win his match and get his spot in the top eight. And this is particularly troubling for one individual, Paul, as the black stone begins to resonate as Colorus greets our young trainer. And this is where we're going to bring everything to an end. So with the first part of the league out of the way, tell me how did you guys feel about this part? Did you enjoy the battles that we've had a chance to see up until now? How do you feel about the revelation? with Crocodile being a tool of Getsis, and the entire reason why it was with Ash in the first place was just to get a stone. What do you think about the trouble that Trip is going through, and what is it exactly that he's having trouble dealing with? And of course, what awaits Paul, with Colrus now entering the picture, addressing our favorite rival? Let me know in the comments down below. We begin today's video exactly where we left off in the last part. Paul staring down Getsis, ready for a battle. The lab coat cladded scientist has one simple request for the boy. Hand over his black stone, and they can part ways as friends, colleagues. 
However, Paul tells Colorus that only a fool would dare challenge a wielder of one of the stones, especially when they are all alone, knowing full well that Colorus is in possession of the stone that Ash once had. However, Paul is in for a big surprise, as he's operating under the assumption that only him and Ash have the ability to use the power of these legendary creatures. However, this response is met with nothing but a slight chuckle from Colorus. You assume too much, boy. You think that just because you were chosen by one of the dragons means that you're the only one that can wield the dragon? Well, allow me to show you the true power, the unbridled rage of a deity long forgotten by its people. Just then, a shadow casts from above. Turning his head skyward, Paul views a sight that he hasn't seen since Castellia City, the freight that hovered above during Ash's battle with Giovanni. It's at this moment, Paul can feel it. Zekrom's stone is resonating with something. It's pulsating like it never has before. The boy can feel it. Its emotions are going haywire. A mixture of rage and fear is consuming Paul. Whatever's coming, it can't be good. However, Paul has to be the one to take control of the situation, pushing Zekrom's feelings away from his own, so that way its feelings are not clouding his judgment. Now, you insolent boy, witness the creature that is the path to Unova's salvation. Culverus yells as he is joined by another, a man that is clad in a black coat with a cane. Next to the man stands what looks like Ash's crocodile. Knowing things are about to get heavy, Paul chooses not to waste any time or let them get the upper hand on him, sending in both Electivire and Embor. The Oni and the Battle Pig hit the field, ready to take action at a moment's notice. This is where the man with the cane speaks. I like your style, boy. Wasting no time getting right down to business. I can admire that. So in the spirit of business, I'll give you one final chance. Hand over the Black Orb, and we will part ways, as friends. However, Paul will not fall for this trick. He knows just by the way Zekrom is reacting, he cannot let the Black Orb fall into the hands of these two. However, he may not have a choice, as Getsis decides to retract his offer due to Paul's silence, telling him that he's going to take it by force. Now, Colorus, release the pride of Team Plasma. At this command, Colorus releases a crate that falls from the low hovering ship. This slams into the ground with the weight of a couple tons. As the quake of the container hitting the ground reverberates, the orb of Zekrom begins to pulsate erratically, signaling that there is some sort of danger coming. However, Paul has little time to think about this, as Getsis commands the doors to be opened. With the push of a button on the console in front of Culrus, the ice on the door begins to crack as the massive hinge swings open, slamming into the ground, revealing a set of glowing orange eyes deep into the darkness. Come forth, my great beast. Unleash your fury upon the opponents before us. As Getsis gives this command, Paul can feel a chill run up his spine followed by a blazing heat run down it. What happens next are slight tremors as the beast emerges from its cage, something that Paul has never seen before. This creature is addressed as Kirim. However, there's something off about it. It seems to bear some sort of resemblance towards Reshram. Knowing something ain't right, Paul demands to know what that abomination is, to which Culrus and Getsis both laugh, happy to oblige the young trainer. This is Kirim a dragon that was once worshipped and revered throughout ancient Unova. However, in the distant past, those who feared its power sought to weaken this great and divine creature. So in order to do so, they separated it, draining it of its power and creating the black and white orbs. With its power drained, Kirim was left to suffer alone in darkness, while the humans took the orbs and hid them in spots around Unova. Over time, the orbs eventually grew a consciousness, evolving into the Pokemon you know as Reshram and Kirim. They were never meant to be unnatural, part of another creature. Kirim has never forgotten its true power, and legend tells that if one human would ever dare to bring its power together again, the dragon would award it with absolute loyalty. As you can see, we've already started the bonding process with the White Stone. The only piece that's left is Zekrom. Once we have that, then we can restore Kirim to its true form, and finally bring peace and order under one ruler throughout the region of Unova. Pulling out the stone, Paul can feel it pulsating in his hand. That's not gonna happen, he says, as he activates the transformation with Electivire. Taking the transformation of ideals, Electivire surges with electricity as it charges Kirim with Enbor at its side to engage and finally win its independence and freedom from this oppressor, this dragon that wishes to capture it, ending its free will as it did to Reshram. 
however, gets us just laughs at this pitiful resistance, commanding a fusion flare that since now Electivire is within range, is amplified by the presence of Kirim and Zekrom being so close. This is enough to cause a spiral of electricity and fire to shoot up in the air, as the amplified Oni retaliates with a bolt strike and Hembor uses its most powerful heat crash. Back at the stadium, Ash is standing outside looking for Paul. It's here that he can see off in the distance the spiral of fire and electricity that is towering into the air. Ash has a bad feeling about this, and this is reverberated with Pikachu and then Inferno when it pops out of its ball. The fire monkey signals to Ash. So, you still have a connection with Reshram, do you? And it's there, isn't it? Inferno confirms this by taking off into the forest, with Ash and Pikachu in tow. However, our young hero isn't the only one that spots this, as Iris and N have also noticed the burst of energy off in the distance. While N was with Ash up until his match, Iris still thinks that Ash is missing, so this could be where she she finds him, so she sends out Dragon Egg so that way she can get to that point of origin as quickly as possible. This just leaves in. Unfortunately, with him being so sensitive to both the white and black stones, he knows exactly what this is. However, he is much farther away than everybody else, still back at the stadium. With no real means of transportation, N takes off running in the direction, hoping that he can make it there in time to make a difference. Over with Paul, the battle is getting intense. While Embor is powerful in its own right due to the tutelage under Paul, it pales in comparison into the might of this legendary beast, falling quick to the fusion flare, leaving only Electivire to battle Kirim by himself. What follows next is a barrage of fusion bolts, brick breaks, and bolt strikes, as Paul commands Electivire to do whatever it can to end this beast. However, Kirim is just trading blows with Electivire, and for some reason, it seems like with each exchange, the Oni is weakening from the blows. This is when Paul recalls something that Ash told him about the battle that he had with this thing. He said the cold of Kirim, it's like it pulls the power out of whoever it's battling, especially when it comes to Reshram or Zekram. It quickly drained Infernape of all of its energy, forcing the fusion to end. Paul can see it in the Electrotype. Electivire is beginning to breathe heavily. Though the Oni has great conditioning, it may not be able to maintain the fusion for long. Knowing he has to end this, Paul orders Electivire's most powerful bolt strike, bring every bit of electricity that the Oni has down on this dragon. However, as the Oni prepares to attack, that's when it happens. A flash of light, and then the orb and Electivire separate, as the Oni drops from exhaustion, overworking itself in the transformation while in the presence of Kirim. This is where Getsis orders a counterattack. He tells Kirim to use a fusion flare, end the boy, end the Oni. However, Colos reminds Getsis that Alder won't be pleased with this. However, Getsis shrugs it off, saying that Alder played his part, and as long as he gets what he wants and Team Plasma gets what they want, everybody's happy. And besides, since the other boy got away, we gotta make sure that this one can't find his way back to him. Kirim then begins to charge its final fusion flare, as its sole target is Paul. The boy is frozen in fear. For whatever reason, he cannot move. His legs simply won't carry him to safety. He can't even talk, screaming for Electivire to help. As the fusion flare reaches critical mass, something happens. Inside Paul's pocket, something's resonating with the fusion flare. This snaps Paul out of his madness as he reaches into his pocket to pull out the last remaining shard of the reveal glass. As it pulsates in Paul's hand, something happens to cure him. It begins to lose power, like it's weakening somehow. Then, the fusion flare just dissipates without ever being fired. Suddenly, the dragon begins to cry like it's in pain. No, there's something else. There's there's two different cries. One of Reshram and the other of Kirim. It's, it's like this mirror is causing it to separate. Realizing something is wrong with their great beast, Colorus urges Getsis to recall it. They need to get back to the lab. Something has gone wrong with the bonding process. It hasn't fully taken yet. It's here that Getsis orders Crocodile to grab the Black Orb. At least they'll be able to get it so that way they can fully merge the dragon. However, at first, the Sandcroc doesn't move as they urge Kirim back into its containment unit. Turning around, Colorus asks if the Croc is deaf. He gave it an order. Now obtain the Black Orb. Reluctantly, the Croc tunnels down, surfacing just to the side of the Black Orb, reaching out for it. Just as it begins to connect with its jaws, a flare blitz comes emerging from the trees as Infernape slams into the Desert Croc, knocking it back to the feet of Getsis. There stands Ash and Pikachu, with Infernape and its blaze activated. They won't let Getsis get another stone. Realizing that things are not going their way and they have much bigger problems with how Kirim is acting, Getsis 
Nexus tells them that they will be back for the Black Stone as the Plasma Flight takes off into the sky, leaving Ash, Paul, Electivire, and Infernape standing there, watching them disappear from sight. Turning, Ash asks Paul if he's okay. However, this is met with silence as both he and Electivire collapse from the strain of the situation, just as Iris and N both arrive to provide whatever assistance they can. Paul can hear the muffled voices of his friends as he slowly fades into darkness. What follows is a mass expansive void of nothing. Paul is alone in this darkness, but it's not unfamiliar to him. He's been here before. This is the same place he found himself when he had that dream when he was outside of Reversal Mountain. This is confirmed when Paul hears a brief cry in the distance, a low echoing of Zekrom. Then, in a flash, Paul finds himself levitating above an ancient battlefield. A war has been waged for what looks like a millennia, and at the center of it is a creature that Paul has never seen before, a dragon of some sorts. This beast is savage, attacking anything that moves within sight of it. However, somehow, it feels familiar to Paul, like Zekrom is part of this beast. Paul can do nothing but watch as the people run in fear of this great creature, retreating to the sea. Then things go black once more. Now Paul finds himself levitating above an ancient metropolis. However, this is no strange place to him. He's been here before. This is the site that he fought Giovanni at and the three Therian forms of the forces of nature. It's here that he notices something. Meloetta and the forces of nature. They're coexisting in peace and harmony on what seems to be a man-made island out in the middle of the ocean. The humans, they retreated to this place and built a paradise away from the great beast that hunts them. Life is tranquil and the humans seem happy as they live behind the shield of their great protector, Meloetta and her three guardians. It's here that the skies darken as the once ancient fear that hunted them for so many years, finally tracking down its prey after so many centuries. Though these humans appear weak, they are far from it. They have spent their entire lives waiting for this one moment. They knew it would come, they just didn't know when or what generation that this ancient beast would peek its ugly head out once again. Activated the defenses of their great city, Meloetta takes its place on the Altar of Melodies, and with its great song, it is able to resonate with the Reveal Glass, activating its power to reveal the truth in its reflection. The three Therian beasts take to the sky, doing battle with this ancient dragon. This is a battle of life and death between nature itself. And as this great beast draws out all of its power to deliver the final blow, the humans activate their final weapon. As Meloetta begins to sing more passionately, it is able to resonate with the reveal glass once more, unlocking its full potential as the reflection of the beast is shown in the mirror. In a flash, the battle is over, and the beast is no more. Where it once stood, now lay three separate stones, the three dragons of virtue. One of black, one of white, and one of gray. Relieved that their plan worked, the humans begin to celebrate. However, there is a realization in this victory. They can never let this ancient beast be whole once again. So, now able to reclaim the land of their birthright, the humans take back to the mainland of Unova, building three separate altars to house the three separate stones. The Altar of White by Twist Mountain, the Altar of Black on Reversal Mountain, and the Altar of Gray in the Giant Chasm. And there, the three stones lie dormant for many centuries, until they began to awaken one by one, and slowly beginning to play a part in Unova's development as a land. However, while Zekrom and Reshram provided value, feeding nature's energy into the land itself and helping the region sustain life, Kirim, on the other hand, was an empty shell, void of any and all emotion. While Reshram and Zekrom had cycles of awakened sleep, Kirim did not share this same sentiment, choosing not to find a new purpose, but to grow in resentment and long for the life that it once had, the power that it once wielded. However, weakened from the separation of its other parts, Kirim could do nothing but lie in darkness, awaiting for the day it could reclaim the light. And over time, the three dragons were forgot about, at least in their original form, only for Zekrom and Reshram to be the ones that were revered by the citizens of Unova. Unfortunately, the victory against the great beast came at a cost, because the one thing that man always seeks is power, and the island city was the most powerful thing in all of the region, drawing the ire of many invading armies. However, none of them 
had the same power that the mighty city had at its disposal. Unfortunately, absolute power eventually corrupts absolutely, and this is what happened when Meloetta was forced to sink the island because its own people wanted more than what they needed, and the legendary knew that it could not allow this destruction to continue. And then unfortunately, without Meloetta to guide the forces of nature on the right path, they were left to their own devices, rampaging throughout Unova, and that's how they ended up becoming trapped on Milo Island. This triggers a brief roar from Zekrom, with the vision fading as Paul awakens in the Pokemon Center. Around him sits Ash and an Iris, worried about the young boy. Ash is the first to speak, asking Paul if he's alright. However, Paul just gets straight to business, telling Ash that he knows exactly what they need. They need Landris, Thunderous, and Tornadus, and they have to find Meloetta. Wait, 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 slow down there, Paul. You're not making any sense, and says, You guys don't understand. Zekrom, it showed me an ancient battle. I understand now how we have to deal with this problem, and it involves this. Paul then reaches into his pocket and pulls out the last remaining shard of the reveal glass. Meloetta and the Therian beasts, they're all one and the same. They feed off each other like a symbiosis. When they're separated, that's why Landris, Thunderous, and Tornadus rampage, because they don't have the guidance of their leader. This is where Ash asks the obvious question, who's Meloetta, and what does it have to do with the three forces of nature? This is where Iris goes on to explain the events of what happened in Undela Town after Paul had gotten his seventh badge. He explains that they ended up on an ancient city that was raised from the sea floor. Meloetta is a super powerful Pokemon that has the ability to control the forces of nature of Unova. That's right, Paul says, and that's why they were rampaging on Milos Island. When they were freed, they were angered because they didn't have the one person that was supposed to be there to guide them, and they were left like that for many centuries. That's how they ended up on Milos Island and were sealed in the first place. Okay, so we have to find this Meloetta Loetta and says, Do you have any idea where to look? However, Iris and N both shake their heads. With the events of what happened back on the island city now behind them, they lost track of the musical legendary, and they don't know where it could have gone. So, if we can't find it, then what are we supposed to do? That's the problem, Paul says. Team Plasma is going to be back, and that beast that they have, that Kiram White that seems to be a fusion of both Zekrom and Reshram, will be more powerful. I think the only reason why it stopped was because of this, the reveal glass. Somehow, it has the ability to reflect one's true self. It will force one to revert to its true form if it's exposed to the glass long enough. However, it'll only work when it's in resonance with Meloetta. Great, Iris says. So, we have a plan, but no way to execute it. That's just great. So, what do we do now? Nothing, Paul says. We do nothing. We have to wait for Team Plasma to strike again. And as far as Meloetta is concerned, we really can't do anything unless it decides to appear. So, we just go on about lives as if everything is normal. This then leads Paul to ask where they are in the tournament. Ash informs him that he was able to close out his last battle, and he won. They're going to be starting the top 8 tomorrow, and the first person up is going to be Ash against this kid named Cameron. Paul smiles, telling Ash to be careful around that kid. He reminds Paul of Ash, able to pull something out of his hat at any moment. He's got great potential, if he can realize that that is. If that's the case, then Ash is going to have to prepare. He used a lot of his Pokemon today to avoid the battle with Team Plasma, and some of them, like Infernape and Pikachu, both took some damage in the altercation, so he might need to make a few changes to make sure he's ready for this kid who has a great potential just like himself. Ash then runs off to the Pokemon transfer area, so that way he can call Professor Oak. He's got a game to win tomorrow. This just leaves Paul alone with his thoughts for the moment, as he replays the dream that he had again and again in his head, looking for anything that he may have missed. Now we fade to the next day as Ash is in the midst of his top 8 battle with the boy Cameron, the one that Paul says reminds him of Ash. Things aren't looking so good for Ash. He is now 3 Pokemon deep, having lost Baldor, Snivy, and Unpheasant to Cameron's ace Pokemon, the seemingly invincible pseudo-legendary of the Unova region, Hydreigon. This dark dragon type has proven to be formidable for Ash, and he only has 3 Pokemon left in order to try and take it out. Then he has to deal with Cameron's other Pokemon, having only been able to topple his Ferrothorn and Samurott. However, Ash isn't one to let this sit. Holding a Pokeball in his hand, he knows that this is the best chance he has on his team to take this dragon out and swing things in his favor. With the start of the second half of this battle, Ash declares, Excelgor, I choose you! The bug type emerges from its ball, awaiting the orders of its trainer. Cameron, on the other hand, is feeling a little bit overconfident, as his high dragon has managed to take out three of Ash's Pokemon. As far as he's concerned, Excelgor is just number four and it's going to be over just as
as quick as the last three were. Wanting to prove this, the budding young trainer orders his high dragon to use a double hit. However, it is quickly revealed why Ash feels confident that Excelgor is going to be the one to swing things in his favor when he calls for a substitute. Suddenly, what looks like a husk of Excelgor appears where the Mon once stood, and it takes the double hit. However, the attack wasn't strong enough to break the substitute, and Excelgor is left to its own devices, vanishing around the battlefield as High Dragon is solely focused on this distraction in front of it. Ash has one thing in mind here. He aims to capitalize on the damage that Snivy had caused with its Leaf Storm, which Excelgor has the perfect move to do so as he calls for a bug buzz. Suddenly, an ultrasonic vibration can feel reverberating through the area. It's at this point that two things happen. High Dragon, because its attention is divided, is left susceptible to the attack full on due to not being able to guard itself. And secondary, because it has three separate heads, each head is attacked simultaneously, causing it to thrash about in pain as Excelgor ramps up the vibrations to increase the frequency of this attack. Cameron tries to give an order to have his dragon calm down. However, because of the frequency of the waves that are being generated by Excelgor, his dragon is unable to hear him as it fires off dragon pulses randomly striking throughout the battlefield. This gives Ash the opening needed to finally bring this abomination down as he calls for Excelgor to use a move that is high risk but high reward, Double Edge. Appearing from the shadows, Excelgor slams itself right into High Dragon, knocking the beast into the ground and bringing this battle to an end. Smiling, Ash tells his bug good job. He knew that it can do it. Cameron, on the other hand, is a little bum. He was expecting High Dragon to be able to carry him all the way to victory in this match. However, he's not worried, as he does have other Pokemon that can do just as equally a good job as High Dragon could. So, he recalls his pseudo legendary, readying his next Pokeball. As you hear, Lucario, you're up! As things get intense in the top 8 battle, we shift gears as we find ourselves with both Paul and Nen as they are discussing the events of the prior day. Nen tells our young hero that he has to be vigilant. Team Plasma won't give up so easily. His father won't give up so easily. He knows that at some point, they are going to be here. He doesn't know when, but he can feel the presence of Reshram. It's close. Peering into the shard of the reveal glass that Paul has into his hand, Paul says that he knows. Zekrom has not stopped with its alerting to the vibrations, trying to tell Paul that danger is imminent. Clutching what remains of the glass in his hand, Paul tells Zen not to worry. He will do whatever it takes to separate Reshram from that monstrosity and restore the balance of the Unova region. As those two continue talking, we find ourselves with Iris as she is walking down a corridor. She and Axiu got a bit hungry, so she decided to go get something to eat from one of the concession stands. However, she is stopped dead in her tracks when she comes across a very peculiar sight. Alder and Trip, they are talking, and it seems to be a conversation that is heated. Well, at least on Alder's side. Being the nosy kid that she is, Iris creeps in so she can eavesdrop on the conversation. However, the one that she finds isn't one that she was expecting. She can hear Alder berating Trip for all of the things that he has done. How could his performance have fallen this much since the Junior World Tournament? All the plans that Alder has laid in place over the last year to make him look good and for nothing, Trip is becoming an embarrassment to the champion, all because of his loss to Paul. At the rate that you're going, Trip, you're gonna risk everything, and then everything I set in motion, all of the things that you were supposed to accomplish, for nothing. You were supposed to be the new champion. You were supposed to be the one that the people chose. You were supposed to be the new chosen hero of Unova. And at every turn, I tried to help you, manipulating things behind the scenes, getting Team Rocket to come to Unova, getting Team Plasma to find the white and black stones, giving them the location of Kirim, so that way, when the final confrontation came in the stage where everyone in the region would see, you would be recognized as the new hero. And I would be able to retire gracefully, knowing that my grandson would be the future of the region, but you risk it all by having your confidence shaken by a loss to some unknown trainer? This is unacceptable. I don't know where that grit was that you had in the Junior World Tournament, but you need to find it again, because like it or not, you are going to be the one to take down Team Plasma when they attack. Then Alder storms off out of frustration with his grandson, leaving Trip just standing there, staring at the ground, almost like he's torn between what he knows is right and wanting to please his grandfather. Iris, having overheard this, knows that she needs to tell Paul Ash and Anne. so she rushes off as quickly as she can before anyone notices that she is there. Now we cut back to the battle with Ash and Cameron, or the ending to it. Ash has been declared the winner, as he 
still had Whirlipede standing. Wow, Cameron forgot to bring a sixth Pokemon. Due to the sheer incompetence of this boy, Ash is going to be able to move on to the top four, leaving Cameron to apologize to Lucario and the rest of his Pokemon. He didn't know that he was going to need six at this point, though he's still proud they were all able to make it to the top eight. Now that round one is concluded, this means Paul is up as his round two opponent and him are call to the battlefield for their full 6-on-6. Six six. Paul walks off, telling Yen that they will continue this conversation after his match. This should be a quick one, as he's tapped into his reserves, and they're some of his oldest and strongest Pokemon. This leaves Yen standing there, trying to figure out what to do next. He doesn't believe these two boys. While he detests the whole Pokemon battle thing, Yen has come to recognize that it is part of the culture of Unova and the rest of the world for that matter. But these two are going on and like nothing else is happening, nothing else matters, like the world isn't in danger. It's kind of frustrating to the green haired boy. However, he doesn't have much choice in the matter, considering he is just the voice of the Pokemon, not their actual avatars. This is where we find Iris running into Ash as he is departed from the battlefield and he's heading to the Pokemon Center to get his Pokemon looked at after his six on six with Cameron. Out of breath, Iris spills everything that she heard from Alder and Trip. But her statements are incoherent and Ash is having trouble to understand her. It's not until Iris takes a breath and is able to articulate everything that Ash is able to see the full picture. Come on, we have to get to N, Ash says, as they begin to power walk to the last spot that he saw Paul and N standing above the battlefield as they were watching Ash's match. Now we find ourselves on the battlefield at the end of Paul's match. Like he quoted N, it was rather quick. The standout Pokemon that Paul used here was Ursaring, Magmortar, and Torterra. As Paul recalls Torterra, Terra readying himself to exit the battlefield, he looks up to see N, Ash, and Iris staring down at him with a look of seriousness. Knowing that something has changed, Paul rushes out of the arena to go meet with his friends. This just leaves the last of the top 8 matches, which the first match up is Virgil and his Evolution squad. While he does have a little bit of trouble, his Umbreon is able to carry him to the win, leaving just Trip in the last match. While it seems like the young trainer's confidence has been shaken even more, he is able to pull out the win when his superior goes the distance outlasting its opponent and winning trips top eight six on six this brings the top eight matches to a close with ash paul trip and Virgil, all in the top four. As the four contestants stare at the monitor above the battlefield, the pairings are quickly revealed, as in the first match of the top four will be Virgil versus Trip, while in the second match will be the rematch from the Sinnoh League, Ash versus Paul. Meanwhile, Alder is staring at the board, thinking it's finally time for Team Plasma to make their appearance. Later that night, the group is at the Pokemon Center when they get a chance to actually talk with Virgil for the first time. Come to find out, his specialty is the evolution and because they have all different typing, he is able to really switch up his battle style to whatever he needs to meet the situation. Ash says that if it ends up being those two in the finals, then they're going to have a lot of fun as he's never had a chance to battle a full team of evolutions, but also comments that it's if he can get past Paul first. After all, Paul is probably the strongest trainer that Ash knows. This causes Virgil to cackle a little bit, saying he would look forward to the chance to battle either one of them. However, he's got to get past his top four opponent first. This this is where Paul chimes in with his normal serious tone, telling Virgil that while Trip appears to be a strong trainer, his confidence has been shaken, and if he uses that to his advantage, then he'll have an easy win and make it to the top two. Paul then stands up and walks outside to get some fresh air, with Virgil commenting that Ash's friend is kind of a serious trainer. However, Ash just replies saying that Paul only wants to battle strong trainers, and if you want his respect, you have to prove it to him. The only way to do that is to beat him decisively. Well, if you have his respect, that must mean that you guys had your fair share of battles, Virgil says. Ash just smiles, reminiscing about the times that he had in Sinnoh when Paul was his main rival. Now we cut to the next day, and we find ourselves in the top four match between Trip and Virgil. The match is about halfway through. Both trainers are down to the just three Pokemon each. For Trip, he suffered heavy losses in the form of his Unpheasant, Chandelure, and Conkeldor, while Virgil has lost Umbreon, Espeon, and Eevee there in the midst of starting the second half of their match, with Trip sending in his starter, Superior, and Virgil answering with his Glaceon. The two pan out as we begin to see who is observing the battle. There's Ash and Paul, who are viewing from different parts of the arena as they prepare for their rematch. Iris and N watch on from the crowd 
searching for any signs of the true threat that is upon them. All the while, from above everyone, the current champion of Unova, Alder, sits watching the match of his grandson and thinking that it is almost time for the true show to begin. This is where we find ourselves back on the battlefield, with Trip and Virgil down to their final Pokemon. Superior has proven its resolve as Trip's starter and ace, as it stares down a Flareon, who is preparing the final strike at the command of Virgil. However, as the final strike is prepared to be launched, almost like it was planned, the plasma freight descends from the clouds hovering above the stadium, announcing that it is here that Team Plasma will begin its dominance over the Unova region. Right on cue, Alder thinks to himself as he begins his descent down to the battlefield. However, his attention isn't the only one that's grabbed as Ash, Paul, N, and Iris all begin making their way to the stadium floor to prepare for this altercation with Team Plasma. However, they're gonna have to hurry as hordes of grunts have begun to descend from the freight, fanning out within the stadium so they can set up a perimeter so that no one can escape. It is here that the voice who is on the microphone continues to ramble, telling all in attendance they are about to bear witness to the new ruler of the Unova region. As the freight begins to descend, hovering slightly above the battlefield, dropping its gates, allowing some sort of monstrosity to descend from the bowels of the ship. Shivers and chills run down the spine of all in attendance as this creature of ice and fire makes its presence known, demonstrating its powers by immediately turning its sights on Virgil and knocking out his Flareon. This is where Alder interferes, declaring that whoever they are, they will not violate the sanctity of the Pokemon League. So he will be their opponent as he sends in his Bouffalant to engage with Kiram White. However, just like they planned, the champion is made quick work of by the overwhelming power of the legendary, quickly squashing his whole team of six, leaving just Trip to stare down this legendary dragon of fire and ice. Still playing the part, Alder tells Trip that he is the only one that can stop these evildoers, use his Pokemon and everything he's learned on his journey, become the hero that Unova needs. However, for the young boy, his emotions are torn. Everything he's known and learned over the past year, plus all of the things that his grandfather has taught him, they're all at odds with each other inside of him. He doesn't know the correct path, which way he should turn. This is where Alder begins to show signs of frustration with his grandson, urging him to become the hero that Unova needs. Not wanting to let his grandfather down, Trip takes his position to play the role that he was brought up to do, telling Superior to engage with Kiram. What follows is a less than convincing battle, as it appears like Kiram is more docile than anything, as Superior lands its blows one after another. Kiram is just taking the hits, not really doing anything to retaliate. This is where something happens with Superior. It's been battling so long that its overgrow has started to activate as it glows in a green aura. This is it, Alder thinks to himself. He screams to Trip, now do it. Use your ultimate technique. Drop the dragon and claim your rightful place. Doing as he's told, Trip commands for an overgrown leaf blade that strikes Kiram appearing to end this battle. However, it quickly becomes apparent that this is not the case, as a maniacal laughter begins to ring out from behind Kiram, much to the surprise of Trip and Alder. Aw, oh, it doesn't look like your little serpent has what it takes to take down the mighty legendary. Now does it, boy? Gets his retorts as he begins to cackle to himself even harder. This begins to frustrate Alder as he demands to know what Getsis is doing. They had a deal. He gave them everything they needed to enact their plans. The only thing he asked was that they lose to Trip so he can claim the place as Unova's next champion. But Getsu simply tells the old dog that he's had a change of plans, a change of heart. He doesn't see Trip as the hero that Unova needs. As a matter of fact, the only person that could rightfully lead Unova into its future is Getsu himself. And without hesitation, the old man orders a Glaciate aimed at both Superior and Trip as the two stand there frozen in fear. Alder wants to respond in kind, however, he is unable to, as in order to make the show believable, he allowed his Pokemon to take more damage than they should have. The only thing the old man can do is curse Getsis and watch as his grandson begins to be enveloped by ice. However, fate and luck is on Trip's side, as Iris comes soaring in on Dragonite, able to save the young boy and his starter from imminent doom as they carry him off into the air, just as Ash and Paul arrive on the scene. The two boys confront Getsis, demanding that he stop this tirade and release Reshram from the control of this monstrosity. However, the old man just laughs 
telling the boys that their efforts are futile. Once he has the Blackstone, Kirim will be complete, and his takeover of the Unova region will begin to take shape. While Getsis prepares for his next attack, another very real threat makes its presence known, as Alder, now seething with rage at the sight of Paul, makes his presence known. Now angered that his plans have failed, he wishes to aim his frustration at a certain person, and the one that he thinks is the cause of all of his failures is Paul. Now, while Alder's Bufalant did take a lot of damage from battling with Kirim, he still has his Excelgor, and he aims to use it to make an example out of Paul, and to make himself feel better after everything that has happened today. With their backs to each other, it becomes very clear at this moment that neither Ash or Paul are going to be able to get out of this without having to split up and battle each of these people separately. Paul elects to be the one to battle Getsis, seeing how he still has access to a stone and the best chance to beat this monstrosity Kirim. However, Ash makes the argument that it should be him that starts to battle off with Kirim, and he has a really good point, telling Paul that he has actually battled this thing before, so he has a good idea of what it's capable of. And not only that, but Kirim seems to have the power to negate the abilities of the stones when they're close to him. That's what it did when Reshram was around. So why risk that with the Blackstone? Let him, Infernape, and Pikachu handle Kirim while he battles with Alder. Then once Paul and Electivire clear that problem, they can come join Ash and the rest of his Pokemon as they battle with the legendary Titan. While Paul doesn't like this, he knows that Ash is right, so he tells him to hold off Kirim as long as he can. He will deal with Alder, and then he will return. However, he knows one thing is very true. They need to put distance between Kirim and the Blackstone. That way, its strikes will be the most efficient. Realizing he needs to get on the move, Paul takes off running, telling Alder that if he wishes to battle him, then he's gonna have to catch him first, causing the champion to become even more upset at this boy's outlandish request. However, he does need something to take his frustrations out on, and if Paul is gonna give him the opportunity, then who better, considering it's Paul that ruined all of his plans after that battle he had with Trip, making him question himself. As Paul runs off, the last thing he sees is Infernape and Pikachu with Ash engaging in a battle with Kirim, trying to recapture the White Stone. The boy quickly finds himself on the outskirts of the stadium, with Alder barreling down on him with Excelgor. While Paul thinks that there should be a little bit more distance, he knows that he's running out of time, and he needs to get this battle over as quickly as possible. So without hesitation, he sends an Electivire to absorb a an energy ball that comes in from the bug type that seemed to have a little bit of malice put behind the attack. So, you really mean business, don't you, old man? However, Alder just tells Paul to be quiet. This is all his fault. Everything is falling apart because he had to get involved. Paul just tells Alder that he doesn't know what he's talking about, as he orders Electivire to counter with a wild charge to crash into the bug type. However, this is a champion level Pokemon, and it's not going to go down that easy as the two lock and grips once again at an even stalemate. You truly have no idea what this is about, Alder asks. Well, let me tell you, boy. There's one thing that's important to a man in this world, and that is legacy. The one you leave behind. The family that you create. Trip is supposed to be that for me. So that way our family, no, I, will always be remembered. I spent years training the boy, preparing for the day he would become a Pokemon trainer. And then the day that he set out, before he went to go get his first Pokemon, I made it very clear that he was supposed to find a path that would get him to the Pokemon League and give him the ability to earn the championship. I had already set everything in motion. By that time that fool Gessis was well on the path to collecting the stones. However, then you two arrived in Unova and screwed everything up. Trip was on an excellent path. He understood power. He had developed an excellent champion level team with the resolve to take the win. That was until you shattered his entire world with that demonstration of power that you used at the Junior World Cup. Ever since then, he hasn't been the same. He's unable to focus. His Pokemon, they've lost their edge and you are the one to blame. Alder tries to continue to go on his tirade, only for Paul to interrupt him. You're pathetic, old man. You really think that the path that you set your own grandson on was the best one? Let me tell you something. I walked that path myself, and it was one of loneliness. Fortunately, I had my brother and Ash to help point me in the right direction. It allowed me to see the error in my ways and correct the course I was on, because if I wouldn't have, then the place I would have ended is a place that no one should ever have to go to. Then, a tone shift happens in Paul's voice as he begins to bear his frustrations to Alder, telling the old man that it's selfish of what he's done to Trip, and he won't allow it to continue any longer, as he initiates the fusion with Zekrom and Electivire, commanding a fusion bolt that levels the bug in one move. This catches Alder off guard. He was expecting Excelgor to last a little bit longer. However, don't worry, he has other Pokemon with him. But as he reaches for his ball, it's stopped by Paul. You're pathetic, old man. 
blaming others for your shortcomings. Let's face it, you haven't been a champion in a long time. The only thing that's a champion about you is that of the title. You barely beat me last time, and you and I both know it. You know that your time is coming to an end, and you were hoping that you could cement your own legacy, like the other champions of this world, Cynthia of the Sidon region or Steven of the Hohen region. No one will remember you, except as a footnote in the path that you carved. Look at this. You think anybody's going to remember you after this? Kiram is attacking because of you, but nobody's going to talk about you being the one to save Unova, or even you being the one to cause this destruction. They're just going to talk about the day that that dragon was stopped, and the people that are going to be mentioned is not you, nor your grandson. It'll be me and Ash, because we were the ones who were charged by Zekrom and Reshram to make sure Kiram is stopped. Alder then freezes in place as Electivire and Paul walk off, Paul's words seemingly doing more damage than any Pokemon attack ever could. Back inside the stadium, things are in full swing in battle. Infernape and Pikachu have engaged Kiram White, using all of their power to try and stop the legendary beast, with Ash being in their eyes to prevent any major damage from any of its legendary attacks. While they have Kiram distracted and has enlisted Iris and Dragonite's help in order to get close to his father to try and reason with him. However, as the two land in front of him, they are met with his lethal protector, Crocodile, the Pokemon that would die for Culrus. That's good, my pet. Keep them at bay while Kiram ravages everything in sight. Father, you have to stop this. We can't allow Kiram to rampage like this. Can't you see? It being part of the other two dragons is unnatural. However, Gethus just ignores his son, telling Culrus to turn up the frequency of his machine to full power, commanding Kiram to end this struggle once and for all. This is where Iris has the idea that if they won't listen to reason, then they will react to force, as she orders Dragonite to use a thunder's punch and smash the device that Culrus is holding. However, the dragon is stopped dead in its tracks when the blow is absorbed by Crocodile, using his ground typing to dissipate the electricity of the punch. Getsis merely laughs. You two are fools to think that you would ever have any ability in stopping me. That Crocodile would die to protect me. Did you forget, Anne? It wanted nothing more to be part of my elite squadron, and it was willing to do whatever it took, even playing with a pathetic brat like you. Though you two did have something in common, you were both weak among your peers. However, Crocodile chose not to embrace that weakness. Rather, it searched to find strength and to do whatever it took. That's how it ended up here today, serving me as my dreams of a unified region and absolute power are on the brink of being realized. And once this dream of yours is realized, Father, then what? What'll happen to everyone? What'll happen to Crocodile? To me? To all those that oppose you? Gets us simply chuckles. Tools are meant to be used. And once the tool no longer serves a purpose, well, it's discarded. Kiram is all I will need once my plans come to fruition. This is where N begins to plead with Crocodile. Don't you see, my old friend? My father is just using you. He doesn't care about you or your well-being, just as he did with me. He only wants you until he can no longer use you. Please, come back to us. Be the friend that I once knew. Getsis just laughs as Crocodile stands there doing nothing. You see, this mindless beast is loyal to only me, just as Kiram is. Crocodile knows its place and will never stray from it. Hearing Getsis talk like this triggers something in the desert croc as it drops its guard and begins to tunnel underneath the ground below them, allowing Dragonite to pass through and connect with Culrus and the Thunder Punch, smashing the device as Iris had ordered it. No, you insolent boy, what have you done? That was the only thing controlling Kiram, and now that you smashed it, it will rampage and destroy everything until it finds what's missing. And almost like clockwork, this begins to happen as Kiram begins to surge in fire and ice as its power begins to reach an overwhelming level that pushes back both Infernape and Pikachu. Even Infernape, with its blaze activated, is barely able to stand up to this legendary power. Both of the Pokemon are doing their best to protect Ash from any type of damage as he is directly behind them. The moment they drop their guard, Ash will be consumed by the fire and ice. However, they are slowly beginning to falter as their energies are slowly beginning to drain. Looking back, both Pikachu and and Infernape can see that Ash is slowly becoming singed and burnt by the cold ice and the hot fire. They're gonna lose this one, whether they like it or not. That is, until they notice something at the base of Kiram's feet. Something is happening. It's like the dragon is losing its footing, and it's beginning to sink into the ground. It causes the beast to temporarily halt its attack as it tries to regain its footing, as Crocodile pops out of the ground in front of both Infernape and Pikachu. Just as this happens, Paul and Electivire enter the stadium, as 
as it is fully charged with the power of Zekrom. Joining them is Iris and Dragonite. She tells them that this is their only shot. The machine that was controlling Kyurem has been smashed, which means once it frees itself from that sand tomb, it's going to start to rampage, and it's going to attack everything and anything in sight. It's here that Paul has an idea. He tells everyone that they need to all attack at the same time. They can't hold anything back. If they do, then this won't work. At this, both Infernape and Electivire begin to surge with flames and electricity respectively, ready for their part. Pikachu and Dragonite begin to spark with their most powerful electric attacks, ready to take on this responsibility. This just leaves Crocodile. Ash asks if it's willing to battle with him again. He doesn't want to control it, he just wants to be its friend. He never wanted anything more than what was best for it. The Desert Croc stares at Ash and then back at Kurum flailing in the sand as Getsis loses his mind trying to regain control control of the situation. For a moment, it's silent. That is, until N speaks up. Please, my friend, we need your help. If anyone holds anything back, we will not be able to succeed. Turning, Crocodile takes a stance facing Kyurem, readying in a stone edge as they begin to circulate around its body. As everyone prepares to attack, Paul pulls out the last remaining piece of the reveal glass. He can feel it echoing, resonating with what's about to happen. In one final moment, all the trainers order their most powerful attacks to be aimed at Kyurem. And as everything is fired, both Ash and Paul fade to a blackscape as they can hear the roars of both Zekrom and Reshram. It's like the two dragons are trying to tell them something. This, this won't work. It's not going to be what's needed to bring Kirim to peace. However, they are quickly thrusted back into the midst of the battle as all of the attacks subside and from the smoke, a white stone rolls out to the feet of Ash. Reshram, he yells, you're back. However, it's not the only one as Kirim still stands ready to battle in his primary form. Looking to Infernape, Ash asks if the Firestarter is ready for one final battle as he holds up the White Stone. However, Paul tells him to stop. That's not the path. A battle won't stop this. We have to bring Kyurem peace. Well, how do you suggest we do that, Ash responds. Turning, Paul tells Electivire to end the fusion as the Black Orb separates from the Oni. Picking up the ore from the ground, Paul says there's a long shot. But if we wish to bring Kyurem peace, then we need Meloetta. Its song was able to tame the savage heart of Kyurem once before. It can do it again. It's here that Paul holds up the black stone next to the piece of the reveal glass. You see, they are vibrating in sync. Their resonance are one. It's here that Paul tells Ash to present the white stone. If they use the black and white stones in tandem with the reveal glass, then they may be able to get the result that they need. Willing to try anything once, Ash does as Paul asks, presenting the stone as it begins to vibrate in tandem with the black stone and the mirror. At first, nothing happens as Kyurem begins to ready its next assault, making everyone extremely nervous. However, Paul says wait. He can hear it. Off in the distance. It's low, but it's, it's coming. At first, nobody knows what he's talking about. But then, Iris can hear it too, followed by Ash, then N. It's getting louder and louder, until a bright flash, and then something stands before them. Meloetta, Paul says. We need your help. Please, calm the heart of Kyurem once more. While all this is going on from different parts of the stadium, both Alder and Trip are watching what's happening. Trip is in amazement at what's going on between the two, while Alder is loathing the fact that Ash and Paul are the ones that are being able to stop Kyurem. This forces Alder to take off as the embarrassment of what he has done is too much for the old man to handle. This leaves Trip to watch as Meloetta begins to sing her song, soothing Kyurem in one fell swoop. And then it happens. Three lights appear from the sky as the legendary forces of nature Unova, Landorus, Thunderous, and Tornadus are summoned to this place. However, this interaction is far different than the last couple of interactions that Ash, Paul, and Iris have had with these things. They are calm as Meloetta sings their song, as they are the guardian of of the mythical Pokemon, they begin to transform as their Therians are unlocked. What happens next is a sight that no one in the modern era has ever seen. The three forces of nature take their positions creating a triangle around Kyurem, and then Meloetta begins to sing its song at a more intense pace that seems to soothe Kyurem. Then a bright light envelops the area as Meloetta and the forces of nature vanish from the sight of everyone in attendance. Once everyone's vision is able to come back, the only thing they see is Trip standing there, and then and out of nowhere, from the sky, something falls, landing at the feet of the trainer. That's the Grey Stone. Kyurem Stone, Paul says. Trip picks up the orb as it, the white, and black orb all resonate at the same time. Can't be, Paul says. However, N stops him. It is. This was Kyurem's choice. A creature with no virtue and a trainer that is seeking a virtue. They have chosen each other, whether you want to believe it or not. Wait, so this is for me, Trip says? It seems that Kyurem has chosen you to be the human to bestow us power upon. Don't waste it, N says, as you never know 
who or what may be after it. N just stares into the gray stone, unsure of how to react, as we fade into the night with everyone at the Pokemon Center. Ash and Paul are talking about everything. They have a battle that is actually coming up. Even though Team Plasma attacked the League, things were merely postponed by a week, so they're going to have plenty of time to get rest so that way they can have a top tier battle. However, that's not going to be the subject of their conversation. The conversation is actually about Trip and Virgil. You see the grandson of the champion be embarrassed about what happened and unsure about his place in things dropped from the tournament. Nobody knows where he went. That made Virgil the automatic winner, which means that whoever wins out of Ash and Paul's battle is going to be the one to face Virgil in the finals. The two trainers smile as they know that in a week, they're going to have the most intense battle that the Unova League has ever seen. And now we cut to the closing ceremonies as Virgil stands victorious with Paul in second place and Ash in third, all parties seemingly satisfied with the outcome of everything. While Ash and Paul's battle was intense, they treated it like it was the finals and gave everything they had had for the win. Unfortunately, Infernape wasn't able to capitalize over Electivire this time, and when its fusion failed, it lost, giving Paul the victory that he wanted over Ash for the last year or so. And because Paul went all out in his battle with Ash, that left him unable to prepare for Virgil in time, as most of his top tier Pokemon were badly injured in their battle with Ash. So he went with a whole new team. Fortunately, the diversity of the evolutions was too much for Paul to handle, and he just couldn't capitalize to get that win for the Unova Championship. Now, we find Ash, Iris, and Paul as they watch the torch of the Unova League competition be silenced for one more year. This is where Ash and Paul turn to Iris and N. They thank them for the time that they had on their journeys and all of the experiences that they shared. They will never forget this. It's here that Iris asks Paul and Ash what they're going to do. Ash tells Iris that he's going to head back to Palatown. Unfortunately, he's a little homesick, so he wants to see his mom and his other Pokemon before he decides to go out on another adventure. But he's got to take the White Stone back to the Altar of White first, so that's going to be his first stop. However, N stops Ash and Paul before he can say anything. He tells the two that they don't have to take the stones back right away. Because of the battle with Kirim, all of the nature energy that those two had been gathering over the last century or so has been dissipated, which means that they're going to need to travel some more. And if they're up to it, N thinks that the dragons would want to stay with these two trainers for the time being until they've gathered the necessary energy to be fed back into Unova. Well, if that's the case, then I have an idea of where I'm going to go. But first, I'm heading back to Veilstone and Sinnoh so I can see my brother, Paul says. It's been a wild ride, and Iris confirms that she'll be heading back to Opelucid City so that way she can train under Drayden. She wants to be able to master Dragonite and the rest of her Pokemon because she has plans on becoming the Unova Champion since Alder has become MIA. And as for N, well, he had Ash make a very hard decision. He told him that it would be best if Crocodile stayed with the green-haired boy for the time being so that way it can learn to trust humans again. While Ash is sad that he won't be the one to be able to get through to Crocodile and change its outlook on everything, he did tell it that he would do whatever is best for it, and he does understand the reasoning why. So, he hands over its Pokeball to N, telling him to take care of the croc. And then, before they head off, Ash looks at Crocodile, saying that one day he'll come back, and he'll want to challenge it to a battle to see how strong it's gotten. The Desert Croc says nothing, but he does acknowledge Ash. As its trainer, the one human that actually showed it kindness other than N, walks off into the sunset with Paul as everyone parts ways. About a week later, Paul finds himself back in Veilstone City and in the company of his brother. It's here that the two are trying to catch up, and Paul tells him about everything that happened in the Unova region, then shows him the Black Stone of Zekrom. Reggie cautions Paul, telling him that just because Team Plasma is no longer after Zekrom, that doesn't mean that other people may not hear of it and come after it, so just to be cautious. Paul goes to retort, but they are stopped by a knock on the door, so they could decide to go see who it is. But to their surprise, it's the regional champion, Cynthia. She's actually come here to see Paul. She heard about what happened in the Unova region, and she wants to challenge him to a battle to see how much stronger he's gotten. Paul, wanting a chance to have a battle with no stakes attached to it, agrees to this, as long as it can be a one-on-one. -on -one. After all, he has his eyes set on a new region, just not sure where it is yet. Cynthia is more than happy to oblige this, as long as Paul will show her this new power that he discovered in Unova. Paul is more than happy to, as the two take the battlefield behind Richie's house, and he sends in Electivire, and then he activates the stone of Zekra as Electivire takes its ideal's form. That's pretty impressive, Cynthia says, as she sends it in Garchomp. But I have a new trick of my own, as she declares, Keystone, 
make our hearts one. And this, my friends, is where we are going to end this series. So tell me, how did you feel about this finale? How did you feel about the revelations with Alder and how he was pulling the strings behind everything? How did you feel about the outcome and how we resolved the issues with Kiram White and Meloetta being the guardians of the forces of nature? And of course, what do you think about Paul getting to keep the Black Stone and Ash getting to keep the White Stone? Let me know in the comments down below. And that's all we had for today's video. I really appreciate you guys stopping by to watch all the way to the end. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. If you guys really enjoy my content, consider following me on some of my other platforms like Discord, where you can get to know other people who are interested in what ifs, or on Twitter, where I post sometimes behind the scenes updates. Or if you want to help the channel grow a little bit extra, why don't you consider donating like the people right here have, as whatever you could offer could help us get to a larger audience by helping us get new videos done, or some of the projects that we more custom art is getting kind of expensive. So we want to make sure that we have the funds to do that. But with all that being said, I really hope you guys enjoyed everything and I will see you in the next video.